bits of cotton and ribbon in her hand, and quickly looked away again. They were looking for your jewels. It's quite common to hide precious objects among one's intimate clothing. I shall inform Lady Truebridge of this incident. She will likely wish to question the servants. And he disappeared. Gina looked around. Bixfiddle's stack of paper had been tossed this way and that. She picked up a silk stocking from the ground, but couldn't see its mate. Finally, she sat down on the naked mattress to wait for Annie, looking at the ground rather than looking around the room at her crumpled belongings. No matter what Sebastian said about inconvenience, it felt a great deal worse to her. Hell and damnation! He was standing in the doorway, looking huge and male, and utterly outraged. She sniffed. Tears welled up in her eyes. I've been inconvenienced. Cam took one look at her, swore again, and strode over. Then he picked her up in one swift, economical movement, sat down, and plopped her onto his lap. Too surprised to protest, Gina leaned her head against his chest and listened to him swear a blue streak. Finally, he wound down. Did they take anything? She shook her head, but elevated the little pile of corsets she held. Look! Despicable bastards! he snarled. Her chin started to wobble. I don't think I ever want to wear them again. Bastards! he growled. I should shoot them just for that. Gina let a few tears soak into his black coat. He stroked her up and down her arm in a comforting kind of way, and handed her a large white handkerchief. Lady Truebridge herself rushed in the door. Oh dear, oh dear, she shrieked. I simply loathe thieves, loathe them. Are you quite all right, my dear? Gina knew that she should leap from her husband's knee, but his arms were large and tight around her, and she didn't move. Her grace is, of course, distressed, Cam said. He stood up. I shall escort her to the library while the room is put to rights. An excellent idea, Lady Truebridge said, with a speculative gleam in her eyes. He walked from the room without another word. Out in the corridor she began to struggle. Put me down, Cam. I don't wish to fall. You won't fall. I am too large to be carried all the way downstairs. You must put me down. I mean, please put me down. I shall not. I enjoy carrying you. And he gave her a little squeeze. Come! Hmm, he said. There's something to be said for carrying women about. It gives one such good access. He looked at her with an amused twinkle, and his hands. Come! She almost jumped out of her skin. That's better. You don't look quite so much like a scared rabbit. I don't. Red eyes and all, he nodded. He kept walking. Please, may I walk downstairs? Gina pleaded. This is embarrassing. Who's embarrassed? He inched his right hand forward and let out his breath in a big whoosh. They had reached the landing when he said, you may be right, and set her down. Gina looked up at him. It wasn't that she wanted to be carried, of course. I might become embarrassed, he said, looking her straight in the eye. But Gina saw a suggestive glint in his eye and looked down. It was a split-second glance, but enough. Dear me, she said, that's quite a problem. He took a quick look around. They were at the turn of the landing, and there was no one in sight. He put his arms around her, running his hands down her back and the delicious curve of her bottom. It was an act of charity, he said sulkily. I had to take your mind off your loss. Her eyes narrowed. What loss? How soon you forgot. Remember those corsets? I was just anticipating how you were going to look with nothing under your gown but your own sweet skin. Why? He took the words from her mouth with his lips. Why, without a corset you will be. But he lost track of what he was saying, because her lips were warm on his, 
and his hands had jerked her against his embarrassing body. And then he did exactly what he spent the entire night planning. He put a hand on her breast, and even through three or four layers of cloth, she arched her back into his hand and opened her lips. He barely caught her squeal. I thought I imagined that, he said with satisfaction, looking down at his wife. She was looking at him, lips open and eyes dazed. But I didn't. His hand tightened, and he caught her cry in a kiss again. You'll never be able to make love outdoors, he whispered into her ear. He was getting a little worried that someone would come up the stairs, so he pushed her back and tugged at her dress. Ah, you look just the same. What are you talking about? But before he could answer, she answered herself. Heathen! I'll have you know that Englishmen don't ever do... that! He laughed. I'm willing to believe that some of them never do that. Or did you mean that they never do it outdoors? Gina turned to look at him as she descended the stairs. He was struck with an irresistible urge to dishevel her hair. She was such a duchess, with her proud gait and calm way of talking. If I were married to you, he said. You are, she put in. You know what I mean. Some day, when I am truly married and living at Garton, I will take my wife out to the Bluebell Wood, being the heathen that I am. They had reached the hallway. Cam self-consciously adjusted his jacket. He needed to stop this conversation or risk social humiliation. He glanced over at Sheena and made a quick decision to go for a walk outdoors. She had her brows knit, and she looked as if she were musing over a particularly difficult problem. Don't you remember the bluebell wood? he said into her ear. Of course I remember the wood, she snapped. You left me there in the middle of the night. How could I forget? I'd forgotten that, Cam chuckled. Stephen and I ran away, didn't we? You told me there were ghouls in the woods first, Gina said indignantly. You were too good at fishing. We had to bring you to a sense of your place in the world. Besides, we rescued you after five minutes, didn't we? Humph, Gina said, and pushed open the drawing-room door. She was met by a level of talk that rose like a storm of bees. Clearly, the party had been informed of the indignity suffered by the Duchess. Cam bowed and backed away. The all-male companionship of the stables sounded comforting at the moment. Something about his wife was driving him insane. He gave a bark of rueful laughter. He'd been without a woman for too long, that was it. And since she was the only woman in the world he couldn't sleep with, given that the act would terminate their annulment proceedings, naturally he was being driven to distraction by temptation. That explained it all. He strode out to the stables. In the middle of the night, it had occurred to him forcefully that the key point of an annulment was virginity. There were many, many pauses on the way from virginity to the lack thereof. If his wife wanted to experiment with him before she hopped into bed with her stuffy Marquis, who was he to complain? He wandered to the stable door, musing over a few questions he had for Lady Truebridge. For example, was there a bluebell wood tucked away on the estate? 19. A Piscatory Discussion on the River Bank Neville was so critical that Carola wished she'd chosen Esme's Burney to flirt with instead. They hadn't yet made it down to the river, because he kept adjusting this or that about her apparel, and giving her more and more instructions about how to be flirtatious. Neville, she finally cried in exasperation. I assure you that Tuppy won't notice anything about my garments, not even if I appeared in sackcloth. Don't underestimate yourself, he said, giving her a last critical glance. No, that cloth must go. And with one swift lunge, he plucked away the kerchief that had taken her maid at least a half hour to arrange. Carola futilely grabbed at it. 
This gown is far too low without that handkerchief. I can't be seen like this. Of course you can. Now you look much more the thing, he said with satisfaction. She looked down at her plump breasts with horror. He already thinks I'm fat, Neville. Can't you understand that I have to cover up all this flesh? At this rate, he'll think that I've grown at least two sizes. When did you marry the poor man? Four years ago. Why do you ask? I believe that your chest has grown in the interim. It certainly has since I first met you, darling green girl that you are. Carola narrowed her eyes. My clothing size is private information. Even if I promise not to hanker after your large and luscious bosom, I never allow myself to desire impossibilities. But I think it's quite likely that your poor besotted husband is. Besotted? Not likely. Besotted, he returned. I saw him looking at you after you walloped him in the drawing room. He looked blue as one of those fish he loves so much. If I had any hope of catching you for myself, I gave it up that moment. Carola slipped her arm through his and smiled. Oh, Neville, you are the best friend a woman could have. Don't smile at me that way, or I'll change my mind about letting Tuppy have you, he said. She squeezed his arm. They were almost down to the river when he paused. She dragged him forward. There he is. I recognize his back. Just a moment, Carola. She looked up at him. You need to think about me. She nodded. I am. No, really think about me. He tipped up her chin with a strong hand. She stood, brown eyes blinking innocently at him. Damned if I don't envy Tuppy, fishmonger that he is, Neville muttered. Then he lunged at her rosy mouth, ignoring the ineffectual way she batted at his chest. Ah, he said a moment later. Her cheeks were pink, and she looked thoroughly aroused, which she was, by anger, if not by lust. You! You! she spluttered. You must not behave in that outrageous fashion, Neville Charlton. Next time someone grabs you, kick him in the ankle, he advised, turning her back to the river. Now remember to look at me, Carola, not the fishmonger. He's not a fishmonger, Carola said, turning even pinker. Good afternoon, Neville called. Two elderly gentlemen were sitting beside Tuppy and taking bait from a bored footman. The men stood up as they approached. Carola was careful not to look at her husband, but she did notice that the only free chair was next to him. She started to move toward it when Neville preempted her. He sat down and smiled provocatively at her. I'll take you on my knee, my lady, he said, with an unmistakable leer. Carola's eyes widened. She'd never done such a fast thing in her life as to sit on a gentleman's knees. But here was Neville stretching out his hands. The two old men had already gone back to talking about trout laws and were paying no attention. She walked over and delicately perched on the very end of his knee. He made a production out of putting his arms around her and showing her how to handle the rod the footman handed him. Relax, you little idiot, he breathed into her ear. I am, she said indignantly. He put his hand over hers and demonstrated the proper grip on a fishing rod. I've sent a servant to fetch a chair, came a stern voice at her right. Carola finally looked at Tuppy. What she saw in his eyes stiffened her backbone. He looked scornful. In fact, she realized with horror, that he probably thought that she was too plump to sit on a man's knees. He probably ordered the chair so as to save Neville from her weight. Without further thought, she giggled softly and looked up at Neville. I'm quite comfortable here, sir, unless you foresee a problem. Neville had that leering glance down to a science, she thought. It was truly amazing the way his good-natured face turned so suggestive. He put his hand over hers again. I would never dream of anything more delicious than you on my knees, he said soulfully. 
It wasn't until he poked her in the side that she remembered her part. She cast Tuppy a glance under her eyelashes. He was looking rather grimly at the rod he held in his hand. Surely he'd heard Neville's comment. "'I could never deny you anything that you desire,' she said in a clear voice, remembering at the last moment to smile intimately at her fishing partner. "'Pretty good,' Neville breathed in her left ear. He glanced at Carola's husband. Tuppy was glaring at the two of them. So Neville took a long and deliberate look straight down Carola's gown. She did have luscious breasts, damn it. He moved uncomfortably. It was all in the name of friendship, of course. Lean back against me, he whispered to Carola. Of course, that brought her breasts right under his nose. He risked another look at Tuppy. Unless he was much mistaken, the man was planning a massacre. And he, Neville, would be the first to go. Just then, the two elderly gentlemen rose and began to stroll back to the house. Neville jerked his fishing line just slightly, just enough so that the hook and line flew out of the water, splashing as they fell back into the river. Botheration, he cried. There's river water on my trousers. I shall have to change immediately. Nothing stains as badly as river water. River water? Carola said with surprise. I don't see any. She leaned forward to look at his lemon-yellow pantaloons, inadvertently giving Tuppy a fine glance down her bodice. Neville grinned to himself. After he took care of Carola's little problem, he might hire himself out as a marriage broker. I assure you that I felt the chill of river water, and naturally I cannot be seen in soiled clothing. He stood up, gently pushing her back into the seat and handing her the fishing rod. I shall return in the flash of an eye, he announced. He gave her his finest leer. And then I shall accompany you to the house. I am certain that this excursion has been most exhausting. Perhaps you'll need to rest, Lady Perwinkle. Without waiting for an answer, he strode briskly toward the house. He was feeling remarkably hungry. Probably all that leering at a heaving bosom, that would never be his. A warm crumpet would be just the thing, perhaps three or four. Let the two lovebirds gawk at each other for an hour or so. Carola leaned gingerly back in the chair and picked up her rod. She kept her eyes on the river and didn't look at Tuppy. Instead, she practiced breathing shallowly, so that her chest wouldn't rise and fall too much and look even larger than it was. There was a noise beside her. It almost sounded like a growl. She turned to look at Tuppy. Did you say something? she asked. He stared back at her, eyes narrowed. You are still my wife, even if you seem to have forgotten that fact. I am aware of my marital status, she said, trying to push all the air into her stomach so that her chest wouldn't catch his attention. Then why are you acting like such a trollop? he asked grimly. Carola forgot about her chest. I am not a trollop. You certainly act like one. I could never deny you anything that you desire. He made a scoffing noise. Unless she was much mistaken, Esme's plan was working. Oh, but I couldn't deny Neville, she said, looking up at Tuppy from under her lashes. He's been a dear, dear friend to me in the past year. His jaw said, I can see that for myself. He looked back at his fishing rod. It was time for a change of topic. Are you using a lure? she asked, jiggling her line, so that perhaps a fish would bite. It would be splendid if she could catch a fish in front of Tuppy. A warbling minnow, he said. She nodded. Made with bucktail? Wood, he said, casting her an unfathomable glance. Carola almost quailed at the look of indifference in his eye, but she barreled ahead. I prefer bucktail lure myself. Finkler says that they are by far the most useful in country streams. He narrowed his eyes. Finkler is an idiot. There was a moment's pause, broken only by the weedy song of a kingfisher on the opposite bank. 
What the hell do you know about Finkler? He demanded. I happened to hear him speak, she said airily. Actually, she had gone to the lecture in hopes that Tuppy would attend, but he wasn't there. And then I read his book. I thought it was quite interesting, except when he started talking about eviscerating the poor fish. She shuddered. That was disgusting. Just when did you become interested in fishing? Carola was starting to lose courage. Was it worse to lose her husband forever, or to humiliate herself by letting him know that she'd sneaked down the Lady Truebridge's library the previous night and escaped back to her room with not one but two books on trout fishing? She swallowed and prevaricated. Neville taught me. Why, fishing has become my favourite sport in the world, thanks to him. He is a highly skilled fisherman. She announced, "You can judge that for yourself by his excellent handling of the rod." Ah,、oh, yes," Tuppy said frostily. "We fishermen are always so careful about the stains caused by river water. I can't tell you the number of yellow pantaloons that I've damaged with water." Carola sat up a little higher. "Neville is a fine fisherman," she said with her nose in the air. "He carves his own lures." So do I," snapped Tuppy. "So does any competent fisherman." "He's not merely a competent fisherman," she flashed back. "He handles his rod with flair." That was something that Finkler talked about in his lecture: handling one's rod with flair. But Tuppy didn't seem to think much of that as evidence. If anything, his face grew even more stern. "I trust you know what you're saying, madam," he said in a steely tone. Of course I do. How dare he question her knowledge of fishing after she read all those books? Neville is a better rod handler than you any day, Lord Perwinkle. I didn't know we were being compared. He stood up, throwing his rod on the ground. His face had gone dead white. Carola stood up as well, clutching her fishing pole. Why, Tuppy? So now it's Tuppy, is it? What happened to Lord Perwinkle? He strode over to her, eyes blazing. And why didn't you let me know that I was involved in a fishing contest? Carola blinked. It's not a contest. Fishing for trout in a particular pond. Tuppy snapped. And you, madam, appear to be the pond in question. His eyes dropped to her chest. Carola looked down. She'd forgotten all about taking shallow breaths. And her breasts looked monstrously plump from this angle. His eyes were burning. I believe these are still mine, he said, with so much rage in his voice that she shivered. Then he reached forward and jerked her into his arms. Carola felt a moment of humiliation as her bosom pressed against his chest. But then his mouth was on hers, and it was so sweet. She melted against him, and wound her arms around his neck, and generally acted as if kissing rather than fishing was her favourite sport in the world. She felt dizzy with it, with the smell and the taste of tuppy. Until he put her away from him and looked down at her with inscrutable eyes, Carola's chest heaved as she tried to get her breath, and his eyes lingered there for a moment. She felt desperately ashamed that she no longer had her kerchief. It was absolutely clear that he was thinking about her new plumpness. His mouth had grown so tight that it had a little white line around it. But he spoke courteously enough. I see that I've not yet lost the contest. She paused, bewildered, and tried to think what to say. He waited. No, she said uncertainly. His eyes changed. I must admit, my lady, that I thought it lost long ago. Not necessarily, she whispered, lowering her eyelashes. A finger touched her cheek, whisper soft. Then I shall endeavour to handle my rod with flair, he said, as Finkler admonishes one to do. Carola took all her courage and raised her head. She could tell that crimson patches were burning in her cheeks. But she refused to flop into his arms like a dying trout. He also says 
that fish must be courted. There was a tiny curl at the corner of his mouth. It must have been too long since I read his book. I confess, I don't remember that part. It's a whole chapter, Carola said. Another fisherman is always waiting to steal your fish. Ah, Tuppy said. I stand corrected, madam. I shall definitely have to consider my science more closely. Carola was feeling much better. She took a deep breath and didn't even look to see whether her breasts had popped free of her bodice. I have found this fishing excursion quite exhausting, she said. I shall take a rest. No, you needn't accompany me. She turned with a swish of petticoats. She could feel his eyes on her back, so she turned around after a few steps. He was standing there, brown curls all messed, looking so dear and ungentlemanly and beautiful that it was all she could do not to run back down the slope and leap into his arms. He raised his hand, so she waved as well. I will see you tonight, he called. She turned faintly pink. At dinner, he finished. Yes, she said. Isn't it providential? Lady Trowbridge told me this morning that she has moved dear Neville to sit at my left. My two favourite, she paused, fishermen on either side of me. What a lovely meal. He looked as if he was grinding his teeth. She hoped he was grinding his teeth. She waved again and walked back to the house. Twenty, in which the question of marital beds and bedchambers comes to the fore. Gina didn't see Cam again until early afternoon. Lady Trowbridge had arranged a piano recital to be given by some of the young ladies attending the house party. Miss Margaret Devintosh was pounding out Handel with far more flair than talent when Cam slipped into the seat beside her. Have you seen the Aphrodite? he asked. She frowned at him. Hush! She turned back to watch Miss Margaret beat the keyboard into submission. The girl has even more spots than she had three days ago, Cam whispered. At that, she glared at him. Be still! On her other side, Sebastian stiffened. Have you seen the Aphrodite since your room was robbed? he asked, quieter this time. This time Gina took in what he said. She shook her head. But I'm quite certain it's there, she whispered back. Who would want it? I would, for one. For all you know, madam, that Aphrodite was sculpted by Cellini himself. I have no idea who Cellini is, but my statue is rather slapdash. I was looking at it carefully just last night. You can see lines where it was put together. Put together? Sebastian tapped her arm with a finger. Gina gave her husband another frown and turned back to the music. Miss Margaret was just winding to a tumultuous conclusion with a great slamming of her feet on the pedals. God in heaven, who taught her to play? Cam groaned into Gina's ear. He was clearly unmoved by the fact that people all over the room were sending them disapproving little glances. Margaret wound up her song with a heavy emphasis on the pedal. Thank God! Cam dragged Gina to her feet. We must check on the Aphrodite. What? Sebastian was looking at Cam with a darkening frown, but he ignored it. We have to make certain that your Aphrodite was not stolen. Gina helplessly waved goodbye to Sebastian. Your chamber was the only one ransacked by thieves, although it would have made a good deal more sense for a thief to toss a room occupied by an elderly lady. Everyone knows they leave their jewels about and sleep with money under their mattress. Just from the look of you, anyone could tell that your jewels are safely locked up. And what do you mean by the look of me? Gina demanded. He snorted. Have you ever left a string of emeralds hanging about while you slept? Well, perhaps not, but... Have you ever hopped into bed before washing and creaming your face and applying Lord knows what other cosmetics? I don't wear cosmetics to bed, she snapped. Have you ever slipped into your sheets naked, rushed outdoors in the morning before brushing your teeth, 
danced on the lawn in your bare feet. A good many of your fantasies seem to involve being both unclean and unclothed, she replied with dignity. He laughed and started up the stairs. Come along then, Duchess. I often rise early in the morning. Just last week I went into the conservatory at three in the morning. That would be the meteor shower that led to you and poor Mr. Wapping being suspected of extramarital pleasures. Yes, she said. No stars fell, even though the almanac announced they would. When he turned into the corridor, she stopped and leaned against the wall to catch her breath. For goodness sake, Cam, I can't imagine why we have to rush up the stairs in this helter-skelter manner. I'm certain that Lady Truebridge and her guests are wondering what on earth came over you. Oh, I'm certain that they know precisely what came over me. No one knows about the Aphrodite except you and Esme, she pointed out. You haven't told anyone, have you? That wasn't what I meant. Oh, she said, feeling foolish. Come along, then. He held out his hand to her. Do you ever wear gloves? Never. I dislike cloth between me and the world. You women seem to wear them constantly. Don't they bother you? She looked down at her pearl-gray gloves. No, although I do grow annoyed if I am wearing a pair with too many buttons. I am particularly butter-fingered, and I can't undo the right hand without a maid. Eating while wearing gloves is quite tedious. They were at her door. The room was neat as a pin, and looked as if nothing had occurred, thanks to the ministrations of Lady Truebridge's maids. Where is it? Cam demanded. The Aphrodite? In its box. Cam strode across the room and flipped open the box. The froth of red satin no longer cradled a naked woman. Oh, my, Gina breathed. It was stolen. But something was nagging at her mind. No, I stuck it under here last night. She bent down and plucked out the figure from under the ruffled skirt of her fireside chair. You left a priceless statue under a chair, Cam bellowed. No one says it's priceless except for you. And she was quite safe. Her fingers instinctively curled around the poor woman's waist to hide her naked state. May I hold her for a moment? I'm not interested in her value, Gina said, her jaw setting mulishly. You can see for yourself that she hasn't been stolen. This statue has to be the reason your room was torn apart. As I said, yours was the only room searched, which is unusual. In general, thieves strike three to four rooms when they rob a house party. The thief had to be looking for the Aphrodite. Except it never occurred to the poor sod that you, who would never leave a paltry string of emeralds on your bedside table, had flung the statue under a chair. I didn't fling her, and I think your scenario is extremely unlikely. How would a thief know that I owned the statue in the first place? Perhaps the statue and your blackmailing letter are linked. Even more unlikely. Why would my mother give me a priceless statue? She never bothered to answer a single letter I wrote her. Why would she leave me anything of value? She looked down at the Aphrodite. This is a salacious little object to decorate my bed table. An afterthought on her part. Cam looked at her, but she turned away. The Countess was a fool not to answer your letters, he said bluntly. Her eyes prickled, but Gina bit her lip hard. She refused to become a watering pot before her husband. She may not have written back, but I expect she read them, he said. She may have left you the statue in gratitude. Absurd! If she were the least bit grateful, she would have bothered to dip pen in ink and say so herself. Perhaps... May I see the statue? At first, Cam said nothing. He looked at the Aphrodite's face for a long time, and then turned her over and over, his large fingers soothing every curve. He held the figure up to the sunlight. He even pried at the crack that ran down her sides. Finally, Gina joined him at the window. Is she priceless? I don't think so, Cam admitted. 
I don't recognise the artist's initials. F. F. He showed her where they were scratched in the base. She's beautifully made, though. See the upturned arm, almost hiding her eyes, and the way her hair splashes down her back. It's very difficult to fashion alabaster in such fine detail. I knew she wasn't valuable, Gina said, feeling cross. She's oddly made, as you noticed. It looks as if she was fashioned from two pieces of stone. I've never seen such a clever fit, as a matter of fact. There is absolutely no give in the join. Gina took her back. I like her face. I like her body, myself. She looks embarrassed. I don't think this Aphrodite likes being naked. I would guess that she's fleeing from Vulcan's bed. She's just been caught by her husband, and she's taking one last look back at her lover. Aphrodite is generally depicted either rising from the waves or fleeing from Vulcan's bedchamber. Here, yeah, the artist was thinking of the latter situation because she's looking back over her shoulder. That's wonderful! Bitterness sharpened her voice. My mother sent me a statue of a naked woman caught in the moment of adultery. Cam's large hand came under hers and pushed the statue into the sunlight coming in the window. Your mother gave you an object of great beauty. They stared at her together for a moment. Sunbeams played over marble, making the pink alabaster glow as if rosy blood danced just under the surface of Aphrodite's skin. You think she is looking back because she misses her lover, but I think she's sad because she betrayed her husband. A wry smile lit his face. There's my moralistic little duchess. For goodness sake, woman, uncurl your fingers. With an exasperated noise, he unwrapped her fingers. She has lovely hips. It's a sin to cover them up. Have you made Aphrodite's like this one? Gina asked. Cam shook his head. Marissa has a much lusher figure here. He pointed to her breasts. And here. He touched the statue's thighs. Gina's mouth tightened. Perhaps you could make me an Aphrodite, she remarked. Then I'll have a statue from each of the people who... She caught herself. Who what? he asked. Who are related to me, she said lightly. That's not what you meant, Cam observed. She shrugged. I have a non-mother and a non-husband. It just seems odd that both of you chose to send me naked statues. Do you remember the naked Cupid you sent for my twenty-first birthday? If you fashion me an Aphrodite rising from the waves, I'll have a matched pair. Your future husband will love that, Cam drawled. Your bedchamber will look better than a brothel. Gina put the statue down with a little click. Our bedchamber, she corrected him. Then she coloured. I didn't mean ours as in yours and mine, but Sebastian's and my bedchamber. She turned around briskly pretending her cheeks weren't on fire. Don't you think we should return to the musicale now? You mean that you and the stuffy Marquis are planning to share a room? Certainly, and I would prefer that you did not add insulting epithets to my fiancé's name. Are you coming? We can't leave the Aphrodite. The thief might return. By rights, it should be in Lady Trubridge's safe, tucked snugly next to your emeralds. I would prefer that she not know of its existence. At any rate, if the thief was looking for the statue, he has surely given up. He frowned. You can put it back under the chair if you like. There was nowhere else to hide the piece, so Cam bent and tucked the statue back under the chair ruffle. He walked silently down the corridor. When he spoke, it was in a tone of casual curiosity. When did you and Bonnington discuss your future bedding arrangements? She consciously emptied all the irritation out of her tone. I am afraid that is none of your business. It will be an unusual arrangement. You do know that, don't you? Her shoulders grew a little stiffer. Of course I'm aware of that fact. Most couples sleep in separate rooms, if not in separate houses. There was something in his tone that made her skin prickle. 
And then, once a month or so, the husband knocks politely on his wife's door and requests fulfilment of marital duties. After all, one must produce an heir, no matter how unpleasant the task. Sebastian and I will have a different sort of marriage, Gina snapped, starting down the stairs. This is a most improper conversation. He caught her wrist. It's just me, after all. What makes you think that your marriage will be different? Because Sebastian and I are in love, you idiot, she hissed at him. Now, will you have done with your questioning? No. I'm agog to hear how you managed to talk the stuffy Marquis into sharing a bedchamber. I would have written him off without a second thought as the once-a-month type. With a mistress on the side, of course, he added. He will not have a mistress on the side. No. Well, you know best, of course. He began walking down the stairs before her. She rapped him sharply on the shoulder. You should not say those things. Sebastian will not have a mistress, and we will sleep together more than once a month. He grinned at her over his shoulder. Given your behavior last night, perhaps I should warn the poor Marquis to throw over his mistress and get into fighting shape before the annulment takes place. Gina blinked. Before she could untangle the metaphor, fighting shape, they were back in the entranceway. She wandered back into the long drawing room. Sebastian was still seated in the middle of the parlor, but her seat had been taken by Esme. As she watched, Sebastian bent his head and whispered in her ear. She was obviously laughing from the way her shoulders were shaking. Gina sighed. This always happened. Just when she would start to think that the two of them hated each other so much that they would never speak again, they would about face and talk as if they were the best of friends. Until the next spat. At any rate, it would be best if she returned to working on the estate papers. She had promised to practice the play with Sebastian, and she still hadn't read the Machiavelli chapters that Mr. Wapping had assigned. Silently, she backed out of the room, found a footman, and sent him to fetch her papers. Then she retired into the library with a tea tray. It was very pleasant, alone in the hushed room. She spread her papers out on the long oak table and wrote letters for almost an hour. Dusty sunlight spread over her shoulders from the high, mullioned windows behind her. Mites danced in the rays, pranced over the papers, swirled in the air when she lifted her quill or put it down again. The light was just starting to fade when Sebastian strode into the library. She smiled up at him. "'Can you give me one moment?' I'm just answering the estate manager's questions about sheep breeding. Why on earth haven't you given these questions to your husband? I could have, Gina said, finishing the letter. But I actually enjoy managing the estate. I'm afraid I'm a managing sort of woman. Will you be able to bear it? He bowed gallantly. I should warn you that I'm lucky enough to have two excellent estate managers. Shall we practice our lines, then? She walked over to a sofa. Sebastian joined her, opening his Shakespeare. I believe I've finally memorized the opening scene, Gina said. This is my favorite line. I thank God and my cold blood. I am of your humor for that. I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. I can see why, Sebastian said. It suits you. Suits me, Gina repeated, startled. Your wonderful air of independence, Sebastian explained. Oh. I too have my part memorized, he said, leafing through the later scenes. However, Lady Rawlings informed me during the musicale that she's not even begun to work on her part. Perhaps, since you seem to know your lines, I should seek her out. She's so flighty that I wouldn't be surprised if she never learned her lines without explicit guidance. He smiled down at her. Not a bit like my duchess. Gina sighed. In that case, I will write a few more letters. Your sense of responsibility is admirable. But you need more light, Sebastian said, jumping from the sofa and ringing the bell. He bowed and strode over to the door. I'll instruct the footman to bring you plenty of candles.
Gina stared at the closed door with a sense of mild shock. Sebastian couldn't have made it clearer that he had better things to do than sit about with his future wife. Slowly, she walked back to the library table and sat down, pulling another sheet toward her. Rick's fiddle wrote that the bridge spanning Charlcote Stream appeared on the verge of collapse. Would she like to repair the existing span or tear it down? Gina was gazing blindly at the estimated cost of the project when Can walked in. A man from Roundton's office is asking if he might speak to us, he said without greeting, walking over to where Gina was sitting. Since his business is likely to address the annulment, I told him to join us here. He read over her shoulder. Rick's fiddle wants to pull down the bridge over the charcoat. She nodded. Apparently the timbers are rotting. Pity. It had the lovely high span you see in Elizabethan bridges. Is this the estimation for a new one? Yes. It doesn't say whether the bridge will achieve the same height. Probably not, Gina said. Rick's fiddle is rather wanting in imagination. I expect that he simply instructed an architect to build a flat bridge. Cam drew up a chair. We can't have that, he said. He pulled over a piece of paper. I'll send him a picture myself. Now I think about it, I'd like to have the arch rise well above the surface. He started to sketch quickly. Gina watched, rather fascinated, as the bridge grew under his hands. It arched up with a lovely span. Are those supposed to be stones? she asked, watching him crosshatch the span. He nodded. If the old timber bridge has to go, I'd prefer to replace it with a stone arch. This is a reproduction of a bridge in Florence. We'll have to scale it down, of course, but— Cam, Gina interrupted. We can't possibly spare the funds for a stone bridge. Do you know how much masons cost? We spent over a thousand pounds just repairing the courtyard last year. He looked at her sharply. I hope you didn't replace the star in the middle with gravel or some such abomination. Of course I didn't, but that's how I know the expense of masons. It took four of them months to repair all the brick in the central pavement. We simply can't afford to build a stone bridge this year. Cam was finishing his drawing. I don't see why not. I remember glancing over the figures Bix Fiddle sent me. Didn't the estate make around eleven thousand pounds last year? Where's it all gone? That was two years ago, she said. Last year was an even better year. We made fourteen thousand pounds on rents and properties alone. Pride leaked into her voice. He smiled at her, and his eyes crinkled at the corner in such a way that her stomach curled. Good work, Gina. He looked back at his drawing. Let's put some of those pounds into a new bridge. We can't. I've already earmarked all the money not needed for the London house and my allowance for building drains in the village. Fourteen thousand pounds worth of drains? Impossible. It's not at all impossible. I'm afraid that your father neglected the village shamefully during his lifetime. All the cottages were in terrible repair when he died. Dear father, Cam remarked. He picked up the quill and began fussing with his drawing. In the years that I've been running the estate, I've managed to rebuild most of the cottages, or at least repair them to a livable state. But every extra penny is needed to build some sort of a sewer system. She poked him. Do you know that the villagers were simply emptying their slop into the river? That river flows directly past Girton House and close to our well. Last year we discovered that all the trout were dying. Because of the nasty habits of the villagers, Cam asked, rather absent-mindedly. The bridge was growing more ornate by the moment. In fact, it turned out that the mining projects upstream were leaking into the river and killing the fish, she explained. Mr. Rountan had to serve papers before the miners stopped shoveling ore into our stream. Then, when the stream was clear again, I restocked it with trout. Unfortunately, they all died. But Bix Fiddle reports here that there are still living fish in Charlcote Lake, so perhaps it was a matter of— He gave her a swift, hard kiss. She stopped in mid-breath and blinked. 
Did anyone ever tell you how beautiful you are when you talk about trout? Never. You are, he said. What do you think? He pushed the paper around so that she could see. Oh, Gina said, rather lamely. It's lovely, of course, but... You see, there's a statue of Neptune here. He tapped with his quill. And these two are water nymphs. Two more water nymphs over there. Are they clothed? she asked, narrowing her eyes at the drawing. Absolutely, he said. You know water nymphs. Never seen abroad without a corset and gloves. He grinned at her. Gina bit her lip. You want to turn the old wooden bridge over the river into a stone bridge, guarded by naked water nymphs? I suppose that Neptune is naked as well. Cam looked forward and peered at his own drawing. Ah. His quill scratched the parchment for a second. Now he has an artistic bit of seaweed around his middle. Absolutely not, Gina cried. He was wicked, wicked to laugh at her like that. You don't understand, she said. Girton is a beautiful property, built in... Built just in time for one of Queen Elizabeth's progresses in the 1570s, he filled in. I know all that, Gina. A few naked statues will enliven the grounds. They were deadly boring, from what I remember. Is that ghastly formal garden still in place? Yes, it is, Gina snapped. And I don't want a thing changed about it. Your mother designed it before she died, and it stays as a monument to her. As if she'd give a damn, Cam drawled. She would. How do you know? Because she didn't have anything else to do. Your father barely let her leave the house, you know. I was too young to realise. He had pulled forward a new piece of foolscap and was sketching with great concentration. I'm certain she would never have allowed the cottages to fall to pieces. Cam frowned at her. You never met my mother. Hell, I barely met my mother. Why all the passion over her garden? Gina stopped. After you left, I didn't... I was rather lonely, so I... He put his quill down. What do you mean, you were lonely? Where was your mother? She returned home and left me there, Gina said. The Duke said I had to begin my duties immediately, and you know how he and mother used to quarrel. I begged him to let her visit more often, but he refused. Damn it to hell, Cam said. But you had a governess, didn't you? Pegwell or Pegworthy, wasn't it? Gina nodded. Mrs. Pegwell was a very good woman. She lasted quite a long time as your father's employee. Four years, I think. By then, I was fifteen years old, and old enough to do without a governess. I feel like a blackguard. Your father was difficult. Not difficult. An utter bastard. I should have taken you out that window with me. I never thought your mother would leave you to Girton's tender mercies. I was fine. What are these blocks? She pointed at the bridge. They're called abutments, Cam explained. We can put figures here and here on the abutments. You cannot ornament Girton with naked people, Gina said. I won't allow it, Cam. But that's what I'm planning. Naked Venuses in the front hall, naked hat racks in every room, naked cupids in the dining room. She wrinkled her nose at him. Impossible. The villagers would be horrified. Not by Neptune and his nymphs, Cam said, leaning over so he was touching her shoulder. How would you feel if I changed? But Gina wasn't listening. What was it about her husband that made her quake, deep in her stomach, every time he touched her? He was scribbling all over the bridge, his head bent just in front of her. Her whole body tingled, with a desire to sink her fingers into his hair, turn his face toward her. He straightened. If we change these arches, Gina... His voice trailed away. She swallowed. His eyes were lit with a deep, sinful amusement. He leaned toward her. It was the picture of Neptune, right? He almost whispered it against her lips. 
before I added the seaweed, of course. I don't know what you're talking about, she managed. They were so close that he didn't have to pull her far. Those big hands simply lifted her up and transferred her to his lap. I'm talking about you, he said, tracing the shape of her lower lip with a finger. You, and the way you look at me. I don't look at you, she snapped, mortified. She pushed his hands away. The same way I look at you. Want to know how that is? She shook her head firmly. She really ought to get off his knees, except she didn't want to. Of course I don't, she added, for good measure. When I look at you, I pretend that you threw out those corsets you were clutching this morning. That would mean that under this cotton dress you're wearing, there's nothing but rosy, creamy curves, smooth skin. He was embellishing his words with kisses. Mmm, lovely breasts. Damned if you don't have the most beautiful breasts in England, Gina. And his hands were following his words. Except that he stopped talking, because his wife had grabbed his hair and muttered something that sounded suspiciously like, Shut up! Except that very proper duchesses never say something so impolite. At any rate, it was a good thing he did stop talking, because, as Cam had lately discovered, he couldn't put a finger on Gina's breasts without her making little squealing noises that made him crazed with lust. And when he discovered that she had held to her word and discarded her corsets, his hands wandered in such a way that the gathered bodice of her gown soon lost its claim to decorum. But he couldn't let his mouth follow his hands because of the inarticulate noises his wife was making, the ones that made him long to do nothing more than sweep up her dress and satisfy both of them. Of course, if he hadn't been busily stifling all those little squeals with his mouth and causing new ones with his hands, he might have heard the library door open. It was really a circular argument, because if he had heard the library door open, he and his wife wouldn't have been caught kissing by one of the solicitors working on their annulment. Or, to put it another way, they wouldn't have been caught looking about as close to consummation as was possible while clothed. 21. A Scandalized Solicitor Ignore it, Cam advised the solicitor, standing in the open library doorway. Lady Trubridge's butler had taken one quick glance and fled the scene. The young man's face was as fiery as his hair. I will return at a, a more convenient time. Gina wanted to sink through the floor in mortification, or, at the very least, drop into a dead faint. But a disobedient heart kept beating in a steady rhythm. Cam came around the end of the library table, casually rearranging his neckcloth. I heartily apologize, sir, he said, bowing. But I have clean forgotten your name. It must be the excitement of the moment. My name is Finkbottle, he said. Mr. Ranton's junior solicitor. We had the pleasure of meeting last week in the Queen's Smile. Well, Mr. Finkbottle, Cam said, may I have the pleasure of introducing you to my wife, the very one whom I'm annulling? Gina dropped into an awkward curtsy. Her knees were still trembling. I apologize for my disarray. I was unprepared for your arrival. But that sounded as if she were casting blame on him, something no proper duchess ever did. It was entirely our fault, she added. Please forgive us. May I return at a later moment? No, no. I imagine you've come to speak about... She stumbled over the words. About our annulment. Please, do be seated. Mr. Ranton desired me to inform His Grace that your plan to remain in England only a week appears to be inadvisable, Mr. Finkbottle reported. What on earth is taking him so long? The Duchess wants to remarry immediately, and I need to return to Greece, Ham said. Mr. Rountin is, of course, aware of your wish to fulfil your commitments in Greece in a timely fashion. Phineas Finkbottle mumbled. 
He'd never been much good at fabrications. The Duke and Duchess's annulment papers were burning a hole in his chest pocket as he spoke. But Roughton's command was clear. Delay. I am expecting a communication from Mr. Roughton within a day or two. I am staying in the nearest village, and I will— Oh, no, Gina said. Lady Trowbridge will surely be pleased to have you remain here. We wouldn't wish you to be housed in a dreary inn on our account. I insist, she said, jumping to her feet. I shall speak to Lady Trowbridge at once. Your Grace, Mr. Finkbottle. She curtsied, without meeting either man's eyes, and left the room at what she hoped was a dignified pace, rather than an indecorous trot. Where did you train? Cam inquired. Lincoln's Inn? Unfortunately, no, Mr. Finkbottle replied. But he seemed reluctant to continue. Sergeant's Inn? I trained on the continent. Ah, Cam replied. He eyed Finkbottle's red hair speculatively. Are you French by any chance? There are Frenchmen among my ancestors. And have you worked for Rountan long? Not very long, Finkbottle replied, courteously enough. Cam watched him go with a slight frown. Something about the man didn't fit his prim solicitor's garb. Something awkward in the way he moved, as if he was about to trip over his own feet. Esme was not particularly happy to find herself seated next to her husband at supper. Lady Trowbridge apologetically explained that she was having remarkable difficulty working out an appropriate seating plan. The pleasant thing about you and Lord Rawlings, she confided to Esme, is that you are so remarkably civil. I'm afraid that does tempt one to seat you together. Miles and I do not hesitate to dine together. He is my husband, after all. That's very kind of you, Lady Trowbridge patted her arm. Yet one hates to force propinquity where none exists on its own. Please, do not be concerned, Esme assured her. Then she found herself elbow to elbow with her spouse. Good evening, she said, accepting a helping of bombarded veal from a footman. How are you? He beamed at her. One could never say that Miles was handsome or particularly gifted, but he had a genuinely kindly disposition. There wasn't a bit of hesitation in his face on seeing with whom he was seated. More the opposite. I am quite well, he answered. The better for seeing you, my dear. In truth, I've been meaning to ask you this age what you think we should do about the local church. The vicar writes me that the steeple is tumbling down. Oh, dear. Esme said. I believe he had some eight hundred pounds last year to rebuild the cemetery wall. Was that the amount? I knew there was a substantial sum, but I couldn't remember precisely. Shall we mend the steeple, then? The estate seems quite solvent. Goodness knows why. It would be a shame if the steeple fell, Esme pointed out. It was an example of Miles's innate goodness that he bothered to ask her opinion. In fact, that he kept her as his wife at all. Many a man would have cast her off years ago. Are you quite all right, Esme? he asked. You don't seem to be as jovial as I am accustomed to finding you. Oh, yes, she said rather bleakly. I am quite myself. Really, Miles had the kindest eyes she'd ever seen, outside the calves' pasture. Unbidden, tears rose to her eyes. He took her hand under the table. I may not have been the best of husbands, but I am very fond of you. Is there anything I can do to make you more cheerful? I do have one question, she said. Yet now that she'd broached the topic, she hardly knew how to continue. To ask such a delicate question, here, in company. But a quick glance told her that no one was paying attention. After all, there is nothing more uninteresting than a married couple having a civil conversation. I am at your service, he assured her, patting her hand. She lowered her voice to a whisper. Do you still wish for an heir, Miles? His eyes widened, and he spluttered into speech. But you, you, you were— uh... I know, I said many things, 
but I was very young when we married, Miles. I am ten years older now, and more aware of my responsibilities. My nephew, he began, and stopped himself. Are you quite certain, my dear? When she looked at his plump face and plumper body, she wasn't at all certain. But how many times could it take? Surely there would be only a few uncomfortable encounters, and then she would have a child. She clasped his hand under the table. I would like to make amends for my foolishness years ago, Miles. I had no right to deny you an heir. His cheeks turned a little pink. In truth, my dear, it has been my fondest wish. These past few years I felt the lack of a son keenly. Except— He chewed his lip. I will have to discuss the matter with Lady Child. She flinched. Is that absolutely necessary? A child will change a great deal in our lives. You and I will have to live together, for instance, once the child is born. I'll release the lease on my house in Porter Square. Could we not continue living as we are? Oh, no, Miles said, with a firmer tone than she'd ever heard from him. I would have to live in the house and set a good example. He hesitated. We will both have to be a good bit more discreet. It wouldn't be right for the child. Esme had never been one to overlook the absurd, and she could certainly see it in this conversation. Perhaps if we maintain the lease in Porter Square, you could... Uh, visit Lady Child there, at the same time that you are setting a good example at home. It would be a delicate situation. She's a wonderful woman, Lady Child. In truth, she's changed my life. I'm never late. Never late anywhere. Why, I actually gave a speech in Parliament last year. She wrote it, of course. So I'll have to bring up the subject gently. He unthinkingly clutched Esme's hand so hard that it began to ache. I am certain that Lady Child will be understanding, she said. She has children of her own, and she must know how important this is to you. Even if she throws me over, it would be nothing— compared to the happiness of starting a family, Miles said. My goodness! Esme looked more closely at her spouse. I had no idea that you were so attached to the idea of reproducing yourself. When we first married, I didn't give a hang, he admitted. But I'm not getting any younger, my dear, and the idea has grown on me. There was nothing I could do about it. He swooped and suddenly kissed her cheek. This means the world to me. Smiling into his beaming eyes, Esme could see her future changing. No longer a scandalous married woman, she was about to become domesticated, even matronly. She would live with her husband and set a good example, whatever that entailed. Unfortunately, she was not greatly enamoured of principled activities. Shall we say in two days? Miles was asking. For a moment, Esme had no idea what he was talking about. That will give me ample time to discuss the situation with Lady Child. She finally caught his meaning. Apparently, domestic life would begin directly after Lady Child had, presumably, given her approval. You're a good person, Miles, she said. It is honourable of you to be so forthright with Lady Child. Miles turned the ripe colour of an embarrassed Englishman and mumbled something. Esme let her eyes drift down the long table. Sebastian was seated next to his betrothed, of course. Gina was laughing delightedly. And Sebastian, just for a moment, she gave herself the luxury of looking at him. He was bending his head to listen to something Gina was saying. His hair gleamed in the light of the candelabra. Her heart thumped unhappily. She sighed and looked up to find Miles watching her with a look of distress. I'm very sorry, my dear, he said quietly. She hated it that Miles was not only extraordinarily nice, but also perceptive, far too perceptive for a man. She managed a weak smile. You're a good woman, he said, and don't think I don't know it. She chuckled at that. I doubt anyone at this table would agree with you. 
They would be wrong, he said. He smiled once again, and turned to his neglected dinner companion to the right. Esme turned to Bernie, but even Bernie's shoulders held no appeal. Moreover, he was beginning to take on a beaten, petulant air that indicated that she would have to give him his walking papers. How was the hunting today? she said, shaving her lips into a smile. As she listened to the demise of three grouse, a game hen, and two rabbits, Esme tried to imagine herself in bed with Miles. Impossible. It was literally impossible to imagine. Even ten years ago, they'd hardly slept together after the first few weeks of marriage. What had her impulsiveness led to? But the truth was nestled in her heart. She wanted a baby, more than she wished to continue being the scandalous Esme Rawlings. She wanted a baby to nuzzle and hold and cuddle and kiss. She was tired of muscular arms and seductive glances. The truth was that she would exchange them all for a sweetly fuzzy head. Thinking about it, she smiled at Bernie in such a way that he forgot his newfound belief that Lady Rawlings was merely toying with him. I say, he said, pressing her hand. Esme winced. That hand had just been crushed by her husband. May I have the first dance this evening? A fleeting image shot through her head of the last time she and Miles had danced together. He had floundered about the dance floor like a dying fish. She turned her mind away from the obvious parallel. I would be pleased to dance with you. The second dance as well, if you wish. Bernie glowed. He'd had the idea lately that Lady Rawlings was too much of a high stepper for him. Obviously, he had been wrong. 22. Lady Helen, Countess Godwin, escapes an unpleasant experience in the city. Carola Perwinkle was beside herself with a combination of nervousness and joy. I think the plan is working. I believe. He kissed me. She stopped for a moment. Isn't that wonderful, Esme? Isn't that simply wonderful? Esme pretended that she was too busy adjusting a pin cowl to turn around. They had retreated to the ladies' dressing room. She had her hair up a la grec again, and her toque had a lamentable way of lurching to the side. It is, darling, she said, injecting warmth into her voice. I'm so happy that Tuppy is seeing the light. Perhaps he'll kiss me again during the evening. Carola smoothed the front of her straw-coloured crepe ball gown. I wasn't going to wear this, because it's so low around the bosom, but then I remembered. She was interrupted by the door opening. Esme turned around, and a genuine smile broke out on her face. Helen, love, what a pleasure to see you. I had no idea that you were planning on making us a visit. The Countess Godwin had sleek blonde hair, caught up in a complicated arrangement on her head. She was tall and slender, with cheekbones so prominent that she gave the impression of being too thin for perfect health. Good evening, Esme, and what a pleasure to see you, Carola. Carola rushed over like a kitten, words tumbling over each other. Helene relaxed into a chair, laughing at Carola's exuberance. Let me get this straight, she said. You have decided that you want your husband back, for goodness knows what reason, and our own Esme has given you such excellent advice that the poor man is beside himself with lust after one fishing excursion. I hope that rain is not forecast for tomorrow. It would put such a damper on this budding affection. Rain calls fish to the surface, Carola said, grinning. I'm quite the expert. What a lovely image, Helen replied. You and Tuppy shivering on the river bank while you exchange heated glances in the rain. Even the thought makes me glad not to be a fisherman. Carola broke into a peal of laughter. Oh, Helen, one cannot imagine you on a river bank at all. You are far too elegant. Thank goodness, she replied, turning to Esme. Well, how is our local heartbreaker? Is Dudley as luscious as you said in your letter? 
Not Dudley, Bernie. And yes, he is luscious. But as a matter of fact, to use a piscine reference, I'm about to throw him back into the sea. Carola had bent over the dressing table to tuck in an errant curl, but she turned around at that. You are? But I thought— She smiled mischievously. That you hadn't quite reeled him in yet. Esme wrinkled her nose. Enough, Pipsqueak. She shrugged. I'm borrowing a leaf from your book, Carola. I'm taking my husband back. Carola gasped. Miles! You're taking back Miles? He's my only husband to date. Helen didn't say anything, but her eyes narrowed. I want a child, and Miles is the obvious man to fulfill that desire. There was no point in dressing up the truth, at least not in front of her friends. Carola sank into a chair, dismay written on her face. Esme almost laughed. You both look as if I had announced a funeral. Won't you miss Bernie? Carol asked. Esme shook her head. Absolutely not. That is quite a sacrifice, Helene said, watching her. I want a baby rather terribly, Esme replied. It's grown so that I don't care very much about Bernie, or his muscles, or indeed any man's muscles. I just want a baby. Helene nodded. I know what you mean. I don't, Carola said. I don't think that Esme should reconcile with Miles. I mean, Miles. He's run to fat, and he's slaveringly attached to Lady Child. Not any more, Esme said, with a gleam of amusement in her eyes. He threw her over for you, Carol exclaimed. There's no need to sound so surprised, Helen said, with a gurgle of laughter. Miles would be lucky to come within ten feet of his wife, and I'm certain he knows it. Miles is a nice man, Esme said. A very kind man. He genuinely loves Lady Child, but he wants an heir. Well, it's true that I've never known you not to win any man you desired, Esme, Carola said. It's just such a shock to think of you with Miles. Goodness sakes, he doesn't compare to Bernie, does he? Esme picked up her fan from the dressing table and waved it before her face. I haven't the faintest idea what can be found in Bernie's head. Whatever it is, there aren't many brains to challenge it. Still, what a change this'll be. Here I am reconciling with Tuppy, or I hope to, at least, and Gina is about to marry her Marquis. Perhaps, Esme interjected. Helene raised an eyebrow but Carola kept going. And you are going to have a child with Miles. Are you planning to live with him? Yes, he thinks it would be best for the child. And I believe I agree with him, Esme said with an air of surprise. How odd, Carol exclaimed. There will be three of us actually living with our husbands. No longer the most scandalous set in the tom, by any means. I shall have to hold up the torch for the rest of you, Helen put in. Carola grinned. Oh, Helen, you are the antithesis of scandalous. I am not, she said with faint indignation. After all, I don't live with my husband, and since I couldn't contemplate lying next to him, unless we were both in a tomb, I won't be joining the three of you on your merry, married adventures. Esme gave a wry smile. You think I'm making a devil's bargain, do you? No, I don't, Helen said. I would love to have a child. And if my husband were even half as respectable and kindly as yours, I would break down his door demanding my marital rights. But as it is... Why did you join us here? Esme asked, carefully not looking at her friend, but instead watching the lazy sway of her fan. I thought you were determined to stay in London for the month. There was a moment's pause. He attended the opera last night, Helen said, with his young woman in tow. Carola gave a squeak of disapproval. That dissipated, degenerate... Debaucher, Esme chimed in. I was going to say bounder, Carola said with dignity. 
You could say dog, Esme added. Oh, dastard, Helen put in. Lord Godwin is a pig. I can't believe he brought that trollop to the opera. Don't tell me they entered the box. Carola's eyes grew round at the thought. Helen sat with her back perfectly straight, a posture normal to her, but her chin rose just a fraction of an inch in the air. They did. Oh, my goodness, Carola cried. Esme snapped her fan shut. Dastard is too good for him. I was seated with Major Casting, Helen said. It was a difficult moment. It must have been horrible, Carola said. She pressed Helen's hand. I wouldn't describe it as horrible, but it was difficult. Esme grinned at her. Cut rope, Helen. Difficult. It sounds hellish to me. A smile curled the edge of Helen's lips. Major Casting was a support to me. Esme snorted. About all he could be, the old stick. I can't understand why you like going about with him. He knows his music, she replied. And he has no interest in making advances. I should say not, Esme says. Why, everyone knows that... She broke off. Knows what? Carola asked. I never heard it rumoured that Major Kirsting was enamoured of any particular woman. He isn't, Esme replied. That's the point, Carola. He prefers male companionship. Oh! When Carola was shocked, her eyes grew as round as a baby's, and she looked even more cherubic than ever. He's a dear man, Helen said, with a hint of sharpness in her tone. I didn't mean to disparage one of your entourage, Esme remarked. I like casting, for all his primness. At any rate, Helen continued, Major Casting was very helpful. He talked, talked to her until the theatre was darkened, and then we left, of course. Esme opened her fan again. I don't see why your husband takes such great delight in tormenting you. Isn't it enough that he moved the woman into your house? I expect he didn't consider whether I would be there. He simply wanted to introduce the girl to Cosi Fantuti. He says she has a voice. Oh, I'm sure, Esme said in a tone of pure disgust. A voice that she... I have come to the conclusion that she is not to blame for her situation. I had the sense that she was only fourteen or fifteen. She spoke in an extremely youthful fashion. Fourteen? Your husband is disgusting, Carola squealed. Esme threw her a quelling look. That has been an accepted fact since Godwin invited his youthful trollop into the house. There's no need to reiterate it. I would antedate general acceptance to the point when he invited three female members of a Russian singing group to live with him, Helen said thoughtfully. It was a low moment for the ancestral mansion, or so the servants said. They left in droves and informed most of London of their reasons. That was before you debuted, Carola. Esme nodded. I remember. The girls were dancing naked on the dining room table when the butler walked in. It was just after you left the house, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Perhaps he was lonely, she said with a touch of irony. Not for long, Esme pointed out. I can't believe you two are funning over this, Carola said. Helene's husband is a disgusting, degenerate... You're repeating yourself. Esme put in. It's not a laughing matter. Here's poor Helen living in her mother's house while her husband turns her own house into a bordello. You also live in your mother's house, Helen pointed out. And, happily enough, I like my mother. But Tuppy isn't running a bordello out of my former bedchamber. Tell me more about Tuppy, Helen remarked. I am agog to hear when you decided that you wished to take him back. Carola erupted into a tangled speech about dancing and fish, with a few references to brown curls thrown in. Perhaps we should repair to the ballroom, Helen suggested, smiling. It sounds as if your tuppy might be pining in your absence. Esme fixed Carola with an admonishing look. You must not make your feelings obvious. 
It's all right to crow over it among us, but you must not, must not, by any gesture or even a blink of the eye, let Tuppy know that you prefer him over Neville. Well, Carola said, surely I could just— No, Esme said, you may not. Let me put it this way. You must make certain the fish is well up on the bank before you remove the hook. I know, Carola said, sighing. Twenty-three. A brazen challenge and an injured jawbone. The ballroom was sparsely populated, since only the house party was in attendance. A small orchestra played a waltz at one end. Neville and Carola were soon circling the room, Neville swinging her in great arching circles with his usual flair. Lord, Esme said, looking around, there are no men tonight. Not that it signifies, given my new marital status. Helene was not a demonstrative person, but she gave her friend a fleeting kiss on the cheek. I would give anything to trade places with you. You would? I never knew you wanted a child. There was no point in airing the subject. My husband and I will never reconcile. And you are not the type of woman to have an illegitimate child. I have considered it. Helene! This was truly a night for surprises. But quickly rejected the idea, she continued with a fleeting smile. For one thing, I have no interest in muscled bodies like that of your Bernie. So who would play the role of father? Why don't you ask Reese for a divorce? The two of you have so much wealth that surely it would be possible. I have thought of that as well, Helen replied. But who would I marry? I am not like you, Esme, with hundreds of beaux wilting at your feet. I am a dull person who only likes music. No man has made me an indecent proposition for years, let alone suggest that I divorce my husband and marry him. Nonsense! You are a beautiful woman, and when you find the right person, he will fall at your feet. You would never wish to marry one of the fools I play with. I wouldn't mind marrying your Miles, Helen admitted. That's absurd. No, it's not. I have come to value kindness above all. He's plump, Helen shrugged. I am too thin. He's going bald. I have enough hair for both of us. He's in love with his mistress. That's the best part about resuming your marriage. Miles will never pester you for displays of affection that you are unwilling to give. Esme looked at her friend curiously. Poor darling, she said, taking her arm. You must be properly blue to consider such a horrid fate. Leave the plump, balding men to me. We will find you a willowy man with a passion for music and kindness dripping from his fingers. Helen laughed. Meanwhile, I'll introduce you to Bernie, Esme said, seeing him ploughing toward her. Unfortunately, he has none of the qualities you respect. Given his extraordinary bloodthirstiness on the hunting field, I'm afraid he can't even qualify for kindness. Some time later, Esme found herself dancing with her husband. Miles was not a good dancer. He tended to bounce on the tips of his toes and wipe his face repeatedly with a large handkerchief but he smiled so gaily and was so complimentary that it was a pleasant experience. He was considerate, Miles was. He never glowered. In fact, she couldn't remember him ever being in a bad mood. Why did we separate, Miles? she asked impulsively. He looked surprised. You asked me to move out, my dear. Esme sighed. I was a horrid little beast, and I'm truly sorry. No, you weren't, he replied. I was tedious. I wanted too much from you. Nothing more than a wife ought to give her husband, Esme said. But those are wives who actually knew their husbands, he pointed out. Your father did you a disservice. He should have waited until we knew each other. Esme shrugged her shoulders. It's a common state of affairs. It shouldn't be. There was an edge to his voice that made Esme look at him in surprise. 
I don't feel right about it, he confessed. I feel as if I bought you. I saw you dancing, and I had to have you. Presented myself to your father the very next morning. Yes, Esme said, feeling very tired. I remember. She remembered the summons to come down to the library, to answer a plump, yellow-haired baron who had just asked for her hand in marriage. Given her father's approval, there was no answer other than yes expected, and she had said yes. It wasn't right. The dance was over, and they walked toward the chairs at the side of the room. I should have introduced myself to you, courted you, but I was overcome by your beauty. All I could think of was asking for your hand before someone else took you. They were calling you the Aphrodite that season. I'd forgotten that, Esme said, thinking of Gina's statue. So I bought you, he repeated. I shouldn't have done it. I felt it was a wrongful action ever since I saw you crying before the wedding. You saw me crying? He nodded. I came around the church and you were crying and holding on to your mamma. I felt shabby. And I've felt shabby ever since. He pressed her hand. I want to apologize before we try a new life together. Will you forgive me, Esme? Of course. He looked rather pink. If it is quite all right with you, I might visit your room day after tomorrow if you... you... That would be lovely. Are you quite certain? Quite, quite certain. You see, Esme said, grinning at him, I am choosing you rather than my father doing so, and that makes all the difference, Miles. He smiled too, rather uncertainly. Have you spoken to Lady Child, then? she asked. Yes, he said, turning even redder. She is most understanding, most kind, most understanding. His voice trailed away. Esme took his hand. He had a beautiful, fine-grained hand, quite unlike his ungainly body. If you ever change your mind and wish Lady Child in your life, she said in a low, clear voice, I would understand. He shook his head. That would be shabby as well. I have grown too old to behave like a child. My opinion of myself matters a good deal to me these days. Esme leaned forward and dropped a kiss on his lips. His eyes were blue and utterly round. There are a good deal of people, myself among them, who act like children every day. I'm proud to think that the father of my babes is not one of them. A flush jumped up his cheeks. No need to say that. Ah, oh, here is your next partner, unless I miss my guess. He stood up and beamed at Bernie Burdett. Esme choked back a giggle. Only Miles would smile at the man half the ton believed to be his wife's lover. Carola was still dancing with Neville when Tuppy entered the ballroom. She gave her partner a huge, glimmering smile. Let me guess. Perwinkle has arrived, Neville said. How did you know? He rolled his eyes. Remind me never to partner you in whist. Do you think Tuppy will ask me to dance? Has he ever danced with you? I think so. We must have danced when we first met. But he absolutely refused to dance in the year during which we were married. I mean, Carola said rather confusedly, during the first year of our marriage. Neville expertly swung her in a circle. I expect he hates dancing, in that case. The fact that it is your favourite activity might give one pause. Carola nodded, keeping her eyes fixed on his face, so as not to look at Tuppy. Are you quite certain that you want to reclaim your boring husband? Because I love dancing. Thank you, Neville, but no. I am ten times more handsome. How very ungracious of you to point it out. You don't seem to have noticed my manifold virtues he complained. So I am forced to bring them to your attention. Shall I end this dance next to your beloved, then, and hand you over? I don't think so, Carola said, succumbing to an attack of shyness. You have to act naturally. 
I shall die of humiliation if he suspects my intentions. Of course he suspects. Didn't he kiss you? Anyone could have kissed me. Men rarely kiss women without provocation. For example, I've never kissed you, he pointed out. Perhaps you should, she said, with a speculative gleam in her eye. Is Tuppy watching? Carola, kissing on the dance floor is paramount to declaring that we are engaged in an extramarital relationship, Neville objected. Not only would it damage your reputation, perhaps irredeemably, but it isn't the case. More's the pity. Her mouth set in a stubborn little line. Will it damage your reputation? To the contrary. Then kiss me. Now, please. Neville slowed his dance step to a near standstill and leaned forward, so his face was a fraction of an inch from hers. When I kiss you, I'd like you to think only of me. I'll try, she said with a little giggle. He looked over her shoulder. I think we have achieved the desired resolution without endangering your reputation overmuch. Your husband is coming this way, looking like a thundercloud. She gave him a smile so brilliant it looked as if it had been painted on. Don't leave me, she whispered. Only if violence is imminent. Then he bowed urbanely. Lord Perwinkle, what a pleasure to see you again. How was the— But whatever kindly remark Neville was about to offer was cut off by a solid thwunk, a fist meeting chin. He flew backward— unconsciously trying to regain his balance by tightening his grip on the nearest support, Carola. And Carola, being a little pint of a person, flew through the air even faster than Neville, and landed even harder. He grunted, she shrieked. The orchestra stopped playing instantly and craned their necks. Tuppy Perwinkle, maker of his own fishing laws and a man resigned to the bachelor state, stood over his two victims, trying to figure out what the hell had happened. Carola, he growled, get off the floor. But she had landed hard on her bottom. Worse, her dignity had taken an even harder beating. She ignored him and came to her knees next to Neville. Dearest, she cried, are you all right? Standing to her right, Mr. Reginald Gerard rolled his eyes. Amateur actresses invariably overacted, and Lady Perwinkle was no exception. Neville Charlton, on the other hand, was maintaining an enviable calm, and seemed a good candidate for the stage. Neville opened one eye and peered at Carola. Then the other eye opened, and he regarded the concerned and excited faces that ringed his vision. Oh, he said, rubbing his chin. Carola ignored her husband's outstretched hand and scrambled to her feet. "'You must be cracked,' she said, fists clenched. The circle of faces around her nodded. They agreed. The provocation, while notable, was not equal to the punishment. Then everyone looked back at Neville, still on the floor. He came to his feet in a leisurely kind of way, and began to repair his neckcloth. Tuppy was beginning to feel like an almighty fool. "'You look all right,' Neville fingered his jawbone. "'I believe I shall survive,' he said, as if discussing a fall from an apple tree. "'Do you intend to air your reasons for this assault?' He said it in the nicest possible tone. "'No,' Tubby replied. "'I do not plan to do so.' Despite himself, his hands curled into fists again, when he saw how Carola was fluttering around Neville, brushing his coat. Neville pushed her away. Let's not provoke the maddened ball, shall we? But Carola was beside herself with rage and humiliation. She flew back to Neville's side and clutched his arm. How dare you assault my future husband, she shouted at Tuppy, her voice high. The man I love more than anyone in the world. Tuppy turned even paler. I foresee a small problem, he began. As do I. Neville put in. But Carola was almost panting with rage. You had the temerity to assault the man I love. You must apologize at once. 
There was a dreadful moment of silence. All right, I apologize, Tuppy said, turning to his victim. Neville was still rubbing his chin and trying to pretend that he was elsewhere. He dropped his hand and raised an eyebrow inquiringly. Surely Perwinkle was saner than his wife, but alas, not so. You can have her, Tuppy snapped. Take her. I don't want her. I can't imagine why I try to protect her reputation. With that, he turned on his heel and walked from the room. Bystanders fell back in utter silence as he walked by. Helene stepped forward and took Carola's arm. She smilingly looked around at the fascinated eyes of the women surrounding them. Lady Perwinkle must refresh herself, she announced. Men are exhausting, are they not? So much passion. Only a woman as beautiful and chaste as she could provoke so much passion. Lady Truebridge nodded, and everyone else followed their hostess's lead. Helene drew Carola from the room. Gina felt her husband's presence at her elbow before he made a sound. Good evening, she said. Did you see your friend Perwinkle's remarkable performance? Make sport of the throes of passion at your peril, he said with mock gruffness. What do you know about the throes of passion? she laughed. Too much, he said, his voice taking on a husky undertone. His wife was wearing an absurd evening dress. It was extremely tight in the upper body and trimmed with a little frill around the neck. With her red hair and white skin, she looked like a seductive Queen Elizabeth. And when was the last time you defended a lady's virtue? she asked. She had eyes the colour of a piece of glass fished from the Greek ocean, and hair like an early sunset. Do you want to go back to the library and pick up where we left off? he said. It would be a shame not to answer Bixfiddle's letters promptly. Perhaps there are emergencies we should be discussing. A smile transformed into something altogether more mysterious and seductive. Tam, he had better watch his step. Unless he wanted to sign up for a life supervising bridges over Charlcote Stream, he couldn't go much farther than— No, thank you, she said. He couldn't remember what she was talking about. I would rather not continue working on estate papers in the library, she clarified, a thread of laughter in her voice. Cam grimaced. The orchestra had started up again. Let's dance, he said taking her by the hand. We can't, Gina protested. This is a roulade, and Lady Truebridge has not yet arranged sets. It's a waltz. He flipped a coin to the conductor that shone gold as it turned over and over. The roulade turned abruptly into a waltz. I'm not sure this is a good idea, Gina said, looking up at her husband. We're supposed to be awaiting our annulment, not dancing together. People will talk. He considered that idea for a moment. If you don't dance with me, I shall kiss you right here on the dance floor. What? On the other hand, if you dance with me, I won't kiss you at the moment. His eyes glinted with promise. You had better dance, because I don't think that Bonington will appreciate the kiss. Given Tuppy's example, he might feel honour-bound to protect your reputation by trying to floor me. And, he grinned, oh, I'm not sure he's up to it. He danced the way he spoke, the way he lived, in bold, impetuous dashes and wild, seductive turns. Gina could tell that people were staring at them. She felt a prickling in her shoulders. She wrapped composure around her like a chilly velvet and dared onlookers to make a comment. Cam felt the change in her body, and looked down to find that he was holding a duchess in his arms. A duchess with a capital D. Gina's beautiful, lithe body was as rigid as a board. No one could possibly interpret their dance in a suggestive light. In fact, her chilly indifference was positively marital. He felt a ripple of extreme annoyance. He preferred his wife with a blush and a giggle. I believe your brother might be a member of the house party, he said. Why on earth do you think that? Just because. Remarkably poor reasoning. If my brother were here at the party, he would have identified himself. 
What would he say? There was more than a trace of scorn in Cam's voice. How do you do, Your Grace? I'm your illegitimate brother. Why not? What if your brother sent the blackmailing letter? Pardon me, he said over his shoulder as they bounced off another couple. I don't think we should speak about this in public, she hissed. She had lost her composure. One curl had fallen from the complicated arrangement on her head and was bobbing against her neck. Cam thought about kissing that neck, and white hot lust shot through his limbs. Let's retire to the library and discuss it at liberty, he said silkily. I don't know what you think you're doing, Gina hissed, having discovered that her husband's crooked smile had the disconcerting ability to make her blood race. We're getting an annulment. We are annulling our marriage. Our marriage is ending. Our marriage is— I agree, he interrupted. Then why are you courting me? When Gina was uncertain, she turned into a duchess extraordinaire. Her question sounded like a royal proclamation. Her eyes had never looked more commanding, her tone more utterly self-possessed. He wanted nothing more than to shake that composure from her and return her to the impulsive, shrieking girl he had once deserted in a bluebell wood. I'm not courting you, he said, condescension intentionally underscoring his tone. I'm seducing you, Gina. There is a difference. There was a fractional pause. The music came to an end. Seduction would be remarkably foolish, given your wish to be rid of me. Her tone was thoughtful. In fact, I think it could fairly be said to be the opposite of what you desire. He raised his eyebrows. I do not wish to be rid of you, and if you are not certain about what I desire, I would be happy to illustrate it at great length. The corner of her mouth curled up unwillingly. But she caught Lady Trubridge's interested eyes and remembered the more important subject. What do you mean you don't wish to get rid of me? We are not even in a real marriage, for goodness sake. You asked me for the annulment. I like having you round. Well, I like reading your letters. You don't want me as a wife, she pointed out. Merely as a correspondent. She coloured slightly, but continued. Seducing me will not encourage me to write you letters. You don't want me to be your wife, Cam. Only because I'm not the wiving sort, he replied. I think the more pertinent fact is that you don't want me as a husband. I'd be perfectly happy to continue as we are. In fact, with a few modifications in our arrangements. What are you talking about? Our marriage, he explained. Then he wondered what on earth he was saying. So, in the way of all men, he retreated. I hadn't found our arrangement too onerous. That is not what you said. You said something about making modifications. In fact, it sounded to me as if you suggested that we halt the annulment. Cam felt the blood drain from his head. Had he really said that? Surely not. His eyes drifted to his wife's creamy, delicate shoulders and long neck. He had said that. Well, she demanded, voice as sharp as any Shakespearean heroine. There's no need to be triumphant about it, he said, trying for an easy tone. If you lost your nerve and decided not to marry your ice-bound Marquis, I'd be happy to keep you on. No one could complain about the work you've done at Garton. Her cheeks were flagged with crimson patches. Oh, really? Isn't that nice? I can move from being the invisible wife who causes no trouble to being an invisible wife who causes no trouble while continuing to do a great deal of work. How splendid for me! I shall give up a man who loves me and wants me to have his children for a man who admires my letters and my management abilities. It was only a suggestion, Cam said feeling a wash of relief. It must have showed on his face. I should like to know what you meant by modifications. Her eyes were narrowed. When he didn't answer, she gave him a sharp poke in the ribs. Come! He had that amused, sleepy look about him that made her stomach tighten.
I was talking about bedding, he replied, without even looking about to see whether anyone was listening. If we stayed married, I think we should share a bed, at least when I'm in England, don't you think? Even better, she said shrilly, trying to ignore the little voice in her head that seemed to be traitor, welcoming the idea of sharing Cam's bed. I gather that I become an estate-managing wife who raises a family alone while her husband frolics in a foreign country. Ah, oh, but we could have a good deal of pleasure before I left. And I would visit. His whole face was wicked now. He wasn't even touching her, and she felt as if he was caressing her. A glowing weakness lay low in the pit of her stomach. She opened her mouth to say something. But what? A cough sounded at her elbow. Marquis Bonington gave Cam a scant bow. The evening has deteriorated into an unpleasant display, he said with glacial emphasis. I propose that we adjourn to the library and practice our roles in Much Ado About Nothing. Lady Truebridge has just informed me that she has invited a large party to see the performance day after tomorrow. Gina's eyes widened. She promised it would be a simple skit for the house party alone. Apparently she changed her mind. Cam chuckled. I hope she's not expecting us to match the thespian abilities of Lord and Lady Perwinkle. The less said about that disgraceful scene, the better, Sebastian commented. Quite, he replied. Gina had the horrible suspicion that Cam was laughing silently at her betrothed. Come along, then. If we are to make fools of ourselves... We might as well practice our humiliation beforehand. There's the spirit, Cam said. He turned and scanned the room. Where, oh, where is the beauty of Sophia? Sebastian frowned. That's from Hamlet, Cam noted, adding painstakingly. Another Shakespeare play. I was referring to the more than beauteous Esme. The line reads, Where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? Sebastian snapped, walking toward the library. He paused when they all reached the room. Shall we begin with the first act? A less dignified man might have been described as barking. That would be us, Cam said in a sunny tone. He caught Gina's hand, but Sebastian was holding her arm. If you would allow Beatrice and Benedict to sit down. He drew Gina to the couch. Esme sat down opposite them looking amused. "'You'd better take your gloves off,' Cam said, handing Gina a book. He frowned when he saw the myriad of tiny buttons extending to her elbows. She watched as his dark head bent over her wrist, and he began nimbly pulling apart the small pearl buttons on the inside of her wrist. "'I'm perfectly capable of reading with my gloves on.' Sebastian made an irritable gesture and sat down next to Esme. When you are quite ready, he said, with a biting edge to his voice. Cam drew off both gloves and tossed them aside, without giving Sebastian a second glance. There we are, he said, in such an intimate tone that Gina felt as if she were transferred to the bedchamber. Begin, then, her betrothed snarled from the opposite couch. What, my dear Lady Disdain, are you yet living? Cam said with so much amusement in his voice that Gina's mouth curled upward, despite the fact that she was still annoyed with him. His eyes met hers, black and laughing, and her heart hiccuped. "'We can't sit like sticks,' Cam remarked. "'We'll have to act this thing out, now that we are to have a proper audience.' He picked up her hand and kissed the palm. Sebastian made a growling noise. "'Is it possible disdain should die?' "'While she hath such meat food to feed it as Signore Benedict,' Gina said, trying to ignore the tingling in her hand. Miracle of miracles, Esme had managed to engage her irate future husband in conversation. "'Why are you deliberately antagonizing Sebastian?' Gina hissed. "'Forgot the rest of your speech,' Cam replied with an irreverent smirk. Prompters at the theatre charge a penalty when actors haven't learned their lines properly. His eyes drifted in such a way 
that his idea of a penalty was readily obvious. Thankfully, my memory is excellent, Gina snapped. Courtesy itself must convert to disdain if you come in her presence. Then is courtesy a turncoat, Cam responded. And by the way, I think I've done you a signal favour by drawing off that boarhound you call your future husband. Nonsense, Gina said. You are playing with his feelings the way you play with everything. Aren't you ever serious, Cam? It is certain I am loved of all ladies, only you excepted. Annoyance boiled in her chest. She snatched away her hand. Somehow he'd kept hold of it, and was smoothing each finger in a way that made nerves tingle all the way up her arm. I don't believe you care about anything. You're nothing more than a care for naught, as my old nurse would say. Cam's face lost a bit of its impudent, seductive quality. Truly, I love none, he remarked. Gina's jaw said. That is just like you, she hissed. I insult you, and your reply is a choke. It's a line from the play, he protested. Benedict says that he doesn't love anyone. Gina scowled at her script. A dear happiness to women. They would else have been troubled with a pernicious suitor. You needn't sound so fathomed. Why not? It's true enough. You are Benedict in the flesh. You love no one, except perhaps your Greek Venus. I do care for Marissa. She's a passionate, loving woman. Cam decided that he didn't have to mention that Marissa's passion was reserved for her husband. How lovely, Gina cooed. I shall marry Sebastian, she threw a reckless smile toward the other couch. And you can return to your cosy domestic goddess. Cam was happy to see that Bonington was absorbed in a heated quarrel with Lady Rawlings. I wouldn't call her merely cosy, he said, dismissing the memory of his echoing house in Greece. Marissa is such a warm person that she seems to fill the house with laughter. So why don't you continue with that line about your cold blood? I thank God and my cold blood, Gina said between clenched teeth. I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. Cam gave a mock little bow of his head. Said with true flair, Beatrice to the life. Hopefully that cold blood will sustain you during your marriage with yonder icy Marquis. How dare you, Gina gasped. They both involuntarily looked at the opposite couch, but Esme and Sebastian were paying no attention. God keep your ladyship still in that mind, Cam said. So some gentleman or other shall scape a predestinate scratched face. Scratching could not make it worse, and twere such a face as yours were, she taunted. Oh, really? Cam snapped back. That's not in the play. Her green eyes were glowing with the pleasure of battle. He felt an unwilling surge of lust that rocked him from head to toe. Esme interrupted. Lord Bonington and I are going to take a brief turn in the garden. We will return in five minutes. Cam gave them a tight nod. Forgot your line, Gina said, the moment the door closed. I believe so. His hands bit into her shoulders, and he jerked her toward him. Then I own the forfeit, she said. Her tone was just a little uncertain as she watched his mouth descend on hers. Now he had her where he wanted her, on his lap, with her lips under his. She wiggled for a moment, and then her body melted against him, slender perfection and creamy, delicate curves. I determined the forfeit before we began. His voice was a husky rumble. Um, -hmm, she said. He deepened the kiss. His hands roamed greedily, moulding sweet curves, tracing breasts hampered and constrained by tight silk and a corset. What's this? he whispered, tracing a whalebone curve. I thought you forswore all corsets. I changed my mind. He stood, pulling her to her feet. Gina's knees were weak. Before she knew what was happening, he was towing her out of the room. Where are we going? she cried. 
He didn't even pause. Your bedchamber. What? She put all her weight in her heels. He turned around. We're going to your bedchamber, Gina. He tipped up her chin, and what he saw there made him shudder. Now. Still, she held back. We can't, unless... Her cheeks were wild rose, and her voice faltered. I must bring virginity to my marriage bed, Cam. He felt as if she had dashed him with cold water. His voice was flat. You really do think I'm an irresponsible lout. Uh, what did you call it? A care for naught. She felt the way his body stiffened, as if his skin were her own. No, that isn't the case. I trust you. I know you wouldn't do that. He waited, mouth grim. I don't trust myself. The words faltered from her lips, and she turned a deeper shade of rose. He thought about it. Her hair was swept high on her head, and diamonds shone on her ears. She looked precisely like a young, regal Queen Elizabeth. Except that Cam knew he could turn this queen into his with a touch of his lip. As he said nothing, her shoulders grew perceptibly stiffer. She turned with a swish of skirts. Shall we return to the play, sir? Your next line is... Well, you are a rare parish teacher. She sat down and picked up her book, as if it were the most fascinating document she'd ever seen. Camden Sarrard, the Duke of Girton, never acted out of pure instinct. Since hopping out the window of his father's house with literally tuppence in his pocket, he had survived by using his wits, acting not by instinct but by logic, combined with a strong wish for self-preservation. Until that moment, he found himself, Lord knows why, on his knees before a young and imperious queen. He reached out, cupped her face in his hands, and crushed her mouth under his. Large hands cradled her face, as if she were the most delicate piece of statuary ever made. She sighed into his mouth, an erotic little squeak, and strained against him. He let his hand run across her bodice, feather light over smooth cloth, cupped the curve of her breast, and ran his thumb over silk. Oh, come, she gasped. His eyes glinted with satisfaction. His other hand danced enticement, teased and caressed. She cried out, unable to keep the sound inside. He kissed her again, so that he could taste her gasps in his mouth. His hands went their sinful way, until she was boneless, gasping against his mouth, squirming for satisfaction she couldn't have, given the restraints of silk, taffeta, and one corset until a noise outside the door reminded an erring duke and duchess that they were not, in fact, in the duchess's bedchamber. Gina pulled back and stared at her husband. When he touched her, her breath turned to silken fire in her breast. When he kissed her, she became shameless. Everything about him, from his black eyes to his calloused hands, made her pulse with desire. I will never feel this for anyone else, she thought. The knowledge was very clear in her heart. Cam smiled at her easily and tucked the frill about her neck into order. He looked unmoved, as if they'd spent their time reading Shakespeare. I mustn't do this again, Gina thought, out of the new knowledge in her heart. I must not touch this man again. He is not mine, and will never be mine. That way lies only heartbreak. The remainder of the evening passed in a blur. They ran through the play three times, with her betrothed acting as a taskmaster. By the second time they were reasonably proficient, and she was drooping with fatigue. In the last run-through, Beatrice snapped at her Benedict with passionate emphasis. Benedict, conscious of growing frustration every time he looked at his delectable wife, snapped back with such intensity that even Marquis Bonington watched and wondered. 24. The Second Council of War
I don't think you've destroyed everything, Esme said, judiciously choosing a grape before she popped it in her mouth. But you certainly have made your life difficult. Carola shuddered. I don't see how you could eat at a time like this. Her voice had an edge of hysteria. You must come up with a plan to save my marriage. Esme raised an eyebrow. The number of grapes I consume has no effect on my sympathy, I assure you. The fact remains that Carola is right. We need a plan of action, Gina pointed out. I am very sorry to say this, Helen added, but Lady Truebridge informed me that Lord Perwinkle is leaving at first light tomorrow. There was a wail from Carola's side of the table, and Gina automatically handed her a handkerchief. The four women were sharing a meal in Carola's chamber, since she had once again refused to descend for luncheon. I believe the time has come for strong measures, Esme said, eating a grape. Carola lowered the handkerchief just enough to blink despairingly at her. I truly don't wish to marry Neville. More to the point, he shares your feelings, Gina noted. Carola scowled. He'll marry me if I tell him to, and I may have to if... if Tuppy decides to divorce me. She burst into tears again. Gina looked at the handkerchief Carola held to her face, and decided it had two or three more bouts of tears left to it. I believe that a bed trick is necessary, Esme said. Very appropriate, given that we're performing Shakespeare tomorrow. His plays are full of bed tricks. Helen looked pained. What on earth is a bed trick? A bed trick is the substitution of one person for another, Gina explained. The obvious problem would seem that, to the best of my knowledge, Tuppy has not invited anyone to share his bed. For whom will Carola substitute? That's the tricky bit, Esme admitted. Impossible, Carola sniffed damply. He doesn't want to sleep with me. One of us will have to seduce him, making an assignation for a later hour. Then Carola will be waiting. And Tuppy will leave in disgust, Carola interjected. No, he won't, Esme said. Because it will be dark. Don't you know anything about bed tricks? Carola shook her head. It sounds like just the sort of activity my mamma deplores. I believe it's the only solution. Tuppy has reason to believe that you dislike his performance in bed, and you've made it clear that you wish to end the marriage. You must convince Tuppy that you wish to be in his bed, nay, that you are willing to embarrass yourself to be there. The question is, who is going to make the assignation? Esme looked brightly at her two best friends. Gina? Helen? You, they answered in chorus. She grinned. As it happens, I've made an appointment with my husband for tomorrow night. Tonight is my last night in the solitary comfort of my bed, given that Mars's Garth is likely to have me sleeping on the floor. I cannot believe we are engaged in this disreputable conversation, Helene said, very pink in the face. However, I assure you that I cannot make an assignation. I haven't the faintest idea how to go about it. I disagree, Esme remarked. You simply haven't had the impulse yet. Six eyes turned to Gina, who was eating a tart, and clearly considered herself merely a spectator. Oh, no, she said startled, putting down her tart. I couldn't possibly. Why not? Esme said. Apparently Tuppy likes you already, given your knowledge of trout. I can't. I'm already... Already what? I won't allow it, Carola broke in. Tuppy likes Gina far too much. In fact, I don't like this plan at all, Esme. I don't want to watch someone flirting with my husband. You are all more beautiful than I am, and tall in the bargain. I won't have it. Three tall women looked at her affectionately. Her halo of golden curls was gleaming in the sunlight, and she looked as adorable as a new hatch chick. You're a fool, Esme said affectionately. But if you don't want Tuppy seduced, so be it. Why not just put Carola into Tuppy's bed late at night? Gina asked. 
He won't expect her, and it will be a lovely surprise. That is, if you really think Carola has to take such a drastic measure. I do, Esme replied. Tuppy has been humiliated before a large part of the ton. He's a man with a man's dislike for embarrassment. If I were Tuppy, I wouldn't go within a yard of my wife, no matter how besotted I was. Because he is besotted with you, darling, she said, turning to Carola. He can't be that besotted, given that you think he would invite any one of you to join his bed. We are not mere girls, Esme announced. I have complete faith that any of us could usher a defenceless male into our bed, without undue exertion. And that includes you, she said, giving Helene a stern look. What will I say when he enters the room? Oh, I couldn't, Carola cried. I forgot about his valet. We'll bribe his valet, Esme stated. With no valet, he'll have to undress himself. All of Lady Trubridge's guest chambers look precisely the same. She nodded toward Carola's heavily curtained bed. He won't even know you're there until he's unclothed and in bed. But then, what will I say to him? Nothing, Gina put in. Nothing? Carola's eyes were big. Gina's smile was full of mischief. Nothing at all. Esme looked at her with admiration. You are changing before my very eyes, Ambrogina Serrard. Whatever happened to your duchess-like facade? Duchesses grow accustomed to saying nothing when the occasion calls for it. So I gather, Esme replied, twinkling. All right, Carola said, bowing to the weight of necessity. I'll do it. Good. I shall instruct my maid to bribe his valet. And then we... Esme cast a glance at Gina and Helene. Shall detain Lord Perwinkle in the ballroom until the right moment. What moment? Carola asked. Eleven o'clock. We won't allow him to leave before that, Carola. So you must be snugly in his bed by then. I have to ask you all to excuse me, Gina said, casting a hasty look at the mantel clock and rising. Why so? Helene said. I was hoping you would take a ride with me. I said I would meet Cam in the library this afternoon, Gina said, with just a trace of self-consciousness in her voice. Oh, Esme chortled, the handsome husband. He's not my husband, Gina retorted. Well, he is, but not for long. I have promised to explain Bixfiddle's letters to him. Cam is going to take over management of the estate. Well, that's an improvement. Esme said. Perhaps he's finally leaving the ranks of childhood. That's not fair, Gina protested. Living in Greece, Cam had no idea how much work the estate can be. Helene touched her on the wrist and said in her light, clear voice, But how splendid of him to take over the work the moment he realized. Humph, Esme snorted. If I were you, I'd keep that husband of yours on a tight leash. He'll give all that work back if you give him the smallest encouragement. I shall miss it, Gina admitted. You know I enjoy it. How am I going to fill my day? Sebastian tells me that he has two excellent estate managers. Trust the Marquis to have two when one would do, Esme snapped. I suspect you won't have time for doing estate work. It will take you all day just to live up to Bonington's expectations of fair ladyhood. Gina took up her gloves. I shall leave, Esme, before we exchange words. I will see you all for supper, I hope. After she was gone, Helene looked at Esme with some concern. Why so sharp, dearest? Esme bit her lip. I'm a pig, aren't I? Not quite that dreadful. I'm consumed with jealousy these days, Esme burst out. I feel like a five-year-old visiting someone else's nursery. I desperately want everyone else's bow, and I don't want my own. I don't remember Gina's husband, Helene said. I believe I met him before he left, but I was a mere child. Is he so handsome? It's not the Duke, Esme replied. Helene reached over and touched Esme's cheek. Poor duck, she said. I'd give you Tuppy. If you wanted him, 
Carolus said damply. Esme giggled. Then we'd be a proper mess, wouldn't we? Tuppy chasing after Gina's trout, and you and I both chasing after Tuppy. Helene stood up. Shall we go for a ride? My mare arrived this morning, and I'm eager to take her out. Carola? She looked up from woeful contemplation of her handkerchief. I couldn't. You could, Helene said firmly. You will be unfit for the evening if you mope around your chamber all day. Carola swallowed. Every time I think about this evening, I feel ill, she whispered. Let's go for a ride. I shall work off my evil temper, and Carola will lose the doldrums, and Helene will stay her calm self. Esme grinned impishly. Some day you will behave as nitwitted as the rest of us, Helene, and I shall be there to crow over you. She smiled. Not I. Gina entered the library with the firm conviction that there would be no more dalliance with her husband. Enough was enough. The mortifying truth was that she found Cam's kisses nearly irresistible. But she hadn't spent the majority of her life waiting to be a real wife, to be part of a real family, only to fall prey to a few kisses. The idea of going back to Girton House by herself, while her husband sailed away, chilled her blood. She couldn't do it. She couldn't live that lonely duchess life without a husband or children, even a day longer. She wanted the thing Sebastian offered, a family, stability, faithfulness, and love. After all, she'd seen many a marriage begin with passion and end with nothing. Helene and her husband were a good example. When they were both young girls, she'd been green with envy after Helene ran away to Gretna Green with a handsome nobleman. Gina nourished that envy for at least a year, until the countess moved out of her husband's house, and he promptly replaced her with a bevy of Russian singers. Cam was waiting for her at the long table. There was a streak of chalk on his temple. "'Have you been drawing again?' she asked. He nodded. "'It was a fine morning. I have an idea or two for Stephen's marble.' But he didn't say anything more, and Gina felt hesitant about asking. After all, he was sculpting Esme. She wasn't sure that she wanted to know. Cam took the stack of papers she had brought. "'Inquiries from Bixfiddle?' She nodded. Some of them he simply forwards, others he writes himself. I've sorted them into piles. She lifted off a good third of the stack. These are questions to do with land improvement and farming. These have to do with the house itself, and the last are a motley assortment. Let's do the motley ones first, Cam said. He held out a chair for her, sat down, and picked up a letter. Why does he want to trim the hedges? Why not simply let them grow? The fields are separated by hedges, Gina explained. And if they are to be negotiated by fox hunters, they must be jumpable. Cam scowled. Who hunts our land? Gina raised her eyebrow. You? I do not hunt. Oh, your father was. I know, he said, a tired note to his voice. My father was a great hunter. Enjoyed it even more if he could trample someone's kitchen garden while pursuing a small, wild creature. Have the hedges been kept at a jumpable height? Gina hesitated for a second, and then said, very collectedly, I allowed the hedges to grow after your father was bedridden in 1802. Bixfiddle greatly disapproves, and therefore he issues an annual plea that we trim the hedges. His smile made her blink, and she quickly pulled forward the next sheet. These are the plans for the harvest dinner in the village. I don't remember a harvest dinner, Cam said. Well, 1803 was a terrible harvest year, Gina said. So I instituted the dinner. And, she added firmly, I opened the forest for gaming as well. I'm afraid that Bixfiddle will complain about that rather bitterly when you see him next. Why would he bother, one way or the other? Bixfiddle has firm ideas of the ducal role, Gina explained. He particularly disliked it when I let the gamekeepers go. But really, there was no point to retaining them, 
given that I had no intention of allowing hunting parties on our land. Cam's lopsided smile made her feel warm to her toes. Let me guess, he said, putting a finger on her nose for an instant. The gamekeepers left in 1802, which just happens to be the year my father was bedridden. The intimacy of the situation was unnerving, Gina. She could feel a little flush rise up her cheeks. Let's begin with the house, she said. Cam looked at her for a moment, and then nodded. Of course. And so they sat side by side, the Duke and Duchess, and worked their way through a large stack of papers. At some point a footman brought them tea. They kept working. Finally Cam stood up and stretched. Lord Almighty, Gina, my back is breaking. We'll have to return to it tomorrow. She looked up, surprised to find that the thin ribbons of sunlight coming through the library's mullioned windows had long since faded. I still cannot believe that the household consumes so much oil, Cam remarked. Six hundred gallons seems excessive. There are a great many oil lamps, Gina pointed out. We could consider putting in gas lamps in the townhouse, I suppose. The banqueting rooms at Brighton Pavilion are being fitted for gas. But what if it explodes? Someone told me that gas is terribly dangerous. I know nothing about it, he said. What do you use for light in Greece? Candles, the sun, the skin of a beautiful woman. He bent down and kissed her cheek, so swiftly that she hardly felt the imprint of his lips. Gina looked down at her hands for a moment. She'd managed to get an ink stain on her wrist. Come, she said quietly. We must stop this behavior. He turned around from where he was standing, surveying Lady Trubridge's books. What behavior? Kissing. Ah, but I like to kiss you, said her reprobate husband. Gina shivered. That would result in a lonely bed, tending to all of Bixfiddle's letters, while her husband bathed in the Greek ocean. She looked away, tightening her lips against the sight of him. But he was moving, pulling her to her feet. Gina, he said, and his voice was deep and full of passion. He kissed her, just at the corner of her mouth, and her whole body trembled. Gina, he said. May I accompany you to your chamber? She trembled in his hands like a bird caught on its first flight. He trailed kisses down her high cheekbones. I want you, he said, in a voice burnished and dark, a voice that spoke of laughter, irresponsibility, naked statues, and the Greek sun. It was all wound up in Gina's mind, the statues, the naked women, his Marissa waiting for him. She pushed his hands away. Her cheeks were flushed, her lips trembling, but her voice was firm. That is not a good idea. His face became instantly guarded and casual. Why not? We could both find pleasure without anyone being the wiser. Her eyes were scornful. You would like to take pleasure and leave without injury. That's just like you, Cam. I don't see anything wrong with it. He fought to keep his temper. Perhaps there isn't anything wrong, she said, from your point of view. That's quite a little moralistic statement. His voice was cruelly polite. May I remind you, lady wife, that I've had every opportunity and legal right to take your body wherever I please. But I've chosen to ignore the signs of your oh-so-willing character, although I have had the distinct impression. She interrupted. Duchesses never interrupt, but this one was losing all claims to dignity. She was rosy with pure embarrassment. I enjoy kissing you, her voice shook. I enjoy the way you, the way you... He stared at her, silenced by her truthfulness. But you're just talking about pleasure, not anything else, she continued, meeting his eyes. What more do you want? he asked genuinely bewildered. I'm twenty-three years old. I want to live with my husband and have children together, which is not an unreasonable request. What you offer is pleasure alone. 
You are too good at ignoring unpleasant truths, such as the fact that you've had a wife sitting at home for twelve years while you dallied with your Greek mistress. Cam frowned. You never said that you cared about where I was. You never asked me to come home until you requested an annulment. And would you have returned, had I asked? She waited, but there was no answer. Would you have given up Marissa, had I asked? He just looked at her, jaw set. I believe that marrying is not in your nature. Cam had always said he wasn't the marrying kind. He had made a joke of being the earliest married among the never-meant-to-be-married. But he didn't like the prickling feeling it gave him when Gina pointed out his unsuitability. He rallied quickly, the veteran of a thousand unpleasant family battles. None of this started with a question of marriage, he remarked, deliberately pulling down his sleeves and readjusting his jacket. It is merely a question of desire. Since you are honest, I shall be as well. I want you, Gina. He walked a step closer and stared down at her. I want to plunge inside you. She looked away to escape the intensity in his black eyes. He forced her chin back up. And you want the same from me? She didn't answer, unable to balance the scorching glow in her belly and the shrinking humiliation of hearing such a thing said out loud. Desire is a normal, human emotion, he said. I can certainly understand if you'd rather experience it with your future husband than with me. It didn't take a genius to realize that she and Sebastian would never share anything of the sort. But there is no need to insult me. As an eighteen-year-old, I did not indicate a wish to marry you, Gina. If I ever have a real wife, a wife I myself chose, I will not leave her for twelve years, nor take a mistress, for that matter. It is not fair to criticize me for breaking vows dictated by my father. He let his hand drop. She felt a wave of shame, so profound, it was as if she'd been dipped in hot water. I'm sorry, she whispered. There's nothing to be sorry for. We're both victims of my father, two of the many. Gina looked at him and knew, in that instant, that she loved him. He stood in the last rays of dying sunlight, and there was chalk in his hair. He stood, smiling that lopsided smile of his, and she wanted nothing more than to hold out her arms and say, Come, come kiss me, come love me, take me to your chamber. The words wavered on her lips, but she couldn't say them. He met her eyes. Marissa is married to a nice fisherman, he said. She was my mistress, but I danced at her wedding some three years ago. We had an enjoyable time, but our friendship was of no great consequence to either of us. Oh, she breathed. And she knew that what mattered was love, her love for him, not the future, the present. He had her hands again. I have no right to ask, but may I, may we? He didn't seem to know what he meant or how to phrase it. He cleared his throat and put out his elbow. I will be a sometime husband, Gina, but I would like to be yours. May I escort you to your chambers? Gina took a deep breath. I believe you may, she said. Her voice was faint, but clear. He looked at her for a moment, and then bent his head and kissed her. Gina's whole body sang at his touch. He turned and wrapped an arm around her waist, and they walked toward the library doors. 25. In which Mr. Finkbottle proves himself a worthy employee. Phineas Finkbottle was not having a pleasant evening. It was very kind of Lady Truebridge to invite him to the house party, and goodness knows he needed ready access to the Duke and Duchess if he were to carry out Mr. Roughton's instructions. But how the devil was he supposed to ensure that the Duke and Duchess remain married? He had spent the morning shut in his room, miserably aware that he ought to be talking the Duchess out of an annulment. 
except the Duchess was so very Duchess-like. He couldn't imagine bringing up the subject of whom she should or should not marry. At any rate, after yesterday, when he walked into the library and saw the Duke kissing his wife, he was hopeful that the man would take care of the matter himself. Still, it was better to sit glumly in his room than sit silently at the supper before dancing. The three elderly ladies to whose table a footman had escorted him responded to his introduction with the briefest of nods and turned back among themselves with a little titter. He ate wafers of ham and thought loathful thoughts about Mr. Rountain. If the man wanted his clients to fall in bed together, why the devil couldn't he arrange it himself? Phineas's ears grew a little pink, even thinking about it. The Duke was at least ten years older than he, and far more sophisticated and experienced. He could hardly urge the man to visit his wife's bedroom. His skin crawled at the very thought. The lady's conversation drifted into his thoughts. "'Indeed, my dears,' said an elderly woman named Lady Wantlish. "'I can tell you, quite honestly, that her tears were soon dissipated. "'Why, I believe she mourned the man for all of a fortnight, if that.' Phineas sighed. He was discomforted by the fact that the ladies ignored him, and mortified by the realization that they were right to do so. He wasn't dressed in the first stare of fashion. He was only a solicitor, even if his father was a gentleman. Worse, he didn't know a soul at the party, except for his clients and his hostess. "'They were in the conservatory together for at least two hours,' shrilled the plump woman named Mrs. Flockhart to his right. Two hours, my dears! I had it on the best authority. There are those who say that her mother locked the door until enough time had passed. Her father demanded satisfaction, of course. How disgraceful! chimed in the lady in yellow, whose name Phineas couldn't remember. Although I don't believe it of her mother— why would she bother to lock her daughter in the room with a second son? No, no, the girl is fast. I always thought so, since the moment she debuted. You know, she tripped over her train when she bowed to the Queen. Careless chit. I think it's likely her mother was instrumental in locking them in the room, Mrs. Flockhart insisted. She always was a wily one. When we were just girls, she used to swear that she was going to catch a duke. Never did, of course. The boy may be a second son, but he's got a nice income of his own. Phineas narrowed his eyes. If the duke and duchess were locked in a room together, why would they be forced to remain married? Surely the marquis would discard his engagement if the duchess was compromised. What room was it? he asked. Three pairs of sharp eyes looked at him. "'What the devil are you talking about, boy?' screeched Mrs. Flockhart. Phineas felt his ears turning crimson. "'The room,' he said. "'Where were they for two hours?' There was a cackle of laughter. "'Not the bedchamber, if that's what you're thinking.' "'It is not a good way to win yourself an heiress,' said Lady Wantlish. At least she had a twinkle in her eye. Too risky. I am not hoping to win an heiress, Phineas said with dignity. God, Mrs. Flockhart said acidly, I don't think there are any here who are uncompromised. Now, now, said Lady Wantlish, Miss Devontosh is quite a catch. She was the recipient of her late aunt's estate, and I assure you that she is uncompromised. That red-headed little snip! The old woman was scathing. If she's an heiress, why is she wearing those dreadful clothes? She looks like a ruffled turnip. Phineas felt a stab of sympathy for the unknown Miss Devintosh. He felt like a turnip, and apparently she looked like one. They were locked in a conservatory, Lady Wantlish commented, turning back to him. She had a friendly look in her eye, or perhaps she just wanted him to create a scandal. Ah, oh, he said, trying to sound uninterested. He felt a sharp dig in his ribs. Who are your parents, boy? My father's name is Phineas Finkbottle, Phineas said, starting to blush. Finkbottle? 
You're Phineas Finkbottle's son. To his amazement, Lady Wantlish softened all over and looked as sweet as butter. He was one of my very first beaux. That was before he lost all his money, of course. Good thing you didn't take him, Mrs. Flockhart observed. My father wouldn't allow it, Lady Wantlish admitted. How is he now? He's lame, madam, Phineas stammered. He suffered a carriage accident a few years ago. Are you good to your parents, boy? He started to turn purple with embarrassment. Yes, he mumbled. At least I think so. My mother died in the accident. The old woman nodded. Thought I heard something about that. A few years after Finkbottle lost his money on the change, wasn't it? You have a nice look about you. Doesn't he, girls? They all stared at him with beady eyes. I expect you're right, said the plump one to his right. He does have a nice look. She sounded quite surprised. I'll introduce him to the Devontosh chit, Lady Wantlish announced. She's my goddaughter, after all. As you said, Mrs. Flockhart, she dresses like a turnip, and she's unhappy as a turnip, too. Told me she doesn't want to marry a useless aristocrat. I'll hand her a nice young solicitor. Mind you, she gave Phineas a sharp look. No locking yourself into a conservatory with my goddaughter. She's a good girl, for all she has advanced ideas. Phineas turned quite purple with shame. Thankfully, the ladies were gathering their scarves and reticules and preparing to leave. He bowed and bowed again as they left, swallowing a lump in his throat that made him positively long to jump into a coach and flee to London. Except then he would lose his position and... The thought of his father at home stilled his nerves. He had to keep this job. He simply had to. I'll lock the Duke and Duchess in a garden building, he decided. If that doesn't work, at least Mr. Roundon couldn't say that he hadn't tried. That very night he would do it. It would be easy enough. All he had to do was send the Duke and Duchess out individually, follow and lock them in. As for the key... The key... What key? For that matter, what building? He set off with renewed vigour. He'd have to walk the grounds until he found a structure that locked. By a half hour later, Phineas was quite discouraged. Wandering around in the dark, he had found two little garden buildings, but they were so dirty that he couldn't imagine the elegant Duchess entering either of them. Then he found an outdoor earth closet that looked like a little house from a distance. But inside, it was quite malodorous, and what would the Duke and Duchess do for several hours? It was extremely difficult to imagine them sitting peacefully on stools. The problem was that none of the little grottos or conservatories scattered about the grounds locked. And when he discreetly asked a gardener about keys to the Roman temple, he got nothing more than a suspicious look and a muttered response that there weren't no need for it. Finally, he was driven back into the house. He'd have to lock the Duke and Duchess into a room— which sounded better, in truth, because they were bound to create a greater scandal by being locked in, right under the house party's noses. But he encountered the same problem. The library locked, but only from the inside. In the end, he found only two possibilities, the billiard room and the cupboard water closet off the ballroom. On the whole, Phineas thought the billiard room sounded the better proposition. He walked out of the water closet contemplating ways by which to manoeuvre the couple into the billiard room. To his horror, a gentleman was standing just outside. Phineas turned scarlet with confusion. Interested in the facilities, are you? the man asked jovially. As am I, as am I. I'm thinking of putting a stow water closet into my own house. My wife wants one in her dressing room. Have you seen the plunge bath? Phineas shook his head. Come along, let's find it, shall we? The man blew out his walrus-type moustache. My name's Wimpler. I am Phineas Finkbottle, Phineas replied, bowing. Good, Mr. Wimpler exclaimed. Good, good, good. 
Now, the butler told me that the steps down to the plunge bath come from the east portico. Must be this way. And he set off vigorously, Phineas trailing behind. They walked down a set of narrow, winding steps, and peered into the plunge bath. It was lined in brick. What do you think? Wimpler shouted. Think I ought to have one of those? It looks chilly, Phineas pointed out. Now there you're wrong, Wimpler said. Lady Truebridge told me that it's heated. Somehow. Ah, steam heat, I would guess. Look at that. Phineas looked. Wimpler smirked. Lovely place for a rendezvous, wouldn't you say? He elbowed Phineas cheerfully. A little splash and tumble. Don't suppose that's what Lady Truebridge had in mind when she installed it, though. He laughed at his own cleverness and set off back up the stairs. Come along, then, he called back. We shouldn't like to be late for the dancing. Phineas followed more slowly. What really struck him about the plunge bath was the key on the door. The key and the silent, oiled way in which it turned. If he could lure the Duke and Duchess into visiting the bath, he could lock them in. Moreover, since the entrance was on the east portico, the couple was unlikely to be discovered before sufficient time had lapsed to ruin their reputations. The next question was how to lure them to the plunge bath. But that turned out to be quite easy. As he was walking back along the corridor, Mr. Wimpler having dashed away to find his wife, he saw the Duke and Duchess just leaving the library. Your graces, he called, rushing toward them. The Duchess had just begun to climb the stairs, and didn't turn her head immediately. The Duke stopped, however, and greeted him rather curtly. Lady Truebridge requests your presence, Phineas said, catching his breath. The Duke had a hand on the Duchess's waist. For a moment Phineas had a qualm. What if the Duke was, indeed, going to take care of the problem himself? But then the sight of Mr. Rountons' apoplectic face shot across his memory. No, he couldn't trust the Duke. It was for his own good, after all. Her ladyship would like to see you immediately, he said, injecting urgency into his voice. The Duchess turned around, finally, and smiled. She put her hand on the Duke's sleeve. Why don't you greet Lady Truebridge for me? I shall take a small rest. Perhaps he was making a mistake. The Duke was grinning back at his wife. No, indeed. I couldn't let you do that. Not without exerting yourself first. Phineas was fairly sure that there was a double meaning to the conversation. But the Duke and Duchess began walking quickly down the hallway. He actually had to run after them to direct them to the plunge bath. Luckily, they didn't seem to notice where they were going, and accepted his hasty explanation that Lady Truebridge was down the stairs off the portico, without even glancing at him. The Duke was whispering in the Duchess's ear. Phineas could see that she was faintly pink in the cheeks. He hesitated, swung the door shut behind them, and turned the key. Instantly he felt enormous relief. He'd done what needed to be done. He would return with witnesses in three hours, at the end of the evening. Surely people would notice the Duchess's absence during the dancing. He smiled with newborn confidence. He, Phineas Finkbottle, was a man of action, a man who came up with a plan and satisfied his employer. He strolled in the door of the ballroom, full of well-being. Twenty-six. Cabined, cribbed, and confined, as Hamlet put it. It took a good two minutes before Cam and Gina realized that not only was Lady Truebridge not in the plunge bath, but Phineas Finkbottle, for reasons known only to himself, had locked them in. What the devil? Cam banged on the door. It was made of such solid oak that his fist only made a dull thunk. What could that man have been thinking? Gina asked. He won't be thinking long once I get out of this dungeon, Cam snarled. It's not a dungeon, 
she retreated back down the stairs. He can't be planning to murder us, because Lady Truebridge told me herself that she takes a plunge bath every morning. In the worst case, we shan't be discovered until morning. Perhaps Finkbottle doesn't know that Lady Truebridge is addicted to the bath, Cam pointed out. He doesn't seem a murderous type of person. He tramped down the stairs after her, and then stopped. He's stealing the Aphrodite! His wife looked up at him and smiled. I gave it to Esme for safekeeping this morning. I decided that you may be correct in insisting that the thief would return. Damn him! It crossed my mind that he was your no-good brother, and I ignored it. More fool I! Cam was filled with the rage of a man unable to rescue his lady, even though she was only debatably in danger. You think Mr. Finkbottle is my brother? Gina gasped. He has red hair, he trained on the continent, and he's off stealing the Aphrodite. Only your brother could possibly know about the statue. She froze for a moment, thinking it through. Mr. Finkbottle is my brother? It's the only explanation that makes sense. He stomped down the rest of the stairs. I expect he's turning over your mattress at this very moment, looking for the statue. Why didn't he simply ask me for it? Because he's a criminal, he snapped, still smarting over their enforced imprisonment. Still, if he'd asked me, I would have given him the statue. Her eyes were so sad that Cam felt some of his annoyance melt away. Fools, both of them, he said, a bit more gently. Your mother didn't answer your letters, and your brother didn't introduce himself properly. Her chin wobbled. Ah, oh, for goodness sake, he said with exasperation, and tucked her into his arms. Why would you want your by-blow of a sibling to introduce himself anyway? Gina bit her lip hard and didn't say anything, because she might cry. Duchesses never cried in the presence of others. Well? Her husband sounded cross, but he was holding her so sweetly that it almost, almost made up for the fact that neither her mother nor her brother cared to meet her. Cared to speak to her, to write to her, or know her at all. She deliberately pushed the thought away and thought, Duchess is as Duchess does. Duchess is as Duchess does. Duchess is as Duchess does. What is a plunge bath, anyway? Cam asked, looking around at the vaulted brick ceilings. They're quite the newest thing, she said. That's the bath. She pulled herself from his arms and pointed down at the tiled bath. One enters by those stairs. It's really quite clever. The water is piped across the kitchen hot wall, so it's already warm by the time it arrives in the bath. And one could make it hotter by turning this switch. I gather Finkbottle doesn't mean us to freeze to death, then, Cam said, walking over to inspect the pipes. This is ingenious. Perhaps we should put in a bath at Garton. I thought about it, she said. It would be quite easy to pipe the water through the kitchen, since it is set so far to the east. That's an optimistic way of looking at the kitchen's location. Father always cursed the fact that it was so far away from the dining room. But I suppose a warm plunge bath is better than a cold meal. We have the cold meals anyway, Gina pointed out. We might as well have a warm bath. Cam climbed the steps down into the bath and was fiddling about, when suddenly a huge gush of water erupted from the pipe. Damn it to hell, he howled, jumping back on the stairs. But it was too late. He was completely soaked from his knees to his boots. Gina giggled. More fool you! What did you think would come out? Air? Cam ignored her. Lady Truebridge is right. The water is quite warm. He walked back up the steps, sloshing as he went. Perhaps I'd better remove these wet clothes. He grinned at her. I wouldn't want Finkbottle to succeed in murdering me due to a chill. Gina blinked. You may not undress in front of me. Have a heart, he said pathetically. I shall freeze if I stay in wet clothing. Besides, he pointed to the water splashing into the bath. I believe when all's said and done, 
We might as well experiment with Lady Truebridge's invention. Take a plunge bath with... with you? One takes baths alone. His smile was secret and inviting and passionate all at once. Not always. He sat down on the top of the stairs to the bath and pulled off his boots. You are really going to undress? What if someone arrives to let us out? They won't. I would guess that we're here for the duration, Duchess. Pink Bottle is searching your room at leisure. It should take him at least an hour. And then I expect that he'll make good his escape. You might as well make yourself comfortable. I am quite comfortable, thank you. His wife put her nose in the air and tapped her foot with annoyance. He thought she was quite the most delectable woman he'd ever seen in his life. The more he thought about it, he pulled off his second boot. The more he had a mind to give Phineas Finkbottle a handful of banknotes when they got out of the bath. After a trouncing, of course. He stood up and put his hands at his trousers. Gina was watching him with fascination. You mustn't do this. Her voice sounded weak to his mind. He grinned and undid his trousers, pulled them down and threw them to the side. She didn't shriek and run up the stairs. Of course, his shirt did hang rather low. He started to unbutton it. Come! She said his name in a sort of gasping way. He stopped unbuttoning and walked over to her. Then he kissed her. He couldn't stop himself, not with her lips so plump and rosy. She sighed, and he put his hands on her shoulders to steady her. Gina, what did you think we were going to do in your bedchamber? She looked at him with those lovely green eyes, secretive and inviting and passionate, all at once. The edge of her mouth curled up. Take a bath? No, but undress. I would have undressed you, Duchess, he whispered against her ear and the soft skin of her neck. He pulled her into his arms, holding her tightly against him. Without trousers, he was fairly certain that she would know exactly what was on his mind. Gina, my love, I would have undressed you. She looked at him, at his wild smile and high cheekbones, at the mischievous twinkle in his eyes. She was no idiot. He would take what he took and leave for Greece. But before he left, and he called her my love, her heart melted. Her conscience scolded, but some other part of her melted when he said that. He called her love. The plunge bath was housed in a small room, and it was quickly growing toasty warm from the water pouring into the bath. Cam kneeled before her. May I remove your grace's slippers? Gina's heart was singing. She was quivering all over. She delicately raised her skirts in both hands and pointed her narrow shoe at Cam. His smile had no hint of complacency, just a pure joy that sent a burning heat to Gina's middle. His hand slipped around her slender ankle and pulled off her shoe. He set it precisely to the side, and she offered her other ankle. Beautiful, he said, and she thought he was talking of her legs. He drew off her other slipper and put it to the side. Then he ran his hand slowly, slowly up one leg, sliding up the graceful curve to her knee. He stopped at the garter, untied the knot, and flung it to the side. A stocking fell in a silky rush to her ankle. He looked up at her briefly, and then curled his fingers around her other ankle. Obediently, she let him take the garter and the stocking. She was bare-toed and bare-legged under her gown. He didn't move immediately. His hands returned to her ankles and slid up the smooth flesh, sweet, peachy smooth. She quivered. What are you doing? she asked. Caressing you. His hands were inching up, up into the curve of her thigh. She was on fire. But some primitive female spirit of defense aroused itself. No! She reached down and pushed at his shoulders. But he was like a mountain, fixed in a position of worship. 
he threw his head back, tossed hair out of his eyes, and grinned at her. It's naught but a gentle touch. She trembled under that gentle touch, and her mouth formed a small circle. It's nothing more than a caress one might give a child, or a baby lamb. She could feel her knees shake. She broke away and pulled back. He stood up and pulled his shirt over his head. And there he was, strong of thigh in the flickering gaslight, wearing only white smalls. His chest was broad and muscular, his arms even larger. She didn't know what to say or where to look, but she couldn't look away. He was too beautiful, too male, too unlike herself. There was nothing sleek about him. He was all hard muscle, with a dusting of black hair. Why are you so muscular? she asked. She had a fair idea that most men in the ton had no muscles at all. Cam shrugged. Sculpting is hard work. I quarry my own marble. He looked at her. Duchess. His voice was a command. Here. He pointed to a point just before him. And she obeyed. Ambregina Serrard, Duchess of Girton, dutiful daughter, dutiful wife, dutiful duchess, walked to her husband in her bare feet. But she didn't look at him with the prim and proper air of a virgin, faced with a first, ungarbed male body. No, Gina looked at him with a frank and thirsty gaze that was hers alone. Cam felt his blood race. Go slow, he cautioned himself. Keep her virginity in mind. The thought cooled him down a bit. She looked at him. Well? He cleared his throat. May I remove your garments? I can manage, she said quickly. Cam grinned. Did his duchess even realize that he had tricked her into undressing? He had discovered that Gina never, ever asked for help. She seemed to think that she could go through life unaided, except when it came to her right glove. But she wasn't doing so well at the moment. Perhaps we should extinguish the oil lamps, she said, just a bit desperately. Absolutely not. I want to see you. Her cheeks were flaming. I don't wish to do this on the floor. There is a chaise long, Cam said, and only the laughter in his eyes betrayed his grave tone. But a duke and a duchess would never make love other than in the ducal bed. Gina chose to overlook the little edge of mockery in his voice. Exactly. Cam looked down. There was nothing he could do about the state of his body. In fact, he had a fair idea that this would be his normal state for the next forty years or so. Whenever he was around his wife, anyway. In that case, shall we sample the bath, Duchess? May I suggest that you remove your gown and— He forestalled her objection with a swift kiss. Bathe in your chemise. Gina bit her lip. Really, she could have no objection to bathing in her chemise. It wasn't as if she was naked. Her gown had two buttons at the neck. She drew it over her head, and then, in one beat of her heart, the cool yellow fabric rushed past her eyes and was gone. There was no difference between a chemise and a nightgown, after all. Cam had seen her nightgown. Nay, he'd ripped open her nightgown. Gina's cheeks pinked at the memory. Cam took a deep breath. Gina was wearing a chemise of the thinnest cotton. It was white, simply fashioned, and the essence of modesty. Yet it was more sensual than the richest silk. Shall we go to the bath, Your Grace? She gave him a slow smile, a smile like liquid molasses. The Duchess of Girton was discovering the manifold pleasures of seduction. He said something, had to clear his throat, finally said, Yes. She held out her hand, but he wouldn't let her draw him toward the stairs into the plunge bath. Instead, he turned her palm against his mouth. Did she know what would happen to her delicate cotton chemise when drenched? Did she care? His prim duchess was gone, replaced by a sultry sprite, the woman who greeted him in yellow silk with a brandy in her hand.
He kept his eyes on hers and tasted her wrist. Sweet skin, white even in the twilight of the bath. Finally, he let her draw him to the steps. At the bottom, Cam plunged into the water. Gina paused at the last step above the water and poked in a toe. It is warm, she said with delight. I turned on the warming switch, Cam said. He was up to his waist in water. She walked slowly, step by step, into the bath, until she stood before him, the water just lapping at her breasts. As she watched, he ducked under the water and came up a gleaming water animal, sleek and dark, drops sliding from his chest back into the bath. Not to be outdone, Gina did the same. She splashed back up, laughing. This is the first time I've been in something larger than a tin bath. Isn't this glorious, Cam? Glorious, he said. Her eyes followed his. Hmm, she said. It appears that my chemise has lost its... He stopped her amusement with his mouth. Gina had never been a coward. It was with dismay that the old duke, Cam's father, had discovered that his son's young wife had too much backbone for her age. He had succeeded in moulding her into a proper duchess, but only at the expense of his nerves. Mr. Bixfiddle, the estate manager, would have echoed the old duke's statements. Once the Duchess of Gurdon decided to do something, not hell nor high water could stop her. She stepped back and pulled her sobbing chemise over her head and tossed it to the side. It billowed when it hit the water and sank. The look on Cam's face was everything a woman could hope to see under the circumstances. She ignored the burning heat in her belly and the unsteadiness of her limbs and splashed a little water in his direction. You will love bathing in the Mediterranean, he said hoarsely. He walked one step toward her. His large hands touched her, as if she were marble, sculpted by Michelangelo himself. Ah, oh God, you're so beautiful, he said. And in the wonder of his voice, she felt truly beautiful for the first time. There were strands of wet hair caught on her cheeks. He carefully pushed them away. There's paint on your cheeks, he said, and rubbed with his thumb. She looked puzzled and then laughed. I darken my lashes. I thought you did, he said with satisfaction. Then he brought his great wet hands to her face and rubbed. They're beautiful without paint, like strands of sunlight. She caught his hands in hers and he bent his head to her lips. She came to him with a little sigh that set his pulse racing. He lingered on her body, moulding its sweet curves to his fingers, memorising the delectable curve at the inside of her hip. She turned out to be a laughing mermaid, his wife, liable to fall backward into the water. He had to punish her with kisses until she clung to him, trembling, her breath caught in her throat, begging. He climbed from the bath, holding his wife in his arms, carried her to Lady Trubridge's chaise long and laid her down. She was a wanton woman, his duchess. She didn't lie under his hand, as had most women of his experience, let alone a woman with no experience. She twisted and turned, begged and cried, turned to him. That was a truly unexpected thing from his point of view. She not only took, but she gave. Where he kissed her, she kissed him. Where he touched her, she touched him. She was a born coquette, a ravishing combination of innocence and innate knowledge. And she laughed. She giggled when he kissed his way down the curve of her breasts, the delicate curve of her ribcage. Stopped giggling, and they had a brief argument as he continued. He won when he distracted her by letting one hand stray to her breast. His Gina could no more contain herself when he touched her breast than a young boy can resist being tickled. There was no laughing then. He made his sweet way where he wished, and kissed as he wished, and she twisted and gasped and cried in his arms. The shocking part, not to put it too bluntly, 
was that she pushed him away and demanded her own rides. Ladies don't do this sort of thing, he warned her. His body went rigid as a board as she kissed a little path, a winding, smiling path down his stomach. Gina, he said, but she paid him no mind. She probably never would, he thought dimly. Paid be, but he lost the thought. His fingers caught in her sleek, wet hair, and a low groan burst from his chest. When he pulled her up, covered those red lips with his own, he closed his eyes in the face of her delight. He can't have you. His voice was rough, and his hands were shaking. He rolled her on her back and ran a hand down her sleek legs. They fell open, and she arched against him. He was afraid to diminish her pleasure, afraid of the pain. It won't hurt long, he said into her ear. I know. Please, Cam, I want you. I want you. Her hands clutched his shoulders. He thrust and waited to cause pain. Dimly, he was aware that his body was shot with ecstasy, demanding more, demanding. But he waited. She had her eyes closed. He kissed her eyes, her cheeks, her lips. Gina, he whispered, are you all right? She opened those eyes, the exact color of the Mediterranean at sunset. Do you think that you could do that again, she said. He wasn't mistaken. She was going to laugh all the way through making love. There was laughter gleaming in her eyes and in the tremble of her mouth. He withdrew slowly and plunged deep. The laughter disappeared, and she gasped. It seemed to him not an unhappy gasp. So he did it again, and this time she met him halfway. He could feel his vision slipping. It doesn't hurt, does it? A little bit, she replied. You're... you're bigger than I am. He could feel that for himself. Every inch of his body was telling him the same thing. But it doesn't hurt. It feels... Oh, I don't know. It makes me feel hungry. A slow smile curled Cam's lips. I can help you with that, he said against her mouth. He plunged again, again, again. She was a screamer, his duchess. He knew it, and he was right. What he hadn't known was that she would make him into one. Cam rolled onto his back, carrying his wife with him. He put her on top of him as if she were a blanket. She slumped, boneless, her head tucked into the curve of his neck. He stroked the long line of her backbone and thought pleasurably about nothing. Thought about staying in the plunge bath forever. She was sleeping, so he dragged Lady Trubridge's blanket over her sleek skin and kissed the top of her head. Perhaps they should get dressed. Rescue might come at any moment. He wrapped his arms around his precious bundle of a wife. He'd made one decision. He wasn't going to let her go until they did that again. Oh, perhaps a thousand times. Two thousand. His eyes drifted shut. 27. Lady Trubridge's Plunge Bath, a dark but not unpleasant habitat. Gina woke to darkness so profound, so thick and silent, that she literally couldn't see anything. For a moment she was mortally frightened. But then she realized that while she couldn't see, she could feel and hear. It wasn't utterly silent. She could hear Cam breathing. Moreover, when her heart stopped beating frantically in her ears, she could hear his steady heartbeat not so far from her ear, and she could feel her own boneless, satisfied body. A grin curled her mouth. There had been no excruciating pain, as she'd heard it described. She'd heard all about the marital act. She knew it was pleasurable, in the right circumstances, and that some women didn't enjoy it, while men always did. She turned her lips against the warm skin beneath her. 
She had an idea that those women weren't as lucky as she. He woke up like a cat, straight from sleep to awake. His body went rigid. What the devil happened to the light? I think the oil lamp burned out. She kissed his throat, tasted salt. He said nothing, and his body didn't relax. Come, she found his lips. An involuntary shudder went through her body. Perhaps, she thought, her body would never be the same. Blood danced under her skin, speaking of the hair-ruffed skin beneath hers, the hard angles and muscles she lay on, the luxurious weight of her own breasts against his hard chest. He kissed her, but it was no more than a pucker of the lips. "'I'll have Finkbottle skin for this,' he said, and he sounded a good deal more furious than he had when they were first shut in the bath. "'The lamp was bound to burn down,' she pointed out. "'Do you have any idea how long we slept? Perhaps it's already near morning. It's between ten and eleven o'clock in the evening. We've been here approximately three hours.' "'How on earth can you tell?' she asked, nuzzling his neck with her lips. "'Excuse me.' he said, lifting her off his body and putting her to the side. A moment later, the blanket tucked around her shoulders. How can you see what you're doing? she asked. And how do you know what time it is? I have had similar experiences, he said. His voice didn't echo even a trace of the pleasure they had shared. Gina huddled in her blanket. Tam had walked away. She strained her eyes, but couldn't see anything at all. "'Don't fall in the water!' she cried, suddenly afraid. "'I won't,' his voice came from the right. "'Would you like to wear your gown?' His voice came back toward her, and the gown fell into her lap. Gina clutched it gratefully. She dropped the blanket and pulled on her gown. It took a moment to make certain that she had it on correctly. "'I found your stockings,' said the voice dimly but I can't seem to locate one of your slippers. You threw it to the right. A moment later she was drawing on her stockings, a far more difficult task in the dark than in the light. Then she was as dressed as possible. She shuddered to think what her hair looked like. All she could do was comb it with her fingers. Cam, she asked. Yes? Why am I bothering to get dressed? Aren't we likely to spend the night here? It seems to me that Finkbottle would have returned, if he was likely to. I doubt he ever meant to return, he said in a brutally angry voice. I plan to kick that damn door until someone hears me. Gina thought for a moment. Come, she called. Will you come here, please? She heard his footsteps, but it was still a shock when he touched her. Will you sit with me? He hesitated. Of course he said, sitting beside her. What is the matter? she said, in a tone carefully empty of blame or reproach. Nothing, he replied, just as calmly. Other than the fact that I dislike being imprisoned in a dungeon by a solicitor who has likely stolen a priceless artwork. She held on to his arm so he couldn't slip away. Perhaps men grew irritated after. A more dreadful thought struck her. Perhaps he was in a rage because, having taken her virginity, they would no longer be able to procure an annulment. A pang of distress sounded all the way from her heart to her stomach. Are you angry because the annulment won't go through? she asked, before she could rethink the question. No, Cam said shortly, sounding uninterested. You're mine now. Gina felt a thrilling dip in her stomach. She'd never been anyone's before. Even her mother had not really been her mother, and her husband had not really been her husband. There was something oddly reassuring about the briskness with which she announced it. Then what is the matter? she repeated. For God's sake, I just said that nothing was the matter, Cam roared, starting to his feet. Gina came with him. She loathed the idea of stumbling after him in the dark but he tore away her hand and walked off. It's only dark, Gina, he said roughly. There's no reason to go into a tizzy. But I'm not, Gina said, and stopped. 
It was he who was scared. How odd that she hadn't seen it immediately. He hadn't gone far, so she simply walked in the direction of his voice until she bumped into a warm body. He was leaning against the wall. His body was rigid. She cupped his face in her hands and kissed him. At first he didn't respond at all, and then his lips softened. She almost thought she had done it when he pushed her away and said, in a strained sort of way, "'Lord, save me from an insatiable woman!' Gina bit her lip and counted to ten. "'It was supposed to be a joke,' said a voice just in front of her. She counted to ten again. As she had told Carola, silence was sometimes extremely useful. Sure enough, his arms reached out. He put his lips in her hair, and at first she couldn't understand what he was saying, so he repeated himself. Did you hear the jest about the preacher, the Puritan, and the vintner's daughter? No, Gina said. I can tell you a riddle, if you like, he offered. I would prefer not. I have never been any good at riddles. I would not wish you to be afraid of the dark. There was a driven rage to his voice. I shall have Finkbottle's head for putting you in this intolerable situation. I am not afraid, Gina said flatly. She reached up and pulled down his head so that she could kiss him. Would it make it easier if I told you some riddles? I cannot always remember the correct answer, more's the pity. There was a moment of silence, broken up by a drop or two of water falling from the pipe into the bath. Am I twittering? he said finally. You're distressed. I myself am thrown into paroxysms by snakes. So be warned. A kiss landed on her nose. I suspect if I were capable of paroxysms, this is the situation that would bring them on. Shall we sleep with a lamp burning? No. I'm only disturbed by rooms with no light and no window. He hesitated. My father used to close me in closets and cupboards for punishment. He tried that with me. That is, he did it once. He shut me in the wine cellar. But I described the punishment in a letter to my mother. The Duke never recovered his hearing in his right ear after her visit. At least, that's what he blamed his deafness on. Cam's arms tightened around her. I'm sorry he did that to you. It never crossed my mind he would do it to someone other than his own child. More and more, I think I should have taken you with me out that window. She laughed. You couldn't have. Imagine how annoying it would have been to be burdened with an eleven-year-old wife. Well, if I had known he was going to lock you up in the cellar, I would have pulled you after me, he said. To be honest, the cellar didn't bother me very much. I'm such a practical kind of person, and even at eleven, I wasn't very imaginative. But if he did it when you were a child, it must have been dreadful. The first time I remember it was the day of my mother's funeral. He thought that I hadn't shown proper respect because I fidgeted during morning prayers. So he closed the doors to the chapel and locked me in with her body. That's horrid, she gasped. Dreadful old man that he was. You were only seven or eight, weren't you? Five, Cam said. After that, he locked me up fairly frequently. I like to tell myself that I wouldn't have become a coward, except for the things he said. You are not a coward. They had ended up back on the chaise long, and Gina had her arms slung around his neck. What things did he say? She thought that his body was slightly less rigid than it had been. That my mother was going to haunt me. I believed him, of course. He could be quite graphic about decaying flesh and worms. Cruel old man, Gina snapped. Yes, he agreed. It took me some years to realize it. And, coward or not, I'm not comfortable in the dark, even now, years later. That was a despicable thing to say about your mother, Gina said. She loved you so much. How on earth do you know? There was an amused note to his voice. Because I know, she retorted. He shrugged. I have no memory of her at all. I expect she was a conventional woman of the tongue, 
who greeted her son and heir with a pat once or twice a week. No, Gina said. She wasn't that type of woman at all. I was given her bedchamber after our wedding, you know. Her room? It was locked up during my entire childhood. When he discovered that you had fled, your father locked your room instead and pushed me inside your mother's. Cam's lips were warm on her ear. Tried to terrorize us both, didn't he? It's lucky that you have such a strong backbone. It was odd at first, Gina admitted. All her clothes were in the wardrobe, and her hairbrushes were on the table, just as they were when she died. But my governess didn't make anything of the fact that your mother's things hadn't been touched in over a decade. Instead, we started folding all the gowns and putting them away. And in the pocket of one of them was a little book. Your mother's diary. He had started caressing her neck in an idly interested sort of way, but his hands stilled when she said that. Gina leaned back into his arm, in case he wanted to lower his hand just a trifle. She writes about you as a baby, she said. I gather you were the sweetest baby ever born in England, Scotland, or Wales. She used to sing you to sleep every night. Even when they had guests, she would slip away to the nursery so she could sing you to sleep. His hand had started its caress again, but she could tell he was listening. You had huge black eyes and a plump lower lip. You had a special smile just for her, and your first tooth was just here. She put her finger on his lips. He licked her finger, and she put it in her mouth. Mmm, she said dreamily. You taste very sweet, even grown up. He made a low sound in his throat, and his hand danced over her gown. Why'd you put this rag back on? he demanded. She ignored him. I daren't tell you what she called you, she said with exaggerated timidity. I'm afraid you'd be too humiliated. He was tracing a lazy path up her thigh. Try me, he said, kissing her eyelids. Buttercup, she said, somewhere between a gasp and a cry. His thumb was doing something. She called you her little buttercup because you... Oh, Cam, that feels so good. He pushed her back onto the chaise long and yanked up her gown. Your mother loved you more than anyone in the world, she said, in the moment before she forgot what she was thinking. She reached out blindly and managed to catch his face in both hands and draw it to hers. Unfortunately, that brought his hard body down on hers, which destroyed the little thinking capacity she had left. So she spoke quickly. Your mother was likely with you in those dark rooms, Cam. She was sitting next to you and crying because she wasn't able to rescue her own little buttercup. Tears stung her eyes at the thought. I hope she's given up her guardianship by now, an amused voice said from the darkness above her. I'd rather we were alone at this particular moment. Oh, you, Gina said crossly. Without warning, his head descended to her breast. She melted, raising her body to his hand, writhing, crying out. He slipped in, as if he was born to answer the throbbing sensation that had engulfed her thighs. She clutched him hard and tried to regain the sense of rhythm they had last time. It came quicker this time. She was learning, she thought. Then he did something different, lifted her legs, and, half understanding, she wrapped them around his waist and... This time he didn't roll over and pull her on top of him. He was too tired. She took too much out of him, his delicious wife. He slipped to the side took his weight off her, but stayed where he could keep his hand on the silken skin just under her breast. So what colour was my hair when I was born, he said, when his heart had slowed to a reasonable rate. Huh? She sounded dazed. Cam grinned to himself. He'd pleasured a few women in his day, but he had never seen a woman as passionate as his own prim and proper duchess. He let his lips slide across her cheeks. She had beautiful high cheekbones. 
All this darkness was excellent for the sculptor in him. He was feeling her bones rather than seeing them. It made him itch to hold clay in his hands, to pick up a chisel. Did my mother say whether I had hair as a baby? Of course you did, she said. You had adorable little black ringlets. He smiled into her neck. I hope you're not one of those people who goes to sleep every time you have a little pleasure. Ralph, said his wife with a huge yawn, and she seemed to think that her response was sufficient. But Cam felt as if his body was one huge grin. He scooped her up and strode toward the bath. Then he paused, because he didn't want to break her leg. He was pleased to find that he had walked unerringly to the top of the bath steps. Cam, what are you doing? She nuzzled her face against his neck. By now he was up to the knees in water. Dropping you, he said cheerfully. She shrieked lustily when she hit the water. No reason for that, Cam thought. Lady Trubridge's heating pipe was working just fine. Wait till he dropped her in the Mediterranean in December. Now that was chilly water. She came up with a squeak, and before he knew it, she'd launched a counter-offensive that employed all kinds of body parts generally ignored in polite circles. I can't believe you did that, he said a few moments later, panting and laughing at the same time. He had the advantage because of his uncanny night vision, but she was so slender and slippery that she seemed to disappear from his hand, and she attacked without warning. No, you don't, he said with a shout of laughter, heading off an attack that might have had serious consequences. He caught her against his body and kissed her, a slow molasses kiss. You wouldn't want to jeopardize our future, little buttercups, would you? It took her a moment to remember, to think about buttercups and him and her in the same breath. But he was crushing his mouth against hers, and if her foolish heart melted even more, well, what could she do about it? It was the second time that Phineas Finkbottle had observed the Duke and Duchess, crushed in a passionate embrace. In the moment before he turned away, he saw the Duchess's slender, milky back and the Duke's hand on the curve of her bottom. Phineas put down his lantern and turned to go without a sound. He couldn't let his witnesses see the Duchess unclothed, but his heart was filled with glee. He, Phineas Finkbottle, had stopped that annulment in its tracks. I'm sorry, he said, pulling the door shut behind him, and looking at the little circle of dowagers whom he had promised to escort into the plunge bath. I'm afraid that this is not a suitable time to visit the facilities. Why on earth not? screeched Mrs. Rockhart. What on earth is stopping us? He almost quailed, but then he straightened his shoulders. He was a man of resource, a man who got things done. I saw a rat, he said crisply. Not an appropriate place for delicate ladies, such as yourself. Mrs. Flockhart voiced what several were thinking. Well, I do expect that Lady Trulbridge, poor dear, will be rather horrified to know that she's been sharing her bath with rats. She is so insistent on the health benefits of a plunge bath, she tittered. 28. Mr. Roundon defends his heritage. Do you know what I love about your eyes? Gina said dreamily. The way your lashes are so black and they're all spiky from being wet. I would love to have black lashes. Truly, that colour, I mean. I like yours as they are. There. Cam broke off. I can see your lashes. She turned her head and stared at the stairs up to the house. Look at that, Cam said. Someone's come in and left us a lantern. Thoughtful of them. Nice not to interrupt us. Gina looked down and felt as if her blush must cover her entire body. I must dress, she said. Yes, I suppose the door is no longer locked. He picked her up and strode back through the water and splashed his way up the stairs. Then he let her slide down his body onto her own feet. She looked at him and smiled 
a cat in the cream smile. You didn't seem to mind the dark very much. Think you've cured me, have you? You didn't need curing, Gina said, standing on her tiptoes so she could look straight into his eyes. All those kisses your mother gave you were in your memory. You just needed reminding that she loved you. Buttercup. His smile was reluctant, but nonetheless sweet for that. Perhaps you're right, he drawled. She turned away to pick her gown off the floor. He pulled her back against him, holding her naked bottom against him. Feeling rushed through her legs, and her knees almost buckled. I'll be joining my lady in her bed tonight, he said. She couldn't even answer. The blood was pounding so hard in her ears that she wasn't even certain that she heard him correctly. He let her go and strode over to his trousers. She stood for a moment, letting the fact that she was utterly, absolutely in love with her fool of a husband sink into her head. And I'll be sculpting you with that piece of marble, he tossed over his shoulder. I've been working on the sketches for the last two days. Wonderful. Now she was become the naked resident of cloakrooms. She didn't even care. She put a foot on the chaise long and slowly pulled on a stocking. Her body twinged and protested. She was going to live among naked sculptures, become one herself. Her heart sang. He was already dressed and had turned off the warming switch. Come, she said. Do you see a garter anywhere? He plucked it from the floor and walked over to her. She took it and tied it just over her knee, shaking her gown down to the ground. I'm going to do your head and shoulders, he said, tracing a line that ended just above her collarbone. I'm not certain that I can do your eyes justice, especially the way they tilt at the corners. But this beauty, hair... His thumb rubbed the back of her neck. This is lovely, and I know I can do it. Her relief must have showed. Thought I'd turn you into a naked Diana, did you? She nodded. I'll be damned if I ever let another man see your body, he said. In stone or in the flesh. You're my wife, Gina. Really my wife now. Not that I won't sculpt other naked bodies, he added. Her eyes narrowed. Marissa? Who else? I'm not putting you out in the marketplace. You'll be naked in my bedroom, and no other place. There was something about his eyes that made her trust him. Fool that she was, she couldn't even bring herself to question what he meant. Did he mean to take her to Greece, or leave her home at Girton? She pushed the thought away. Oh, dear she said with mock sadness. That is a pity. What? If I'm naked only in your bedchamber, she paused, her face alight with wicked mischief. I gather we won't make use of the bluebell wood at Garton. She smiled at him, a smile that licked his bones and made him stand harder than a piece of oak. I know you're cured of your reluctance to be in the dark, but I thought perhaps we would need to refresh your lessons. At night. He concentrated on taking a deep breath. May I escort you to your chamber, Your Grace? She dropped a perfect curtsy. I would be honoured. Gina tried to make her husband let go of her arm on the way up the stairs from the plunge bath, but he ignored her. Stubble it, Gina, he said amiably enough. We should be restrained, she said half-heartedly, as Cam pushed open the door at the top of the stairs. I haven't informed my fiancé that I won't marry him. Bonnington is not an idiot. Or perhaps he is. Either way, it doesn't matter. He held open the door, and Gina walked into the corridor. Cam, she said in a stiff, warning voice. He looked over her head. Well, if it isn't the ubiquitous Phineas Finkbottle. He pulled Gina back so she was behind his body. Then he walked slowly toward the solicitor, watching the man's hands. Faced with a livid nobleman, Phineas began to babble. I hope I have not misstepped. I most regret it. But Mr. Roundton's instructions... 
Truly, Your Grace, they were quite straightforward. I couldn't think of another. The earth closet. Cam stopped short and tried to make sense of Finkbottle's tangled speech. The man blundered on, but nothing he said made much sense. What the devil are you talking about? What is this talk of earth closets? And what did Roundton tell you to do? A nervous giggle escaped Gina. If I understood him correctly, Mr. Finkbottle almost locked us in an earth closet instead of the plunge bath. Cam put an arm around his wife and pulled her tightly against his shoulder. Finkbottle started to reply, something about keys and a gardener, but Cam brusquely interrupted. Let's cut to the chase, shall we? Where the devil have you put the Aphrodite? Finkbottle visibly trembled. The what? The Aphrodite, you blithering idiot. I merely followed Mr. Roundton's orders. He said nothing of an Aphrodite. Don't blame this on Roundton. He would never instruct you to steal a precious statue. The man is loyal to our family. I don't believe that Mr. Finkbottle has any idea what the Aphrodite is, Gina pointed out. In fact, I would guess that the Aphrodite is safely in Esme's possession. Finkbottle stood there looking as buffle-headed as it was possible for a young man to look. His face was as flaming as his hair. Are you the Duchess's illegitimate brother, then? Finkbottle's eyes grew large. What? The Duchess's illegitimate brother, Cam repeated. Are you he? No. I can't think how you saw any resemblance between us, Gina interjected. He has red hair. Oh, I'm not illegitimate, Phineas stammered. I'm poor, but that's not the same as being illegitimate. My father is a younger son of an earl, and my mother was a perfectly respectable woman, the daughter of a squire, and they were married. Indignation seemed to give him something of a backbone. You have accused me of theft and of being ill-born, my lord, but all I did was lock you in the plunge bath for a few hours. Cam stiffened again. Well, why the devil did you do that? he said softly. Phineas instinctively fell back a step. Mr. Roundton, he faltered. Mr. Roundton told him to do it, Gina said. Roundton sent poor Mr. Finkbottle to the house party and told him to compromise us. I believe Roundton might have thought he was protecting the ducal line. Compromise us? Well, we'll see about that, said her husband in a deadly, cool voice. Thinks he can simply arrange my life to suit himself, does he? Well, it may please you to know, Finkbottle, that absolutely no one knows that we were in the plunge bath. It takes more than two to be compromised. You need an audience. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, to stop her grace from marrying that pestilent Bonington tomorrow. And you can tell Mr. Roundton that from me. Cam, Gina said. Finkbottle nodded his head. I will, my lord. I will tell him immediately. He edged to the side, obviously about to make a dash for it. On second thought, I'll tell him myself, Cam said. His voice grated with rage. I don't believe I wish to have a solicitor who takes it upon himself to organise my sexual encounters. Roundton has gone beyond the pale. Mr. Finkbottle turned even whiter, if that was possible. If I might beg your indulgence, my lord, he begged. It was entirely my misinterpretation of Mr. Roundton's directions that— But a clear voice interrupted them both. Cam! Yes, darling, he said, turning to her. Her eyes were dancing— and her long hair lay damp and tangled over her shoulders. She put her hands on his shoulders and smiled at him, and it was almost enough to make Cam's irritation fall away. I disagree with you. About what? Cam asked, trying not to think about the fact that her lips were swollen and crimson from his kisses. I believe I am compromised. I am quite, quite certain that we were known to be in the plunge bath— in fact, I believe my reputation is indisputably compromised. She watched as his eyes cleared. Do you, love? He lifted her hand to his lips. 
I fear so, she sighed. I should hate to think that you are trifling with me. He leaned forward and spoke just for her ear. I fully intend to trifle further this very night. She raised an eyebrow. Would you feel the same had we been in an earth closet? You could have sat on my lap, he said with a twinkle. She coloured, and he turned back to Finkbottle. All right, Rountons won. We're compromised. You can tell him yourself. Finkbottle gave a shaky bow. Please, accept my humble apologies for my impertinent action in locking you in the plunge bath. I am grateful to have been spared the earth closet, Gina said. Oh, I almost forgot, Finkbottle said. I have these papers for you, Your Grace. He withdrew a thick, folded bundle of parchment from inside his coat. Cam took them. Papers for the annulment, he asked, thinking about ripping them in half. Oh, no, that is your annulment, Finkbottle said, rather more cheerfully. Mr. Rountan had no trouble at all obtaining the annulment. Under the circumstances, the Regent waived the requirement for Parliament's approval. There was no question but that— He ground to a halt. But we never consummated the marriage, Cam filled in. And, given that the papers were signed two days ago, we never did consummate our marriage. Gina felt a little chill. She could have been a Marquis already. She moved a little closer to her former husband and tucked her hand in his arm. Finkbottle hesitated for a moment. I hope you understand that while I would be most honoured to be your brother, my lady, I could not overlook the fact that my parents were fast married. Gina almost laughed and caught herself. Of course I understand, Mr. Finkbottle. Your kind wishes quite assuage my disappointment. He bowed and left. Cam looked at his wife. If Finkbottle is not your brother, then who is? Gina began walking down the corridor. Don't you think it's odd that there's been no follow-up letter requesting money? After all, the annulment is in hand. I could marry Sebastian by special license, and the writer would have gained nothing. Special license, Cam snorted. Entirely too romantic for the wiggy Marquis. As it happens, he has been carrying a special license in his pocket for the last month, ever since you announced your return. Well, he shan't have you. He opened the door to his chamber, and Gina found herself in the room without conscious thought. Damned if I can think of anyone who looks like you, Cam said, staring at his wife. Red hair is surprisingly rare these days. There's no reason to suspect that my brother is at the house party, Gina pointed out. Or that he has red hair, for that matter. If your brother isn't here, who ransacked your room looking for the Aphrodite? Gina wrinkled her nose. There's no one suitable at the house party, she said with finality. Why, the only red-haired man I can even think of is Lord Scottbro, and he's forty-five if he's a day. But Cam was staring at the wall, obviously not listening. When did your mother die, Gina? Countess Ligny. She died in March, almost two years ago now, although I didn't know that she'd passed away for quite some time. Damn, Cam said in a low, vicious tone. Damnation! He sprang from his chair. What is it? Gina asked, startled. I sent him over here myself. Careless bastard that I am. He ran a hand through his hair. What are you talking about? It's Wapping, Cam said. I encountered Wapping just a month after your mother died. He must have thought we were living together. And I sent him over to you without thinking twice about it. Stupid, careless. Be reasonable, Cam. Wapping can't possibly be my brother. Why not? He appeared in Greece at the right time. For one thing, he has brown hair, and for another, he has no idea that the Aphrodite— She broke off. You told him, Cam guessed. No, but I did ask him about Aphrodite, the goddess. Cam was at the door. Come along, then. Do you know where he might be? Upstairs. 
He works in the old schoolroom if he's not asleep, Gina said, joining him. But Cam, he can't be my brother. I'm certain that I would know if I met my brother. I mean, he would be my own flesh and blood, wouldn't he? Wapping is a scholar, not a thief. She kept the argument up all the way to the fourth floor, stopping only when Cam rapped on the door. Please forgive us, Mr. Wapping, she said as they entered the schoolroom. He was bent over a stack of books. Are you my wife's brother? Cam demanded. Wapping looked up with his abstracted look. If you'll excuse me a moment, he said, and returned to scratching a line of prose. Gina sighed. She knew as well as any that Mr. Wapping, once absorbed in the intricacies of scholarship, was remarkably single-minded. But Cam had no respect for her tutor's idiosyncrasies. He strode over to the table and snatched the quill. Ink splattered. Wapping looked up, and his mouth fell open. What are you doing? he cried. I'm working on something important. I'm just reaching the end of the fourth chapter of my Machiavelli treatise. I was at a particularly delicate moment, refuting Pindlepuss's erroneous charges, and you— Are you the Duchess's illegitimate brother? Cam said. He leaned over and put his hand squarely on the blotched treatise and its delicate refutation of Pindlepuss's work. His words were evenly spaced, and his voice was full of danger. As it happens, I am, Wapping said, with no apparent emotion. He rapped sharply on Cam's wrists with a ruler. Blinking, Cam straightened and took his hands off the table. Wapping began fussily blotting the ink stains, mumbling under his breath. He did not look at his sister, standing stock still in the middle of the room. There was a moment of silence, broken only by Wapping's mutterings as he mopped up the spilled ink. Gina, on the other hand, had just discovered what many an elder sister could have told her about siblings. Younger brothers are not necessarily a blissful addition to the family. Why didn't you disclose yourself to me? she said, advancing on him like a menacing angel. Why did you go through my room? Why did you toss my belongings on the floor? Wapping glanced up. Something about her eyes seemed to alarm him, more than anything had in Cam's menacing glance. He jumped to his feet and backed up. I was looking for my mother's bequest, he said. There's no need to be so agitated. I merely ascertained that you did not have the statue. The Aphrodite? Cam asked. Wapping swivelled his head and looked at him. Do you have it? No. Gina had it all along. It was under a chair when you ransacked her room. Why didn't you just ask me for it? she cried. Why didn't you introduce yourself, instead of sneaking around and pretending to teach me about Italian history? Wapping looked truly indignant. I did not pretend to teach you. For your information, you have just received a truly first-class education in Machiavellian politics. In fact, if you are more diligent in your reading, you would know almost as much as I. Cam backed up and leaned against the wall, stifling a chuckle. Brother and sister stared at each other across the table. He was small, she was tall. Her hair was the colour of a sunset, and his was the colour of a brown squirrel. She was beautifully odd. He was simply odd. But the family resemblance was unmistakable. Pride and excellent workmanship must run in the family, Cam thought. Gina chewed her lip. Why do you want the Aphrodite? she asked. Cam says that it's not worth a great deal of money. The statue itself probably isn't worth a tremendous amount, Wapping agreed. Although Franz Fabergé, the man who made it, is making quite a reputation in Paris with his hinged objet d'art. Hinged, Cam breathed. Of course she is hinged. That's a join down her side. So you wanted what was inside the statue? Jewels, Gina snapped. Wapping seemed unmoved by her sharpness. I'm not altogether certain what is in the statue, he admitted. I met my... Our mother only once on her deathbed. She informed me that her most precious possession in the world was inside the Aphrodite, 
and that she was sending it to you. Gina bit her lip. That was not very kind of her. He shrugged. I wasn't looking for kindness. However, I desperately needed a prolonged period of research in order to complete my book. Luckily, I have made remarkable progress over the last year while tutoring you. So you were hoping that she would leave you a bequest, Cam said. Would that be unusual? She was my mother, after all, and she seems to have spared herself any exertion in raising me. And you... you are my half-brother, Gina asked. We already agreed to that salient fact, Wapping remarked. You can have the Aphrodite. I don't want it. I don't want the statue, he said with a touch of impatience. You can have what's inside. Good, he said. Well, in that case, would you mind if I returned to my work? I have at least an hour of writing left before I can finish this chapter. I suggest that we meet tomorrow afternoon and open the Aphrodite at that time. Cam strode forward and grasped his wife's arm. He could see that she was struck dumb and would probably turn to stone-gazing at her admittedly peculiar brother. "'We will see you tomorrow, then, Wapping,' he said over his shoulder. The man didn't even grunt in reply. His head was already bent over the desk, busy retracing the splotched text onto a fresh piece of paper. When Cam pushed Gina back into his chamber again, she didn't protest. "'I can't believe he's my brother,' she whispered, leaning against the door. "'He looks just like you. You're very similar, in fact.' I look nothing like him, Gina said, stung. It's your expressions, Cam said smugly. You're two of a kind. Just what do you mean by that? Managerial, both of you, he chuckled. Certain that you're doing exactly the right thing in exactly the right way. Her lips set in a mulish line. We have nothing in common. I shall hand over the jewels inside that wretched statue, and that will be an end to it. Cam looked at her sympathetically. I know it was a shock, Gina, but that's not the end to it, more's the pity. The man's your brother, and I doubt there are many jewels inside the Aphrodite, he said. I have no difficulty believing the statue was hollowed out, but I don't believe it is stuffed with emeralds. What else could it be? Countess Ligny said the Aphrodite contained her most precious possessions, after all. I wonder why she gave it to you and not to him. He probably looked at her with that condescending glance of his, Gina said. I wouldn't leave him anything either. His father must have been a pompous bore. I'll have to think of something to do with him, Gina said, wrinkling her brow. I wonder if— We have to think of something, Cam corrected her. Of course, Gina agreed unthinkingly. Perhaps if I asked— Gina! What? She was deep in thought. He sighed. Nothing. I have an idea, she cried. I opened a hospital at Oxford a few years ago, and I remember meeting the kindest man. I believe he was the head of Christchurch. Thomas Bradfellow, Cam put in. Yes, that was he. I shall write him a letter and beg him to take care of my brother. I only hope he remembers me she added doubtfully. He'll remember me, Cam put in. Why? Because I replaced the winged Mercury in the central courtyard with a statue of Bradfellow. Lamentably, my statue was wearing only a wig, Cam said. Oh, Gina said. She started to giggle. Was Mr. Bradfellow, was he as substantial then as he is now? I can only imagine. He made a lovely statue. Bradfellow was a surprising good sort. He sent me down, but I heard that he put the statue in his private garden. And when I came up again the following fall, he acted as if nothing had happened. So I'll write. I will write, Gina. She looked startled. Well, it would be wonderful if you would do so. As soon as we marry again, Wapping will be my brother-in-law. I am not incapable of administration, you know. A small smile curled the edge of her mouth. In that case, Your Grace, may I beg your help with finishing Bixfiddle's papers tomorrow? He walked over to her. 
I suppose, he said, standing so close to her that her nerves crackled. I could be persuaded. She licked her lips. Persuaded? How so, my lord? Damn it, Gina, he groaned. I'm going to have to evict you from my chamber, or I'll have you again right here. Her eyes grew wide. Against the door, he said hoarsely. His mouth descended on hers. He took her silence as agreement. Twenty-nine. Informal dancing followed by private intoxication. She had just left the ballroom when a hand caught her elbow. Lady Rawlings, said a harsh voice in her ear. Esme's heart sunk. He was so tall and so, so disapproving. Much though I hate to interrupt you, I believe we agreed to rehearse much ado. She opened her mouth to refuse, but he preempted her. I realize you may have plans, he gave Bernie Burdett a ferocious look. But our performance is tomorrow evening. Lady Truebridge has hung a curtain in the long drawing room. Bernie was a sportsman and a hunter. He never hesitated to put himself at risk when need be. However, he dropped his escort's arm as if scalded. I shall return to the ballroom, he said. Your servant? He brushed her hand with his lips and sped to the opposite side of the room. I will have to fetch my copy of Much Ado, Lord Bonington, Esme said. He bowed. I shall escort you, if I may. They walked up the stairs without exchanging another word. She left him in the corridor and snatched her book off the dressing table. Then they walked back down the stairs. Esme was starting to wonder just how long he could walk in silence. He paced at her side like a moving portrait. Did you behave this way when you were young? she asked. I beg your pardon, he replied, with glacial emphasis. She was unable to resist the impulse to be truly rude. Like a walking poker. It must have been quite disconcerting for your mother. Oh, there's my darling boy. How unfortunate that he never smiles. Esme smirked at him. He declined to answer. Annoyance spread through her whole body. What right did Sebastian have to be judgmental of her friendship with Bernie? He couldn't make it more clear that he considered her a strumpet. Of course, she told herself, I am a strumpet. She had never seen the reason to fool herself about the consequences of her actions. On the other hand, she said thoughtfully, just imagine how my mamma used to complain about me. Look at that little daughter of mine, only five years old, and she's flirting with the gardener's boy again. She glanced sideways at him. There was just a suspicion of a smile around his lips. It truly was a pity that he had such a lovely mouth. It's quite an interesting subject, she continued. I have no doubt but that Gina knew how to curtsy before she could walk. They walked into a small room off the billiards room. Oh, shall we practice here? By way of answer, Sebastian strode over and turned up the lamps. And I expect that Gina's husband was always carving bits of wood in the messy way that boys have, she said. My little brother's pockets were stuffed with fragments of wood he thought looked like ducks or boats. Sebastian still didn't respond, so Esme kept chattering, well aware that his presence was making her into a complete ninny. Gerton probably spent most of his time carving little statues of his nanny without her apron. I wasn't aware you had a brother. He stood before the fireplace, looking so handsome that her heart skipped a beat. My little Benjamin, she said. He died when he was five years old. There was something in his expression that made her keep talking, even though she never, ever talked about Benjamin. He got a chill. His death changed my mind about having children. For a long time, I was afraid to have children of my own. He sat down beside her on the settee, but he didn't look at her. You don't wish to have a child? Is that why you live apart from your husband? This is a very improper conversation, she said, 
trying vainly to draw herself together. The rehearsal, the whole performance, was a dreadful idea. All the time she was spending with Sebastian wasn't helping her ignore her ridiculous affection for him. In my experience, your conversation is invariably improper, he noted. Why did he have to have such a deep voice? The truth is, Esme thought, with her usual clarity, I would rather sleep with my best friend's fiancé than with any other man I have met in my entire misspent life. This was a repulsive thought to have about oneself, and she frowned in reaction. He put his hand to her forehead and smoothed the frown lines with his thumb. "'Are you sharing a bed with Burdette?' he asked, and his voice had a harsh edge to it. She met his eyes steadily. "'No, I am not.' His shoulders relaxed imperceptibly. "'But only because Bernie's mind turned out to be disappointing,' she added. "'I have slept with men other than my husband. Would you like to know their names?' "'Absolutely not.' His hand dropped from her face. "'I thought you were indicating interest,' she said, her tone tranquil. Inside, her mind was screaming with tension. She folded her hands in her lap. "'Shall we rehearse the play, my lord, or would you like to give me a list of your lovers?' There was silence. She finally had to look at him. His eyes were the dark blue of pansies. So sober they were. She opened her book. I have not yet slept with a woman, married or unmarried. His voice was low, but utterly calm. Esme's head literally jerked in shock. You haven't? No. He didn't seem to feel the need to elaborate. Why on earth not? she breathed. Because I'm not yet married. I had no idea you... Are you a Puritan? No. She waited. I have never understood the folly that leads to setting up a mistress, he remarked. Friends of mine have broken their marriage vows and wasted their principal on opera singers. Never having met a woman who tempted me into foolish behavior, I have not followed their example. Oh. She could not quite think what to say next. Shall we begin with the third act of Much Ado, my lord? He ignored her. I would not break my marriage vows, had I made any. That is very appropriate of you, Esme said awkwardly. However, I've come to believe that Gina will stay with her husband rather than marry me, he said, looking down at her. I expect she will tell me so tomorrow. Esme swallowed. She couldn't just sit silently. It was too treacherous, too enticing. Miles was moving back into her bed. Miles was going to father her children. She couldn't make that fact sound urgent to herself. Am I to understand that you have met a strumpet, capable of tempting you into foolish behavior? She managed. Yes. She stood up. Then I wish you luck in achieving the proper degree of folly. Unfortunately, it is time to retire for the night, or we could prolong this fascinating conversation— I suggest that we continue our rehearsal in the morning. He caught her wrist, just as she turned away. She refused to look. His eyes were too dangerous. His eyes, and that lean beauty of his. She wasn't going to be his strumpet. You have slept with other men, he began. She jerked her wrist away from him. The cardinal distinction is that when I have occasionally, occasionally, my lord, "'Shared my bed with men. It was because I desired them. "'You seem to have ignored that important fact.' "'She walked toward the door. "'He was just behind her. He didn't touch her again, though. "'I didn't say it correctly. I should have told you how beautiful you are.' "'She couldn't help it. She looked over her shoulder. "'He looked faintly impatient. "'I was hoping that we could acknowledge our mutual attraction.' without attaching undue sentiment to that fact. She took a deep breath. I gather by acknowledge you think I should invite you to my chamber. He nodded. You are an extremely intelligent woman, for all you pretend to be frivolous. That is hardly the point. 
He caught her hand and pulled her around to face him. Then what is the point, Esme? I want you. I want you as I've never wanted any woman, and you are... available. I am not married, and I don't believe that I'm truly engaged to be married either. Why shouldn't you invite me to your bed? I assure you that my brain is in far better working order than Burdett's. You are likely right about Gina's marriage. He opened his mouth, and she hastily interceded. But not about mine, my lord. I am not available. No. Damn him for his beauty, for the emotion in those business-like eyes, for the way his hands on hers made her shudder with longing. As it happens, I am returning to my husband's bed, she said briskly. So I'm afraid that you have missed your opportunity. Strumpet today, wife tomorrow. His eyes narrowed. Returning does not imply immediate action. He paused. She said nothing. Do I understand that you are not yet reconciled with the estimable Lord Rawlings? At her small nod, he reached behind her and locked the door. Then I would be a fool to miss the small opportunity that I have, would I not? Eyes on hers, he stripped off his neckcloth and tossed it to the side. Esme laughed unsteadily. You've run amuck, my lord. This is not like you. His body was large, a rider's body. Despite herself, she felt a deep, melting ache inside. Hers. No woman had touched that body. He threw his shirt over a chair. You cannot undress in Lady Truebridge's sitting room, she protested. What if someone wishes to enter? They will not. He was pulling off his right boot. Despite herself, she watched the muscles flex in his powerful back as he bent over. The musicians were playing a last dance when Dew and Burdette left the ballroom. No one is at the billiards table next door, and I feel reasonably confident that the household is preparing for bed. His hands went to his waistband, and her mouth went dry. She made one last feeble protest. I shouldn't, but her mind was already made up. Every bone in her body told her to accept what had come her way. Wouldn't you be more comfortable joining me in my chamber? He looked at her darkly. I think not. I find the idea that you may have slept with other men in that bed uncomfortable. It is a foolish quibble, but I feel it nonetheless. She started to protest and stopped. It was none of his business that she hadn't invited a man into her bed for years, let alone during Lady Trubridge's house party. In a moment he was stark naked. Esme's knees felt weak. She leaned against the sitting-room door. "'Aren't you going to undress?' he asked. She cleared her throat. This was truly the strangest seduction she'd ever participated in. "'Will you act as my lady's maid?' He stepped closer, and she felt the blood rush to her face. He was so casual in his nakedness, so confident. "'Doesn't it bother you that this is the first time you've done this?' she asked, with some curiosity. He paused for a second in his nimble unbuttoning. "'No. The process seems simple for most men, so why would it not be so for me? The action required of me does not seem complicated or difficult.' A smile played at the corner of his mouth. I am reputed quite an athlete, Esme. I trust I shall not fail you in the field. He gently kissed her neck, and she felt his tongue touch her skin for an instant. The small part of her brain that hadn't slipped into heated awareness of his body noted his incredible arrogance. Had the man no lack of confidence in any area of his life? She gently laid her gown over a chair and turned to face him. She was a great aficionado of French undergarments, and at the moment she was tricked out like a Parisian courtesan. Her chemise was naught but a few scraps of lace. His eyes darkened to black. You're exquisite. He put a hand on her throat. It slid to her shoulder. She turned and walked toward the couch. Reaching up, she pulled pins from her hair,
until it fell in a gentle swoosh to her pantalettes, then held out her hand. Will you join me, my lord? Esme shivered with a combination of excitement and embarrassment. She had never made love in a public room, but it didn't seem to bother the proper Marquis. He pulled off her remaining garments until she was quite naked, curling her toes into the carpet. And he just looked at her. When he spoke, his voice made her jump. You're the most exquisite woman I have ever seen, Esme. He pulled her forward into his arms. She toppled against his chest, and he smoothed the long line of her hip and thigh, pulling her against his body. This is the most dangerous thing I have ever done, Esme thought. But his eyes were as blue as a cloudless sky. At some point a servant rattled the door, wishing to damp the fire for the night. Sebastian bellowed at him. Marquis Bonington, widely known as the most gentlemanly gentleman of the tall, had lost his composure. Worse, when his companion giggled and said something very naughty in his ear, he didn't reproach her. Instead, he pinned her down and said something fierce, something impolite, something that made Esme shudder and pull him, all the glorious muscled parts of him, closer. Just because he was an athlete didn't mean that there weren't matters of finesse to learn. But great athletes are great athletes. As Esme discovered to her great pleasure, they learn quickly. Even better, they understand that the road to perfection is a question of doing it again, and doing it again. And perhaps in the grey hours of dawn, one last time, if only to prove that innate athletic prowess is a valuable attribute in all sports. 30. Courage is required. Lord Perwinkle's bedchamber. Carola huddled under chilly linen sheets, safely ensconced in Tuppy's curtained bed. She'd pulled the curtains so tightly together that not even a gleam of light penetrated the cloth. Everything was in place, except her resolution. In fact, she was contemplating flight. She'd just realized that there was one important thing wrong with Esme's plan. She, Carola, didn't like the marital act, didn't like it when Tuppy instigated it on their wedding night, and didn't like it any better two weeks later. Her mother's assumption that she would come to the bridal had never taken place. She huddled into a tighter ball and clutched her knees. The key thing to remember was that she did want to be Tuppy's wife, even if she didn't want to do that wifely duty. She would like to kiss him. The very thought of kissing Tuppy, of Tuppy kissing her, sent a flush to her face. But kissing wasn't enough. Esme had been cuttingly straightforward in her analysis. Carola had to persuade Tuppy that she wanted to be in his bed, so much that she would humiliate herself to be there. To her mind, humiliation was inevitable. She was so embarrassed that she truly thought she might faint when he climbed into the bed. The problem was that Tuppy was no good at this sort of thing. Of course, she hadn't stressed that with her friends. It wasn't a loyal thought. She was going to have to pretend to enjoy it. That was the only way she could make Tuppy believe that he wasn't a bad rider, and all the other things she said when they were first married. She had to be congratulatory. That's wonderful, Tuppy, she practiced under her breath. What wonderful! Wonderful what? Rhythm? Cadence? What wonderful finesse you have, she decided. What wonderful finesse you have, and how much I am enjoying this. That sounded sophisticated. She had to avoid a tendency to sound like her mother opening a charity bazaar. She had to sound fervent, truthful. Just then there was a scraping noise, and the door opened. Carola squeaked with panic, and then buried her face in the pillow. Had he heard her gasp? She would die if he discovered her when he was still fully clothed. He had to come to bed unclothed and having turned down the lamp. Otherwise, he might be put off by the sight of her overgrown breasts. 
She was wearing her nightgown, with a small corset underneath, just to keep her flesh in place. There were muffled sounds as Tuffy walked around the room, presumably undressing. Carola's heart was beating so fast that she could hardly hear his movements over the drum roll in her ears. What was taking him so long? There was a creak, and then silence. She lay rigid. One moment. Two minutes. Surely she'd waited ten minutes. He wasn't coming to bed at all. Or perhaps it wasn't Tuppy in the room. Carola's eyes grew wide. It was the thief. The man who rifled Gina's room had come to steal her husband's cufflinks. She inched up on her knees and slowly, slowly edged toward the curtains. The thief would likely kill her as soon as look at her. Everyone knew that criminals were desperate by nature, and regularly battered people on the head with heavy objects. With the tip of a finger, she drew the curtain slightly apart. At first, she couldn't see anything but the corner of the room. Then she edged to the side and saw... Tuppy. It was no thief. It was Tuppy. Carola felt a surge of irritation. It was just like Tuppy to sit around and be idle when there was something important to do. He always wanted to sit and read a book when she wanted to be at a play, or, better, a ball. The fire wasn't even lit. He was just sitting. His legs were outstretched, and his lean face was tired. He looks lonely, Carola thought, and a pang caught her just under her heart. Maybe he's thinking about our marriage. Maybe he'll cry. But Tuppy had never shown any sign of tears, and Carola had to admit that he didn't look ready to succumb now. He just stared blankly at the charred logs. Finally, he stood up, stretched, and began unbuttoning his evening jacket. Carola's breath caught in her throat as he pulled his shirt over his head. Tuppy wasn't much of an athlete compared to some men of the ton. He didn't strip and box with Gentleman Jackson himself. He didn't ride to the hunt four days out of five, nor did he careen around the countryside in a racing phaeton. Nothing she knew of explained the whip-lean body he had. How could you get those chiseled muscles sitting around on a river bank? Tuppy tossed his trousers over the chair and began looking around the room. Carola suppressed a nervous giggle. He was looking for his nightshirt, but she had bundled it up and stuck it under the bed. She had thought that he was less likely to throw her out of the room if he were completely undressed. After a while, he gave up the search and just readjusted his smalls in the front. Carola watched with fascination. Men were so oddly constructed. His thighs bulged with muscles as he walked across the room. She felt an odd, flickering heat all over her body. She nervously shifted back, dropping the curtain. But nothing happened. She couldn't hear anything. Delicately, she reached forward again and peeked out. He had apparently decided to tend to the dying fire. He was standing next to the fireplace, leaning one arm on the mantel, and lackadaisically smashing the charred log with a poker. He does look sad, Carola thought. Perhaps he doesn't want to leave tomorrow morning. Perhaps he cares for me. Then Tuppy headed for the bed. It was curtain time. 31. Curtain Call Tuppy opened the bed curtains and pulled at the blanket, before he realized that there was already someone under that blanket. In fact, she was clutching it to her neck. Her tousled mop of curls and bright eyes were all that could be seen. He felt an instinctive lurch in the area of his chest, instantly quelled. She was a charmer, his maddening wife, but she wasn't his. They had quarrelled from their first day together, and he had come to the painful decision that it was time to end the marriage. She could marry her tidy dancer, and he would forget about her. Forget about all women. His tone was colder than it might have been, given that last thought. What are you doing in my bed, Carola? 
She bit her lip, but didn't say anything. Can it be you mistook the way? he asked. He felt anger growing in his chest. What the devil was she doing, climbing in his bed? She didn't want to be with him. She'd made that clear enough the day before. Did you think that this was Charlton's bed? I would think that you knew the way quite well by now. He stared at her, willing her to blurt out the truth. But all she did was put a small hand on his arm and say, rather imploringly, Tuppy? A sudden thought struck him. You're carrying Charlton's child, and you hope to seduce me into acknowledging the child as my own. It would be one of those six-month babes, I presume. She flinched, as if he had struck her. For a moment they just stared at each other in the gloomy half-light cast by one oil lamp. The scheme is almost too clever for you to have thought of alone. Do I see Lady Rawlings' delicate handiwork? Do you... do you truly think that of me? Her voice shook. Either Carola had become a fine actress, or she was truly stunned. What else should I think? His eyes searched her face. I cannot imagine a single reason why you would frequent my bed. Unless someone has changed your mind, you consider intercourse to be a messy, utterly tedious, and rather painful task. Please let me know if I have misquoted you. She bit her lip. Tuppy strained to see her face. Were her eyes filled with tears? A dangerous part of his heart thumped the part of him that had seen an effortlessly joyous angel dancing, and asked for her hand five days later. He clenched his jaw. Well, Carola, we are both older and wiser than we were. I hardly think that we need to pretend that you would initiate an activity you found so unpleasant, at least without a very good reason. I had better go, she said. There was a little shake in her voice that confirmed his suspicions. She began scrambling toward the other side of the bed. Instantly he changed his mind. Did he really give a damn if she were pregnant by another man? He would never discard his wife. He grabbed her arm. Cara! The pet name he gave her during their brief marriage fell unconsciously from his lips. She shook her head. Please, let me go! He pulled on her arm. Now he was determined to find out what was going on. It's all right about the baby. His other hand came up, willy-nilly, and touched the little curls at the nape of her neck. He loved, he used to love, the way they were so white-blonde and soft just for her. I'll take care of your child. She still didn't look at him. He tugged gently on the curl he held. It's just me, Cara. Your irritating old husband, remember? You can tell me about it. I didn't... I didn't expect you to remain chaste, after all. We've been apart for three years. It was almost true. Hoping was not the same thing as expecting. She shook her head and mumbled something he couldn't hear. What? Four years? She looked at him, and her eyes were drenched with tears. It's been four years... And two months. He blinked. Ah. Oh. He pushed away a tear that was snaking down her cheek. Don't cry. It's not important, whatever the problem is. You don't have to sleep with me. I'll never, ever make you do that again. To his dismay, the tears overflowed, and a sob broke from her chest. Tuffy felt a sickening pang in his stomach. He had found Kara to be one of the most incomprehensible people he'd ever met. He felt as if he'd lost the ability to understand simple English the moment he put the ring on her finger. I'll give you the divorce, if that's what you want, he said desperately. There's no need to cry. You can marry Charlton, or I will acknowledge the child. And you don't have to sleep with me. I would never humiliate you that way. He wiped off the tears that were falling so hard that he couldn't stop them with his fingers. Then, without warning, she flung herself into his arms and plastered her lips against his. They were soft and full, and it all came back in a rush. His young self, so drowned in desire, 
that he could hardly control himself every time he kissed her. He pushed her away, embarrassed by the memory of his own foolishness. As I said, you needn't embarrass yourself or me, Carola. I will acknowledge your child. It was as if she didn't hear him. She just lurched forward again and actually pushed him against the bedboard and kissed him. Tuppy had a moment of claustrophobia and gasped for air, and in that second her tongue met his, and he was a drowning man. He had never felt with anyone else the rush of erotic sensation he felt with his young, obstinate wife. Certainly not with his desultory mistress of the past year or so, an older and experienced widow, who admitted him to her home with a measured enthusiasm that suited them both. Carola's tongue met his eagerly, and, with a sad little pang, he thought that Neville Charlton had certainly taught his wife a thing or two. But he pushed the thought away and simply kissed her fiercely, with all the pent-up longing he felt every time he saw her. Two things occurred to Tuppy during that long kiss, two facts slowly crystallized in a shaking wave of lust. The first was that he doubted his wife was making up her enthusiasm just to mask an unwanted pregnancy. Such a sophisticated lie wasn't in his Kara's nature. But the second was that, for some unknown reason, she had come to his bed wearing a nightgown with a corset under it, which seemed to imply that she had no intention of taking that nightdress off. In fact, it implied that she wanted to look her best, and if she never intended to undress, what the devil was she doing in his bed? So, from the depths of his lust-fogged mind, he pushed her away and growled, Carola, tell me what the hell you're doing in my bed. She opened her mouth, but nothing came out. Carola, he said dangerously. I came to make, to seduce you, she said in a little, unsteady voice. His belly throbbed, and his resolution slipped another inch. I know that's not the truth, he said, fastening his mind on the corset. This seems more along the lines of an old-fashioned comedy to me, the moment of the bed trick. The flash of surprise on her face confirmed his suspicion. But anger didn't follow, just a weary sadness. So you've arranged for people to find us together, have you? I suppose that will ensure that your child's paternity is unquestioned. And then you needn't go through with something as distasteful as actual intercourse. I don't know why you keep talking about a child, Tuppy, she said in a steady voice. I am not carrying a child. He pounced. Oh, then why, my dear, are you wearing a corset, unless it is either to prevent me from seeing your swelling belly, or to look your best when we are opportunely interrupted. She blushed. The light was dim, but there was no mistaking his Carola's blushes. Her skin was so porcelain white that she blushed as red as a peony flower. She didn't say anything, though, just wrung her hands. She was so adorable that Tuppy felt another surge of lust that almost crippled his reason. Well, he asked through clenched teeth. I didn't want to disgust you. Because of the child? Tuppy asked awkwardly. There is no baby. This corset doesn't even cover my belly. See? She smoothed the thin cloth of her nightgown against her body, and he could clearly see that the corset ended just above her waist. Her tummy had a gentle curve that fired him with desire, but said nothing of pregnancy. Then why are you here? His tone had all the bewildered frustration of a man who had never understood his wife since her first bout of tears on their wedding night. She pressed her hands to her cheeks, mortified. He tipped up her chin. Carola? She took a deep breath. You were correct when you noticed that my... my dress size has changed since we married. What? He didn't have to sound so shocked. She crossed her arms over her chest. I made a mistake coming to your room. This is absurd. And this time she moved so quickly that she was off the bed before he even blinked.
He slammed himself in front of the door, just as she pulled a robe from behind a chair. Clearly, the corset was one of those female things that there was no point in deciphering. "'Why were you in my bed?' he said, standing before the door. "'Because I wanted to seduce you!' she shrieked. He stared at her, dumbfounded. "'But now I don't, you big oaf! And don't you dare mention that baby again! I don't have a baby, and it's unprincipled of you to even suggest that I might have, that I would do such a thing as sleep with a man, not my husband!' She stood in front of him, and her golden curls turned into a fuzzy halo around her head. Tuppy could feel a heat in his chest that was so deep and so hot that he might expire. "'You wanted to seduce me?' she glared at him. "'Wanted! I've changed my mind!' "'No, you haven't,' he said. He reached out and grabbed her shoulders, pulling her to him. His kiss was just as clumsy as she remembered. There was nothing polished about Tuppy. He was direct and fierce and awkward. But it was different now. She melted into his clumsy kisses, as if he were more polished than Byron himself. When he pulled her roughly against his hard body, it didn't occur to her that he showed no finesse. Instead, she trembled all over and arched back against him. He spun her quickly and backed her against the door, which was just the kind of unsophisticated thing he used to do. He wrenched off her robe, because he couldn't get the tie undone. His hands fumbled, but everywhere he touched her, she burned with liquid pleasure. It wasn't until they were lying on the rug, and Tuppy had managed to bundle her nightgown over her head, that she came even slightly to her senses. She opened her eyes, to find him hanging over her, braced on his elbows, and the lock of hair that was falling over his eyes was so dear that she had to brush it back and kiss him. When they emerged for air, he still looked troubled. Kara, he said, and his voice had such a deep resonance that she almost wept to hear it. But he was talking, and so she wrenched her mind back to his words. Would you be greatly distressed, if I removed your corset. His big hand hovered, and she shuddered with desire to feel him, and blushed when she realized what he was saying. Shyly, she pulled her hands from his shoulders and unlaced the front. He closed his eyes for a second when she pulled the corset open, and her breasts spilled free. For the first time, Carola thought she might have misunderstood him. You're so beautiful, he said. His voice was everything his hands were not, reverent, delicate, hushed. But she arched into his hands, his wonderful hands, and then his mouth. You don't think I'm over-fleshy, she said, before she lost all capacity for thought. You really don't, Tuppy, because you said I was fat. Fat? His voice splintered with surprise. Carola started to smile. He never did answer her, but his mouth was on her breast, and after a while she didn't care what he might have said. It was only when they were both undressed and he rolled on top of her that her body remembered and tensed, grew a little rigid. He stopped kissing her. "'What's the matter?' he whispered against her lips. But his hand slid down her hip. It was... Surely he never touched her like this when they were first married. He eased the stiffness away, soothed the fear away. Would you rather be in the bed? I didn't turn the lamp down. I remember that you don't think it's proper. It doesn't matter, Carola said with a little pant. And she found, to her surprise, that she meant it. Still, she stiffened again when she felt him between her legs. It was confusing, the liquid warmth that seemed to have taken over her body, and her memories of painful intrusion. She couldn't help it. She yelped when he entered, even though he was cautious. "'Does it hurt?' he said, and his deep voice shook. "'No,' she whispered, and it didn't. It felt as if molten gold spread through her legs, and she moved her knees up, and he fell in, a little way, 
and a harsh noise came out of his mouth. So she nudged against him again, and he came to her more and more. She never bothered to tell him how much finesse he had, because he didn't have any, and she lost the inclination to lie. Instead, she sobbed his name and clung to him as he moved in her hard and fast, and without any finesse or delicacy at all. The whole experience had nothing to do with being a good rider, or any of those things her mother had said. It was about moving together in a dance so fierce and hungry that Carola experienced something she had never expected or imagined. And the only thing she could do was clutch him to her as hard as she could, and even, after a while, move with him. The French call it a petit mot, Tuffy told her later, lying on his side and stroking her neck. His fingers wandered downward, and his eyes laughed at her. That's absurd, Carola managed. But his fingers were dancing over her skin, and there really wasn't any point in arguing about terminology. 32. Regret is a morning affair. Cam was one of those people who slept so soundly that it was as if his spirit had gone visiting. Gina had never thought about it, but now she discovered that she was the opposite type of person. When Cam rolled over, she woke up. When his large hand settled on her hip and pulled her bottom snugly against him, she stared wide-eyed into the darkness, wondering what was going to happen next. Nothing happened. He just breathed heavily into her neck, and then, after a while, he started snoring, although he kept her pulled tightly against him. The stretches of darkness gave her plenty of time for luxuriating in her own foolishness. By sleeping with Cam, if one could call it sleeping, she had discarded all her dreams of marrying the responsible, kind Marquis. As the wakesome hours wound on, Sebastian grew into a larger and larger figure in her mind, a figure of fatherhood, a man who would live in England and take care of his family. A man who would love her, as opposed to calling her love, who would not spend his time fashioning naked women in stone, but doing responsible, organized things. She ignored her sense that Sebastian spent most of his time on horseback. Anyway, he surely didn't snore. Sebastian was far too proper for snoring. Most of all, she kept returning to the fact that not once, not even once, had Cam said that he loved her. When dawn broke, Gina woke from a dream in which Cam gaily introduced her to a buxom woman he called the lovely Marissa. She pushed his hand off her hip and stared into the grey light, trying to decide whether it would be worse to marry Sebastian, who might have a mistress on the side, but would never let her know about it, or Cam, who would likely parade his mistress before her. The very thought of it made her hand curl into a fist. She would kill the woman. She would— Gina was appalled at her own ferocity. What was she thinking? It was more than likely that Cam would sail to Greece and not return for another twelve years. That meant she was going to spend the rest of her life in the sort of twilight marriage she had already experienced. By the time morning finally came, she was desperate for sleep. She was also irritable, exhausted, and incoherently anxious to let her husband know how dreadful a sleeping companion he was. And if her unspoken feeling was that he was a dreadful husband, well, she would let him know that too. He, on the other hand, had the cheerful joy of a man who wakes up to find his hand on the thigh of a delectable woman. Until he got a measure of that woman. You snore, she said accusingly. Cam tried to look innocent. I do. You snore, and you groped my body during the night. He tried harder for the innocent look. I do. It's only because you're so beautiful. She shot him a scornful look, and he closed his mouth. I've had no sleep, none. When you weren't snoring or groping, you were kicking or pulling away the blanket. I'm sorry. Is there some way I can make you feel better? 
he started kissing her neck as she sat on the edge of the bed. She felt nothing but acute irritation. She leaped to her feet so fast that he almost toppled off the side. Absolutely not. I am going to dress and return to my chamber immediately. I believe we shall have to keep separate rooms, if only so that I can sleep. Shame on you, Gina. You, who insisted that you would share a bedchamber with a marquis. I'm quite certain that Sebastian would not be as disruptive a sleeper as you are, she flashed back, pulling on her gown. Will you check the corridor, please? I would hate to be seen leaving your chamber. Cam pulled on his trousers and thought for a moment. Then he asked quietly, Why? What do you mean, why? I hardly think I need to detail the reasons why. I would be interested in your reasoning. Our marriage was annulled three days ago, she pointed out. Even if we didn't find out until yesterday, the fact remains that we are unmarried at the moment. You sound as if you regret the fact we consummated our marriage, Cam said. She avoided his eyes. Not at all. Are you? Why on earth should I be? he said in a lazy, rough tone. Gina swallowed. Obviously he meant to carry out the plan he'd proposed in the ballroom, that they continue as they were, and simply share a bed on the few occasions when he visited England. You won't be as free, she stated. Free? If we are truly married, you can't return to Greece. No, he asked. No. Her voice almost wavered, but she caught it. If we are married, we should live together. Greece is my home. So is Gerton. If you insist on leaving for Greece, well, she hurried ahead. I shall inform Thinkbottle that I am not compromised after all. There was a moment's silence. Then, I dislike blackmail, oh my duchess. I don't mean to blackmail you, Gina replied. I simply believe... You simply believe I am the sort of wastrel who would take my pleasure and my wife's virginity, and waltz off to Greece without you, as if nothing had transpired. She swallowed. I consider myself compromised, he said tightly. I am compromised by the situation, and by my own lust for you. As it happens, I am not the sort of man who overlooks my responsibilities. But you don't believe that about me, do you? There was a self-loathing to his voice that stung her heart. After all, you easily believed that I would shape your naked body into pink marble and sell it in the public square. I didn't mean to insult you. I thought you would fashion me in marble because that is what you do. You are quite right, he said, and his voice was full of rage now. That is what I do. I sculpt naked women for a living. Moreover, I do it in Greece. You are a duchess, and you live in England. The two facts sound incompatible, don't they? You have no need for a husband who engages in disreputable sculpture. You see, Gina, I will not stop sculpting naked women. It is what I do. Stephen couldn't stop me, and neither can you. She frowned. I have not asked you to stop sculpting women. He laughed. If I am to stay at Girton and fashion bridges without nymphs, give up my house in Greece, and become a philanthropic duke, when will I engage in disreputable sculpture? I hadn't thought of it, she said, clenching her hands. You needn't think. I can see it for myself. After all, your idea of the ideal husband is a stick-like marquis. But it is impossible to fashion me into Bonington, Gina. It won't work. Soil has never turned to gold. You might as well accept the fact and consider whether you wish to continue in this marriage. Perhaps it was lucky that we were not compromised. Your wiggy Marquis is still waiting in the wings. At least he loves me, Gina snapped. He stared at her. He loves me, she repeated shrilly. He doesn't snore and he lives in England. To her dismay, her tired eyes filled with tears. You're just going to leave me here at Girton and go back to your mistress. Marissa is not my mistress, Cam interjected. I'm sure you have a mistress somewhere on that island, Gina snapped back. 
Cam opened his mouth, but then he remembered Bella. She couldn't exactly be called a mistress, but Gina spoke before he could articulate the distinction. I thought you did. Perhaps Sebastian will keep a mistress, but at least I won't know about it. The very thought of Cam sleeping with another woman sent a knife-like pain into her heart. I just don't think I can bear it, she said jerkily. I can't. I can't. I don't think I want to. She trailed off. You don't think you want to marry me, he said. His voice was rather gentle under the circumstances. She bowed her head as a huge sob tore its way up her chest. He pulled on his clothes. She kept crying. He walked over and put his hand on her hair. The caress made her weep harder. You will have to decide for yourself. If you want to marry the Marquis, you needn't give me another thought. I shall return to Greece. The annulment papers are there. He nodded to the table. You and Bonington can be married by evening, if that's what you wish. He pulled on an overcoat that hung by his door. If you'll excuse me, I think I will drive to London and speak to Rampton. I do think that a solicitor so bold ought to be reprimanded, don't you? He wasn't even going to argue with her. He didn't even care enough to argue with her. She gritted her teeth. I would prefer to reprimand him for Thinkbottle's unaccountable delay in giving us the annulment papers. His eyes were black and steady. It is, of course, a question for your own moral temperament. No one knows what happened in the plunge bath, Gina. You should feel free to inform Bonington that he may use his special license immediately. She felt a pulse of terror and sorrow under her breastbone. Come! But he was leaving. She blinked and ran into the corridor. Camden, she said. But he was nearly at the end of the corridor, so she shouted, Come back! He swung around. His eyes were blazing with rage. Was there something you wished, he said, something I could give you? There was no point to standing in the corridor, but Gina stood until Cam's receding footsteps on the stairs had faded from her ears. 33. The following afternoon, a solicitor's creativity is deplored. You wrote that letter to my wife. You, my solicitor, wrote a blackmailing letter and sent it to Gina's mother. Are you absolutely cracked? I do not believe so, Rampton replied. But yes, I wrote the letter. Cam stared at Rampton in disbelief. I find it hard to conceive that you, a respected solicitor, my father's own solicitor, would resort to such disgraceful lengths. And all for what? So that I would have a son and continue the Girton line? What the devil do you care, anyway? The only sign that Rampton was at all affected by his words was the way he jiggled his pocket watch. It seems to me a reasonable course of action. Reasonable? Cam's voice rose. It was a bloody imposition, and you know it as well as I do. My father's despicable methods appear to have rubbed off on you. It was one thing when he forced me to marry. He broke off. His face took on such a menacing look that Rampton actually shifted backward in his seat. Tell me that my father instructed you to ensure that I consummate my marriage. Tell me that, and I'll kill you myself. He did not, Rampton replied. After you left the country, he never mentioned your name again, to the best of my knowledge. I assumed, during that excuse for a marriage ceremony, that you did not agree with my father's judgment. I clearly remember when you informed my father that his decree went against the law. Rampton nodded. You are correct. I felt your father was making an error by forcing you to marry. Then why did you take the opportunity to behave precisely as my father had? At least my father's demands were straightforward. He summoned me from Oxford, demanded that I marry the girl I considered my first cousin, and threatened to kill me if I didn't. You achieved much the same result by underhanded and devious means. 
writing an anonymous letter that threatened my wife with exposure, sending Finkbottle down to compromise us. Despicable, Rountan. I would disagree, the solicitor replied coolly. I thought my letter was an ingenious touch. Of course, I rather expected that the Marquis would withdraw his suit on learning that your wife was not only illegitimate herself, but had illegitimate siblings. Bonington's reputation is of a man rigidly concerned with propriety. It seems the Duchess did not share the letter with him. Perhaps I should have sent the letter directly to him. How did you know of Wapping's existence? I did not know his name. But your father's investigators uncovered the fact Countess Ligny had also given birth to a male child. Moreover, she had arranged to give the child to his father, a philosopher at the Sorbonne, precisely as she did with your wife. Your father could think of no practical use for the information, but I thought it interesting. I had no idea, of course, that Wapping had travelled to England after the Countess died, or that he was interested in Countess Ligny's bequest to your wife. Cam shook his head. Why did you bother? Rountin answered at cross-purposes. Let me point out, my lord, that I could not force you to consummate your marriage. I simply made it possible for you to do so, if you wished. If my father did not make such a request, why would you bother to influence my life in such a fashion? The solicitor's chin set. I doubt you will understand what I am saying, my lord. My father and my father's father served the Gertons. Your father was a remarkably difficult man to work for, yet I did not leave his employ. His eyes met Cam's. The illegality of your marriage was only one of many such illegalities. If you wish me to weep over your tainted lily-white conscience, look elsewhere. You continued to work for him. I was brought up in the expectation that the Gertons would be the centre of my livelihood, that they would be my foremost client and first point of loyalty. I fail to see why you think I can't understand your motives, Cam said, with a cynical twist of his lips. In order not to lose your largest client, you complied with his dishonest schemes. I could have all the clients that I wish, Rampton said. I remained with your father because I was taught that loyalty was important, and that is what I think you will not understand. Cam's blood chilled to the bone. You think I have no loyalty? Mountain looked at him calmly. Your father was bedridden in 1802. You did not return to England to manage your estate. Your father died in 1807. You did not return to England for another three years. When you left this country, you were a young man, but you are grown now. Yet you have shown little or no interest in the welfare of your wife or your estate. I judge the Duchess to be an excellent manager of the estate, far better than you or your cousin is likely to be. I chose to do what was best for the Girton lineage and the Girton land. Make no mistake, my lord— I could make a great deal more money serving aristocrats who take the time to administer their own affairs than serving a duke who fritters his time away on a Greek island. Cam forced himself to breathe quietly through the red haze of rage that clouded his vision. Rountan had not said anything that he had not thought himself since returning to England. He had neglected his land and his wife— he had lost himself in the keen pleasure of creation, and forgotten that his birth entailed unpleasant responsibilities that had nothing to do with sculpting marble. You have a point, he finally said. Rountan did not gloat. I am sorry that I achieved my purpose through underhanded means. I need a special license, Cam said, and someone will have to go to the Isle of Nisos and close up my house. I can arrange that. I would prefer you to do it yourself. My statues will need to be packed with extreme care. Rountan blinked. He did not usually manage such matters himself, but perhaps in this situation he should be amenable. I shall return to Lady Trubridge's house tomorrow, Cam said, standing up, after I obtain a special license.
If you would join me in Kent, I will give you more detailed information about my house in Greece. My lord, I apologize if I have offended you in any way, Rountan said. You haven't, Cam said. His eyes were rueful, but the anger was gone. I am a careless bastard, Rountan. Always have been. I would rather work with marble than think about the Girton estate any day. But you are right to think that the Duchess likes that sort of work. And there are marble quarries in England, after all. The solicitor bowed. 34. Lady Rawlings awaits her husband. Esme had slept with more men than had many ladies in the tall. Mind you, she had slept with fewer men than were credited to her, and yet more than she should have, as a lady who had married at seventeen years old. But since her wedding night, some ten years previous, she had never invited a man into her bed, unless they shared a good deal of mutual desire. In fact, for the past six years, she hadn't desired anyone enough to take the risk. Until last night, of course. She tightened the cord around her robe. Her husband had said that he would visit tonight. She had dismissed her maid two hours ago, and still there was no sign of him. The problem was, the problem was last night. With an effort, she pushed away an image of her body, shaking so much that she literally trembled from head to foot. Dismissed from her memory the muscled chest, the kisses, the cries, the... Babies, she thought. Think about babies. Last night was a fantasy, a dream. It will never happen again. She sat down before the fire. Babies were reality. A baby would love her and stay with her. A baby wouldn't escort her back to her room without a word and avoid her throughout the day. It wasn't that she wanted acknowledgement from Sebastian. After all, he was on the verge of marrying her best friend in the world. But a goodbye would have been nice, she thought forlornly. She clenched her teeth. She wasn't the sort of woman to whom the Sebastians of the world said goodbye. Oh, he'd enjoyed last night. She hadn't been the only one shaking. He'd enjoyed her, and enjoyed the night, and left without a word. There was a scratch on the door, just in time to stop her from dissolving into tears. She loathed tears, despised them. Babies, she thought as she rose. Little round heads and sweet smells. Virtually every married woman said that after the third baby, they vowed to become celibate. She would have so many babies that the memory of the previous night would fade into nothing. She opened the door and smiled at her husband. Do come in, Miles. He tiptoed in and waited until she shut the door before he spoke. Good evening, Esme, he whispered. You needn't whisper, she said. We are married, after all. Miles cleared his throat. He had an embarrassed air that she thought was terribly nice of him. Of course, you're absolutely right, of course. He fell into silence. His eyes slid away from hers. What a good fire, he said. This isn't very comfortable, is it, she said, answering his demeanour. It isn't you, he said, meeting her eyes again. I, well, you're beautiful, and here I am. He patted his stomach, which was indeed rather large. With Lady Child, he ground to a halt. Uh, beg pardon, my dear. I meant never to mention her. Oh, Miles, we shouldn't pretend with each other. Against all reason, she was feeling much better. Why don't we sit down and have a glass of wine and talk like the sensible married couple that we are? They both gratefully succumbed to the little ceremony of pouring wine and seating themselves. Then Esme looked at her husband. He truly was one of the nicest men she'd ever met. So, does Lady Child admire your tummy, Miles? She twinkled at him. I think we should be quite frank with each other. After all, we are about to become lovers again, and we are already friends. He looked startled, and then enormously pleased. We are friends, 
Aren't we? She nodded. And now that we're going to be parents, our friendship is even more important. True enough, Miles said. I'm afraid that my parents were not pleasant to each other, and had made my childhood rather painful. Neither were mine, Esme said, and they smiled at each other with the relief of finding something in common. So, we both value civility in parenthood, she continued, taking a sip of wine. Other than that, I don't know anything about parenting, Miles confessed. My parents spent most of their time at court and left us in the country, so I never saw much of my father or my mother. That's why you wish us to live together, she guessed. He nodded. It did give me a lifelong love of the country. My hope is that we can spend time there with the children, rather than living apart from them. I intend to be a very motherly mother. In fact, she looked at him challengingly, I am going to breastfeed my own children. Pink rose up his throat. That was obviously more detail than he had bargained for. Whatever you wish, my dear, he spluttered. The wish that her husband didn't have a double chin darted across Esme's mind, and then she took it back. If she started being critical, there'd be no end to it. The best thing would be to never allow herself to have negative thoughts about Miles. She swallowed the rest of her wine. Shall we? She stood up and glanced at the bed, and then smiled at her husband. He heaved himself to his feet, but stood without moving. This is damned hard, he said. I feel like some sort of reprobate, bedding you. We're married, Miles. But we're not. I'm a tub of lard, as the phrase goes. He tugged at his waistcoat. And you're the most lovely woman in the tongue. Everyone knows that. Esme walked over to him and put her hands flat on his chest. Will you join me in our bed, Miles? She leaned over and feathered a kiss across his lips. Then she stood back, untied her robe, and let it fall. He blinked. Esme knew precisely what she looked like. She was wearing a French creation that was designed to make any man in the vicinity ravenous with lust. In fact, when she wore it on a previous occasion, the man in her vicinity lunged in a quite gratifying way. Miles didn't move a finger. She started undoing his vest. Would you like to come to bed now? Colour surged up into his cheeks. Yes, of course. Beg forgiveness, my dear. He removed her hands and undid his waistcoat by himself. Released from tight buttons, his stomach seemed to expand in every direction. Esme politely averted her eyes. He began to wrestle with his cufflinks. Would you like me to help? No, no, thank you, he said. She couldn't help but notice that his tone was rather miserable. She backed up and sat on the edge of the bed. Miles wore the kind of shirt that hung almost to his knees, so it was quite an operation hoisting it over his head. Moreover, it seemed to be a difficult business bending over to pull off his boots. Presumably his valet did that for him normally, but he managed it. And finally, there he was, wearing nothing more than smalls. Esme took a deep breath. It wasn't as bad as she thought. She could do this. The question really was, could he? He didn't appear riveted by last. He sat down next to her on the bed, but all he did was pick up her hand and pat it in the most paternal fashion. She leaned over and kissed him on the cheek, but he didn't lunge at her. Perhaps she should take off her nightdress. Unlike his clothing, the French nightdress practically flew off her body. It was so easily unfastened. He cast a glance at her, but looked away, as if she had belched in public. Esme looked down at her body. As far as she could tell, it looked just as appealing as it always had. Certainly the same as when they first married, and he had been gratifyingly complimentary at the time. At least, when they weren't quarrelling. Miles, we're friends. Therefore, as a friend, please tell me what the problem is. She tried to make her voice sound casual. 
I'm sorry, he said. I'm not absolutely certain I can do this. Am I? Is there something? You're lovely. But she noticed he still didn't look at her. I feel guilty, he said in a rush. His eyes were as mournful as those of a sick cow. I don't make a very good adulterer. I feel as if I'm being unfaithful. To Lady Child, Esme said. Yes, isn't that foolish? You're my wife, and she's not, but— She's the wife of your heart, Esme said, smiling at him. Would you rather not do this, Miles? She told me to, he said miserably. She said that I must, that she was happy for me, that there was no choice, really. There is a choice. You could put on your clothes and go back to your room, and no one would be the wiser. He shook his head. I have spent an absurd amount of time in the past few years thinking about having an heir, Esme. I never believed it was a true possibility. You could have divorced me, she pointed out. No, our marriage was a joint failure. You are such a good person, Miles, she said in a rush. I don't deserve you. Nonsense. She bit her lip. Here. She stood up and walked across the room to the wine decanter. Have some more wine. She poured it into his glass and then snuffed the candles until there was no light in the room but the glow from the fire. Then she got herself into bed and under the covers. Miles, will you join me? she said, trying to sound very sensible. I should like to make an heir now. She said it exactly as if she were requesting that he partner her at whist. The bed groaned as he lay down. Esme drew the bed curtains so that they lay in absolute pitch darkness. She waited a moment, but he didn't move, so she gave an internal sigh and reached out. But she met his hands halfway. His slid by and rested on her shoulders. I'm embarrassed. Miles, we're friends. We are not virgins, either. That should make this whole thing easier. His hand slid from her shoulder to her breast. Her hand slipped even lower on his body. It was some three hours later that Esme woke up. Had Miles made a sound? No, he was breathing loudly but evenly, which was good, because at some point his breath had become so laboured that she thought he might be overexerting himself. It wasn't so bad, she told herself. They had gotten through it with a modicum of grace and a good deal of humour. She could certainly do it again, if need be. Well, it likely took a while to become pregnant, perhaps even four or five times. She did hear something. She rose up on her elbow, but the bed curtains were still drawn, and she couldn't see anything. Yes, there was definitely someone in the room. She could hear a shuffling noise. Then, with an awful lurch to her stomach, she remembered the statue that Gina had given her for safekeeping. It stood on her bedside table, in clear view of the intruder. She put her mouth to Miles's ear. Wake up! There is a thief in our room! He woke up without a sound and pushed her back. The bed creaked when he sat up, but the thief didn't seem to have noticed. She didn't hear the door open. Perhaps he thought that she had made the noise turning in her sleep. Soundlessly, she slid to the other side of the bed, off the side and under the bed curtain. Grabbing the Aphrodite, she started to tiptoe around the bed when there was a muffled, scrambling sound. She ran around the end of the bed to see that Miles had lunged from the bed and seized the intruder. The fire was quite out by now, so all she could see was two black forms grappling in the darkness. She could hear Miles grunting with exertion. Suddenly she found her voice. Help! Help! she screamed, darting to the bell cord and pulling it with all her might. Someone help us! There's a thief in the room! A second later she heard a confused noise up and down the hall. But it all happened so fast that afterwards she had great difficulty describing the scene. 
The two men struggling before her separated, and the larger one swayed and went to his knees, clutching his chest. Miles! she shrieked, running to him. Oddly enough, the thief didn't immediately flee. She waved the Aphrodite at him. I'll brain you with this if you approach. Then she cast a closer look at her husband and dropped the statue, which fell to the ground with a dull thump. Miles, are you all right? He was oddly slumped with his head on his chest. He made a gargling noise. With one swift movement, the thief crouched at her side and reached out his hand to prop up Miles's head. Oh, my God! Sebastian! Thirty-five. Just before dawn. The door burst open and a crowd of people exploded into the room, but Esme paid no attention. When the door opened, light flooded in from the candles people held. Miles's face was an odd, greyish-green colour. She tried to push him backward so that he could lie down, but she couldn't move him from his knees. Someone help me, she said hoarsely. Miles, please, speak to me. Strong hands pushed her to the side. Lady Child pulled Miles forward so that his head lay against her chest. Esme saw with a sickening thump of her heart how limply his body collapsed. She scrambled to straighten his knees. Miles, Lady Child said in her deep voice. Open your eyes, Miles. There was a hushed silence around them. And then Esme heard, as if from a distance, Helene ordering everyone from the room. Vaguely she wondered about Sebastian, but her husband had opened his eyes. He looked up at Lady Child for a moment, and the breath caught in Esme's throat at the look in his eyes. Lady Child put a hand on his cheek. Don't speak, dearest. Esme saw that all the colour was gone from his face now. Make sure they've sent for a doctor, Lady Child whispered. Esme jumped up and threw open the door. Sebastian was standing just outside, looking as grim as a sentinel. She recoiled. What are you doing here? she hissed. Waiting to see if Lord Rawlings will recover. His face was absolutely white. We need a doctor, she said furiously. Go get one. A curricle has already been sent for the doctor, Sebastian said. May I? But she couldn't bear to listen to him. She shut the door with a quiet rap. Miles was looking at Lady Child again. The room was so quiet that Esme started counting his breaths. They came slowly and with visible effort. William, he said in a harsh whisper. William? William who? Esme asked. The babe, Lady Child said. Her hand cupped his cheek. We'll name your babe William. Don't worry about it, sweetheart. Just stay with us until the doctor arrives. Esme's eyes filled with tears. He's not. He's not. Miles had turned his face against Lady Child's bosom. She stroked his face and dropped a kiss on his forehead. It's all right, darling, she said, and her voice was as soft as water falling. I love you. He seemed to be struggling to say something. She hushed him. I know you love me, Miles. I know, I know, and I love you. She pulled him tighter against her chest. We'll name him William, and I will make sure he knows you, darling. I will tell him all about you. Esme clutched the hand she held. I won't ever leave William alone in the country and go to London, Miles. I'll take him with me everywhere. She couldn't tell if he heard her, and it didn't feel right to sit with the two of them, so she rose after a few moments and went to the window. She pulled the heavy drape and looked out, her back to the couple on the ground. She could hear confused clamour from the household, footsteps and raised voices. Why had Sebastian entered her chamber? She closed her eyes. Obviously he thought to surprise her in bed. Humiliation, anguish, 
and pain beat an alternating rhythm in her chest. Her lover had come into her room, and her husband was dead as a result. It was early, early morning. White fogs danced over Lady Truebridge's lawn, swept over the rose bushes as they waited to be evaporated by the sun. The sky was just turning a delicate pearly rose colour when Lady Child rose and stood beside her. Esme cast a quick look over her shoulder. Miles looked as if he were sleeping, except that he was lying on the floor. "'I'm not sure that I have a child,' she said. Her throat was rough with tears. "'I think it takes more than one night.' "'Very likely. But Miles knew little of reproductive matters. He was comforted by the thought. "'Yes, well,' Esme put her hand on her tummy, and wished with all her heart that a small William was nestled there. "'Last night,' she said stumblingly. "'It doesn't matter,' Lady Charles said. Her face was utterly calm, and she didn't appear to have shed a tear, unlike Esme, whose eyes were swollen. "'It mattered to Miles,' Esme insisted. "'It wasn't a simple thing. He felt adulterous. He couldn't. We had to be in the dark.' Tears rolled down her cheeks. "'He loved you so much.' "'Yes, he did,' Lady Child said, and Esme saw the first crack in her composure. "'And I, and I too.' She was smaller than Esme, so Esme pulled her husband's mistress against her shoulder and wept with her, for the sweetness of Miles, for the love of Miles, for Miles. It was some time later, after Lady Child and she had managed to put Miles's shirt and trousers back on, that there was a scratch on the door. Lady Child was sitting on the floor, stroking Miles's hair. Esme walked to the door and opened it slightly. Sebastian was still there. He looked at her without speaking. Lady Truebridge and an elderly gentleman stood beside her. "'This is Dr. Wells,' Lady Truebridge said in a low voice. I'm afraid it's too late. She nodded. May I speak to Lucy? With a start, Esme realized that she didn't even know Lady Child's first name. Lady Truebridge must be a close friend to address her as Lucy. She moved back silently. The doctor bent over Miles for a second, talked briefly to Esme and Lady Child, and then left. Esme stepped into the hallway and faced Sebastian. Do you... Did everyone see you? Yes. How would you like to proceed, Lady Rawlings? Proceed? What do you mean? I realise this is not a propitious time for a marriage proposal, but... Are you deranged? You think I would marry you? The man who killed my husband? She spoke out of the depths of her fury and self-hatred. He went completely still. I apologise from the bottom of my heart, he said. I can only offer... Your hand, she spat. I wouldn't take your hand in marriage, even if you weren't a stodgy, boring virgin. She wouldn't have thought it was possible for him to grow whiter, but he did. I'm afraid that your reputation will be damaged. Again, she cut him off. Leave. I want you to leave. The one thing you can grant me is the promise I will never see you again. Ever. Have I made myself clear? His eyes searched hers. Quite clear, he said. She stepped back and waited for him to go, and after a moment he did. She went back into her bedchamber and sat next to her dead husband. But she didn't belong there. Lady Child belonged there. Still, she sat. It was the least she could do for Miles, even though it was too little, too late. She sat, twisting her hands in her lap, her stomach knotted in self-loathing. After an hour or so, Lady Truebridge looked at Esme and said, "'Would you mind asking a footman to summon my maid, my dear?' Esme walked back into the corridor and almost collided with Helene. "'Does everyone know?' she asked without ceremony. She had to force the words out past lips grown stiff. 
Hélène was known in the town as a woman of utmost composure. Faced with her husband's worst depravities, she had never showed a twinge of emotion. But her face was condemning now. Bonington was partially dressed, she said. He had taken off his shirt when Miles attacked him. Apparently he thought to steal into your bed. Does Gina know? Esme whispered. Hélène drew her across the hallway and into her room. How could you? How could you do that to Gina? I didn't, until night before last. Not until it was clear that Gina was going to remain with her husband. Sebastian knew I was reconciling with Miles, but he left before I could tell him it was happening immediately. You shouldn't have done it, Helen said. And Bonington, the fool. Men are such fools. It's all my fault, Esme said dully. I killed my husband. I killed Miles because I'm a trollop. Bonington is protecting your reputation, Helen said. He has announced that he mistook the room. What? Whose room did he say it was? He said that he meant to visit his wife. His wife? Esme's voice rose. Helen nodded. He has told the entire house party that he and Gina were married yesterday afternoon, by special license, and that he was visiting his wife's room, except that he miscounted the number of doors and ended up in your room by accident. Esme, you're not going to faint, are you? I never faint, she muttered, but she did sit down. Did you say that he told the house party that he and Gina were married? Helen sat down as well. Yes, that's impossible. Gina is still married to her husband. In fact, I gather that the annulment was finalized a few days ago. But she is in love with her husband. I have no idea about her feelings. Helen's voice had regained its customary dispassionate ring. She has not yet denied Bonington's account. There is, naturally, a good deal of speculation regarding the presence of your husband in your bedchamber. Esme made an impatient gesture. Let the vultures think as they will. Where is Gina? I haven't seen her. I assume that she is downstairs accepting congratulations on her marriage. Naturally, everyone is horrified by your husband's death. Most people are leaving the house party immediately, out of respect. There was a noise at the door and Gina slipped through. Esme rose to her feet. I'm sorry, she said haltingly. I know there is nothing I can say, but I'm so sorry. I shouldn't ever have... Her voice cracked. For a moment, Esme and Gina just stared at each other. I cannot say that it doesn't matter, Gina finally said. It does. Do you wish to marry Sebastian? A revolted look crossed Esme's face. Absolutely not, she said. I must have been crazed to sleep with him in the first place. Gina sank into a chair. Everyone thinks I'm married to him now, she said, her tone stark. So I gather I'll be the one sleeping with him next. You don't have to acquiesce in that story, Helen stated. If I don't, Esme's reputation will be ruined, Gina said. If people even suspect that Sebastian intended to visit her bedchamber, she will be thrown out of society. Esme's reputation is hardly untarnished now, Helen pointed out. And I don't care, Esme put in. I betrayed your trust and slept with your fiancé. Why are you even thinking about my reputation? Gina's eyes were strained and bleak. Most husbands keep a mistress, she said. I suppose I shall become accustomed to sharing, Sebastian. Esme swallowed. He isn't that kind of, she started, but Helen put her hand on her arm. Where is the Duke? He's in London, although he'll likely return soon, because he thinks we're performing the play tonight. We did not part on the best of terms. In fact, I told him that I was planning to marry Sebastian. Then Gina added, rather miserably, And he didn't argue with me. This is my fault, Esme cried. It was I. I killed Miles and... Nonsense, Helen said in a quelling voice. 
Miles died of a spasm of the heart. Lady Truebridge told me that he had two episodes just this week. She had urged him to send for a doctor from London. He could have gone at any time. He was not well. I didn't know that. I'm his wife, and I didn't even know he was ill. Tears were falling down Esme's face again, and her voice was raw. No one thinks I loved him, but I did. He was so good and true, and I should never have made him leave. I should have stayed with him, and by now we would have had children. He wanted a baby, but I don't have it. She broke down into convulsive sobs. If only I hadn't been so stupid. Helen patted her shoulder. Gina reached over and took her hand. Esme's face was blotchy and swollen. At that moment, she was far from being London's most beautiful woman. Sebastian must tell the truth, she said. I shall do so myself, as soon as I go downstairs. I don't care a bean for my reputation. I'm going to retire to the country. And do what? Helen said fondly. Grow beans. I shall be in deep mourning. Please, Gina, tell Sebastian to be truthful. I intend to leave the house immediately. It is of no consequence what people think of me. Gina swallowed. The ton will crucify you, Esme. There has to be another way. There isn't. I don't give a hang what people think of me. I will never, ever sleep with another man. So help me, God. All I want is to be left in peace. You and Sebastian have my blessings. She hesitated. I just want you to know, Gina, that I never would have done it, except that I believed you wanted to remain married to Girton. That's just it, Gina cried. I don't know what I want. One moment I want to be married to Sebastian, and the next I want to be married to Cam. There was a noise in the hall. Esme wrenched open the door, just in time to see four footmen carry her husband from the bedchamber. She stood in the doorway, hand on her heart. Helene came up behind her. Do they know where to take him? Esme asked. Miles has to go home to the country. He would want to go home. There's time, Helene said soothingly. They'll put him in the chapel for the moment. The coach will leave this afternoon. The coach? She stumbled to a halt. You will follow your husband's coach. I expect that Lady Truebridge has already ordered it hung with black. Do you have a black gown? Esme didn't answer. I will accompany you, if you wish. That would be kind of you, she said dully. She walked across the hall into the empty room. Her foot kicked something as she walked forward. The Aphrodite! She picked it up. It's fallen into pieces. It must have cracked when I threw it down. I broke this, too. I'm sorry. I broke the Aphrodite. It's ruined. I ruin everything I touch. Hush, Gina said. It's simply hinged, that's all. I meant to ask you for it. I must give my brother whatever is inside. Your brother? Gina met the startled eyes of her two friends. Mr. Wapping, she said with an unsteady smile. She took the Aphrodite from Esme's hands. Didn't I tell you that Mr. Wapping is yet another child of Countess Ligny? Mr. Wapping is your brother? Esme asked. Gina pulled a roll of paper from the hollowed centre of the Aphrodite. He's my half-brother, actually. There's only paper here, she said. Just paper. No jewels. Mr. Wapping? Helen repeated, stunned. Your tutor? Did he give you that statue? No, the statue is a bequest from Countess Ligny, Gina said, as she undid the ribbon holding the roll of paper. Why, why, how very peculiar. They both looked a question. It's my letters, the letters I wrote her. Here's the first one and the second, the last letter I wrote before she died. Why did the Countess send back my letters? Is there a message from her? Gina shook her head, looking through the little sheaf of papers once more. 
Perhaps she forgot the letters were inside, Helen suggested. Mr. Wapping will be disappointed, Gina said. He was hoping for emeralds. How on earth did your tutor, your brother, know about the Aphrodite? Helen asked. The Countess told him that the Aphrodite held her most precious possession, Gina answered, cutting herself short with a little gasp. A smile crossed Esme's face. Her most precious possession, she said softly, reaching out and touching the letters. That's lovely. Gina bit her lip. She can't have meant it. She did, Helen stated. Then why didn't she write to me herself? Who knows, Esme said. But your letters were the most precious thing she owned. Her eyes filled with tears again. I never thought... Gina put the Aphrodite back together and looked at it. I thought she sent me a naked statue because she believed I was a strumpet, like... She sent you the statue because it was beautiful, and she wanted you to know that your letters were precious, Esme said. Gina's mouth wobbled. I thought she was just like Cam. What about Cam? Helen asked. He sent me a naked statue, too. When I turned twenty-one, he sent me a naked Cupid. At first I was grateful, but then I felt angry. It was so unlike me. I expect the Cupid is very beautiful, isn't it? Esme put in. The Aphrodite certainly is. They all looked at the Aphrodite. Gina's fingers had been clenched around her middle. Now she uncurled her hand and propped the goddess up with her other hand. She is beautiful, isn't she? The Aphrodite stood with her arm thrown over her head, looking backward in fear, in shame, in sorrow, or with love. Each woman saw something different in her face. 36. Sometimes a wife cannot be found. Is my wife below? Gina's maid was packing a trunk. She looked up. I beg your pardon, Your Grace? I am looking for my wife, your mistress, the Duchess. Annie gaped and then said, No, oh, she has gone to the village with... with her... With whom? With her husband, the little maid blurted out. Cam froze in the bedchamber door. His voice was as smooth as honey and fifty times more barbed. Am I to understand that my... that your mistress married Marquis Bonington? They married by special license, sir, Annie said a bit shrilly. This was the most thrilling thing that had happened to her in weeks. He put me in mind of a viper, she confided later to the assembled upper servants. A viper? My mistress is better off without him, great hulking Greek that he is. The Duke of Girton isn't Greek. He just lives there, said an upper housemaid. And, she added, showing that she was an avid reader of the gossip columns. His mother was one of Lord Fairley's daughters. Living in Greece is good enough, isn't it? A murderous lot, foreigners. Why, the Duke looked as if he'd murder me, just for telling him that my mistress married another man. Everyone knew his marriage was annulled, so why was he so surprised? Why, I've no this fortnight. Fortnight? They've been married a fortnight? The housemaid gasped. Not married, but engaged at least that long, Annie said, nodding at the circle of faces around the butler's table. She was hugely enjoying her newfound power as the personal maid to the notorious Duchess of Girton, now the notorious Marchioness Bonington. Previously, she had hardly been noticed by Lady Trubridge's sniffy butler, and here she was, seated to the right of the butler himself. The Duke has a right to look murderous, the housekeeper, Mrs. Massey, put in. Lady Bonington was his wife, after all. Common decency should have made her tell him that she was remarrying. I think he didn't want to end the marriage, Annie said. Well, his valet is packing his things as we speak, the butler remarked. I gather that the Duke is returning to Greece immediately. I've set the outdoor men to taking down that stage, what with the Duke gone and Lady Rawlings in mourning. 
In fact, Cam was watching Filippo's throw the last of his belongings into a trunk. What shall I do with these papers, sir? You know charcoal doesn't travel well. Filippo's held up sketches of Gina. Cam methodically tore the paper into small pieces without comment. And to the marble? Filippo's nodded toward the untouched block in the corner. Convey our regrets to the butler for the inconvenience, and ask him to dispose of it as Lady Truebridge wishes. The valet placed a last neckcloth in a small valise. Cam looked cursorily about the chamber. The sooner we're in Dover and preparing to sail, the better. I shall say a brief farewell to Lady Truebridge and beg the use of one of her carriages. What of Mr. Rountain? Philippos asked. The Duke didn't seem to hear him. He was staring at a fragment of paper in his hand, a sketch of the Duchess's hand. Philippos cleared his throat. Mr. Rountain is waiting for you in the library, my lord. Oh, yes, Cam said absently. He thrust the paper into his pocket and walked out the door without another word. In the library, Rountin was pacing the floor and giving himself a silent lecture. Curtains were trouble. Look at the illegalities in which the old duke involved himself. The new Gurton was as much trouble as the old. Of course, the duke was right to say that he'd stepped out of bounds. But devil take it, he'd only instructed that ass Finkbottle to nudge events in the proper direction, not to overturn the whole apple cart. Devil take it, you couldn't trust anyone these days. He pressed the heel of his hand hard to the burning spot in his stomach. Perhaps he should take the doctor's advice. Take a trip, the doctor had said. Go to a warm country. And now, Gurton wanted him to go to Greece and close up his house. It was almost providential. Rountin twiddled with his pocket watch. Given young Finkbottle's skills, he would have no clients when he returned home, which might be all to the best. He swung about as the door opened. Your Grace, he acknowledged, bowing. I am prepared. But Gurton cut him off. I am catching the first available boat from Dover to Greece. I fear your little scheme has failed. Apparently the Duchess married Bonington yesterday by special license. Rountin was struck dumb with surprise. She must have rushed to the altar after I left the house, Gurton went on. Impossible. Marquis Bonington married in such a harem-scarum fashion. Lady Truebridge just confirmed it. Apparently the Marquis blundered into another guest's room in the middle of the night, trying to find his new wife's chamber, caused a death with his marital enthusiasm. What? He tussled with Miles Rawlings in the dark, and Rawlings had an attack of some sort, Gurton said impatiently. I am told that the wedded couple has taken a short drive to the village. I trust that you can convey my farewell and congratulations, Ranton. The solicitor pursed his lips. There was something fishy here. I find it difficult to believe that Her Grace would make such a rash decision, he said, a vision of the eminently practical Duchess flitting through his mind. There's nothing rash about it, the Duke snapped. She's been engaged to the man for months. I am disappointed, Ranton remarked. I won't deny it. There was a heartbeat silence in the room. Not as much as I am, Gurton admitted, a rueful twist in his voice. For the first time, Solicitor and Duke looked at each other as man to man, rather than employer to client. But Ranton looked away. It wasn't proper, what he saw in Gurton's eyes. I'd like you to contact Thomas Bradfellow of Christchurch, endow a chair in Italian studies and make him put whopping in it. The Duke walked to the door. Settle the estate on Stephen as soon as possible, he added. Yes, my lord, Rountin murmured. He was hardly in a position to offer advice. The wide vestibule outside the library was crowded with gentlefolk alternately shrieking at the misuse of their luggage and kissing one another goodbye with shrill enthusiasm. Lady Truebridge's house party had, perhaps, been slightly shorter than it was wont to be, but it had been even more thrilling than anyone expected. Cam was making his way toward the door 
when he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned to find Tuppy Perwinkle just behind him. Good afternoon, Cam said, bowing. I'm afraid that I'm returning to Greece immediately. Otherwise, I would be. My wife, Tuppy interrupted, says that the Duchess loves you. Cam's stomach instinctively clenched. I fail to see why you've chosen to share your wife's musings on the subject with me. Tuppy frowned at him. I wrote my wife off as a lost cause. I didn't want you to make the same mistake. Given that my former wife remarried yesterday, I believe the matter is out of my hands, Cam replied icily. Now, if you will excuse me. He jerked his head at Filippos, standing in the corner of the vestibule with his luggage, and bid a firm farewell to Lord Perwinkle. The trip to the coast was uneventful, if slow. Several days later, Cam gripped the rail of a sweet little sailing ship called the Molly, and tried to force himself to look away from the dock. It was absurd to think that this cloud of dust, or that carriage, might disguise his errant wife. No, Bonnington's wife now. Worse than absurd, to think that his wife might have followed him, might have changed her mind. It was imbecilic to hope that this was a black dream, and he would wake to find himself being accused of snoring in her ear, and groping her body in his sleep. And yet he couldn't stop hoping. A large carriage drew up, that might hold a duchess. Straining his eyes, he saw a fat parson lumber out of a carriage, and haul out an even larger woman. Even from this distance he could hear the woman shrieking, calling the parson an oaf and a nincompoop. Gina had made her choice, and chosen well. Bonnington was a good man, a solid man, besides being infernally handsome. Moreover, he lived in England. So Bonnington looked at Esme Rawlings the way a starving dog eyes a bone. He would be discreet. Presumably, he wouldn't set up his wife's closest friend as a mistress. I wouldn't have been respectable, Cam thought. At times, during the trip to the shore, he had tried to picture himself living in the English countryside, building flat bridges and supervising harvest dinners. His thoughts always ended with an image of himself, hoisting his wife onto a plank table, amidst the marrows and beans and— He wrenched his mind away again, and went down into his cabin. Three passengers, the captain had said. It didn't take a genius to realise that he was about to spend two to three months in close proximity with a hymn-singer and his bad-tempered shrew of a wife. He refused to watch the fat parson board the ship. It might look as if he were waiting for someone. Philippos looked into the cabin around an hour after the ship had set sail. The captain reports that we are clear of the shore, sir. He would like the passengers to join him for sherry. Cam looked up with a frown. He had just recovered from a fit of the sulks, as he'd taken to labelling his black moods, and he was making rapid sketches in charcoal, rather jagged, but not terrible. He knew from experience that it took several hours before he gained complete hand control while on board ship. Goodness sakes, Filippo said with relish. He'd picked up several English idioms, and meant to use them regularly. That's a stern-looking woman. Medusa, Cam said briefly, putting the snake-haired goddess to the side and washing his hands in the basin. Do you suppose I have to dress for dinner? Undoubtedly, my lord. Captain Brackett appears to be a rather formal man. His valet told me that he has a boy whose sole work is starching the captain's clothing. Cam responded with a grunt as he stripped off his comfortable cambric shirt and began to wash. Ten minutes later, Filippos wrestled his gloomy master into a black coat and declared himself satisfied. Cam walked into the captain's cabin in a mood of savage despair. Intellectually, he knew it would pass. He would find peace in the heady pleasure of shaping marble. Some day he would find another woman and push his one-time wife to the back of his mind. Some day he wouldn't mind the fact that he would never again read a letter from Gina, never again hold. Some day. 
he shoved open the captain's door and slammed it straight into the back of the plump parson. I beg pardon, sir, Cam exclaimed, stooping to lend the man a hand. The parson had gone heavily down on his knees. Bracing his legs, Cam hauled him to his feet. That's all right, your grace, the parson said, beaming at Cam, with the delight of a plain Englishman who has just discovered that he's in close quarters with aristocracy. I was just telling your lovely wife that— The parson kept talking, but his voice faded from Cam's mind. She was smiling at him, as if nothing had happened, as if he hadn't fled helter-skelter across the countryside, running like a coward from the knowledge of her wedding, as if she hadn't married the better man. Ah, oh, Cam said, cutting into the parson's conversation. He bowed and raised her hand to his lips. My last duchess. And your next, she replied. She was exquisitely dressed and groomed, from her darkened eyelashes to her curled hair. Every inch of her was duchess-like. He could only grin. She turned to the parson and tapped him lightly on the arm. You see the duke struck dumb with surprise, Parson Quibble. My sister was the same at parting, Quibble said promptly. Cried, as if I were going to the Antipodes. Are you making a long visit to Greece, Your Grace? Gina looked pensively over her glass of sherry. The duke sculps marble in the islands, she said to the parson. We shall likely live there for several years, at least. Cam drank weak sherry and tried to contain the singing joy in his body. Apparently, she was still his wife, every practical managing inch of her. Or she would be his wife again, to be exact. A sacrifice indeed, Parson Quibble said with a shudder. For a delicate lady such as yourself, the islands are a dreadful place. The mainland is bad enough. He tossed back his sherry. My dear sister has asked a hundred times if she's asked once whether she might come live with me and soothe my travail. I've had to be firm. The harsh life is not for a rosebud such as you, I tell her. She would likely wilt in the fearsome heat, but even worse, she would be offended to the bone by the natives. Ali Pasha has no refinement, no manners, no culture. The court at Tipolini has not even one ballroom. The Duchess looked precisely as Quibble thought a Duchess should look, exquisite and expensive. She would certainly wilt in the heat. No island could be home to an English lady. Several years, indeed. He'd warrant that the Duke would accompany his wife back to England in a week or so. He erred by a matter of months. 37. In which a duchess dances for joy. Twilight on the Isle of Nisos has a strangely blue quality, a crystalline pearly glow that dances along the skin and shakes pure gold from hair like that of Gina Sarad, Duchess of Girton. She and her husband were leading the harvest dance. She laughed, holding her white frock up to her ankles as she skipped around the fire. And he danced after her, faster and faster, satyr-like, dark to her white. When he caught her up in his arms, nodded to the assembled villagers, and began climbing the stone steps to the great house on the hill, there were many who wondered what he whispered so tenderly in her ear. Love poetry, perhaps. The Englishman was a fool in love. Anyone could see that. Gina blinked. What? Rountan should arrive sometime this week or next, her husband repeated. The solicitor? Her voice ended in a little squeak. He will arrange to sell the house and ship my statues to England. Why? We are returning, he said calmly. We'll take the starlight back to London next month. He looked down at her with an expression of extreme innocence. Thought I couldn't arrange an ocean voyage, did you? But why? What? What do you think I was doing in the quarries every day? Gina smiled up at her husband. Lifting stone? You're hoisting me as if I were a featherweight. You are a featherweight, he said. They reached the top of the steps 
and he put her deftly on her feet. Ranton will ship tons of marble home to Girton, enough to keep me in naked Dianas for the rest of my natural life, should I so choose. Oh, Gina breathed. He tipped up her chin and brushed a kiss on her lips. First thing, I'm placing marble marissas all over the formal gardens, just to keep my hand in. Gina grinned. She'd come to like his indolent, sweet-hearted former mistress. But Sebastian thought it best if we stayed out of England for a while, given the scandal. The scandal is Bonington's, not ours, Cam said firmly. He chose to play the gallant idiot, sacrificing his reputation to save Esme's. That was his choice. The story he wove about using a false special license to fool his way into your bed. Well, it boggles the mind that anyone could believe it. But believe it they did. Bonington, poor sod, is exiled to the continent and reviled as a disgusting reprobate who tried to bed a duchess without the benefits of marriage. His unhappy fate shouldn't affect our decisions, however. Well, Sebastian said that if we stayed away, it would... His ploy worked, Gina. He's an exile. You're considered lucky to have escaped his evil scheme. Esme's reputation is saved. And you belong in England, Duchess that you are. Bixfiddle is probably buried in a stack of inquiries. Certainly he has chopped our hedges down to their bare stubs. Your brother is languishing in Oxford for lack of a family. She made a face. It's been months, he pointed out. Bessie Mittens is likely in the family way again, and in need of hardship funds. Who knows if Bixfiddle will be as understanding of her fondness for the men of Lower Girton, as you are. But I like it in Greece, Cam. He stopped just inside the door and cupped her face to his. I don't need to live on an island any more, love. I can walk in the dark now. He gave her a swift, hard kiss. Gina caught her breath. Surely he was saying that he loved her. You are my light, he said, towing her toward their bedchamber. 38. The Grand Staircase, Girton House They had quarrelled, as they did occasionally. Cam said she should have asked his advice before she told Bixfiddle to regrade the sewers in Lower Girton. He would have allocated some of the money to building stone banisters in the Arboretum. Gina said he never thought about the future. Cam retorted that sewers were tedious, but that if she had asked, he had an idea about stone sewers, like those built by the Romans. Gina walked away, up the stairs. She knew what he really meant. She made a tedious duchess. She looked down at her gloved hand as it lightly rested on the stair rail. Of course she always held onto the railing as she walked up the stairs. What if she fell? What if she teetered and fell? What then? Nothing. She had spent entirely too much time in her life avoiding risks. A small sound caught her attention, and she paused and turned around. He was still there, staring up at her. What are you doing? she asked taking a hand off the railing. Waiting, he replied, his voice gentle. Still looking at him, she started unbuttoning her left glove. Waiting for what? You might change your mind. She pulled off the glove and tossed it down the stairs. It missed three or four stairs and flapped down. Together, they stared at the small pile of crumpled cloth. She looked up, to find her husband's eyes dancing with laughter. She pulled at the buttons on her right hand. A large male hand came over hers. You once told me that gloves are difficult to remove. I could help. Would you like me to help you? Help? He nodded. The thing you never ask for. So well trained you were by my dear papa. Have you ever asked for help, Gina? Of course I have with something that mattered. Why didn't you write me when I lived in Greece and tell me how much work the estate was? Why didn't you ask me to return? Why don't you ever ask me for help? I am used to being independent, she said mulishly. 
he was drawing off her glove, finger by finger. He put a finger on the base of her hand, just over her pulse. Ask me, Gina. She saw the crinkles at the corners of his eyes as he smiled, uncertainty behind his rakish smile. She knew him now, knew that his smiles hid. Hid what? Need? Need for her? Her blood was racing from the simple touch of his finger on her wrist. I... I would like... But she broke off. It was too hard after years of silent wishes and the letters she didn't write. After the unspoken fears that she would never have a family of her own, asking for help meant discarding the idea that if she were a perfect duchess, she would be rewarded with a perfect duke. Because he was a perfect duke. For her. He helped her then. They tell me I have a wife, he whispered. Do you know where I might find her? Gina saw the hint of something behind his laughter, something less certain than joy. Would you like some help locating her? she replied. The woman I love is here. He tipped up her chin. Will you marry me, Ambrogina? Will you be mine, for better and for worse, in good times and in bad? She swallowed hard. I will, her voice cracked. Will you marry me, Camden William Sarrard, and live with me, forsaking all others, till death do us part? He cleared his throat and said, I will, rather huskily. Then he bent his head and gently, so gently, brushed her lips. I need help, she said, looking straight into his eyes. Anything. She turned around, not bothering to hold the railing, teetering on the little heels of her dress slippers. I would like to undress. Undress? He looked around. Girton's vast arched stairway stretched above them, the newel posts wrenched from their places, to be replaced by statues. No one stirred. It was late at night. But there was nothing to stop Rundles from entering the hallway on a late-night errand. True, the butler was more likely to use the servant's stare. He laughed and protested. Sheena! She said nothing, just stood with her back to him, neck curved gently, so that the long line of elegant buttons that ran down her gown were in evidence. He kissed her neck. It smelled like apple blossoms. Then, despite himself, his fingers started undoing the buttons, one by one, right there on the palatial stairs of his home. A memory leaped into his mind. His father, poised on the stairs like a feudal lord, shouting furiously at the servants in mid-step, because he couldn't wait until he reached the bottom of the stairs. Cam's fingers faltered. Gina began pulling pins from her hair and tossing them heedlessly to the side. They pinged lightly against polished walnut railings, fell to the marble, fell in all directions. His fingers were covered with a rush of sunlit, rosy hair, sleek and smooth, and smelling of apples. His hands steadied, and he began unbuttoning in a frenzy. When he reached the last button, he pulled the dress forward. She helped, wriggling out of the arms. The cloth pooled and fell. Gina stepped away and kicked the garment to the side. Then she turned, dressed only in a frail chemise laced with blue ribbon. Eyes on his, she untied the little bow, and the chemise fell open. I still need help, his wife said throatily. I need... I'm here, Gina. Something ripped as he pulled the chemise down, down over creamy shoulders and beautiful breasts, half hidden by a sweep of red hair. There she was, naked, but for delicate silk stockings, her garters, and slippers. He knelt down in front of her, because worship seemed to be called for, but more because he couldn't stop himself. The skin just under the rise of her breasts was as sleek as the side of a peach. She giggled as his tongue wandered around her belly, and he said, Quiet, wench, and let his hands settle down on the luscious curve of her bottom. Then he discovered that if he shifted down one stair, well, 
that put his mouth just at the juncture of her legs. He ignored her protests, and after a while she stopped wiggling. She forgot to be a duchess and leaned back against the banister, like someone accustomed to nudity in public places. He kissed her until little puffing, moaning shrieks escaped into the dim twilight that surrounded the stairs. And then, just when he could feel her trembling all down her legs, he stopped, pulled away and gave her a little bite in the thigh, explored that interesting hollow in her hip, listened to her coming back to herself, regaining a sense of propriety. No, you can't. Camera on the stairs! And then settled back into an exhibition of mastery. Settled back in the juncture of those lovely thighs and drove her into a shivering, shrieking wife. His wife. When she finally melted into his arms, gasping for air, crying for mercy, he just grinned. Until she gave him a sultry smile that promised retribution and wiggled against his groin. He sucked in his breath. Mmm, Gina purred. Her tone reeked with revenge. My chair is most uncomfortable. There's something protruding from it. He was too late. She slipped from his hands and hopped up two stairs with a grin that was half lustful and half a giggle. Looking at his wife, Cam felt a burn in his chest that would never go away, no matter how many times he held her in his arms, no matter how many nights she slept beside him, no matter how many times she asked him for help. He wrenched his shirt off as she watched with that frank and hungry gaze that never suited the prim Duchess of Girton. You would have made a terrible marchioness, he said. Terrible. Gina was not interested. She leaned back against the railing and enjoyed the way her husband's fingers fumbled with his boots when her breasts rose in the air. When she ran a lazy finger over her breast and down her tummy, he wrenched off a boot and accidentally dropped it right down the stairs. I feel a wave of embarrassment, she drawled, lounging against the railing, as much the bold courtesan as she ever envisioned her French maman. He raised an eyebrow. Really? He was almost ungarbed. Indeed. I should like you to put out the candles, Cam. He laughed. My little duchess, you already cured me of my fear of the dark. Don't you know that? He moved to stand just before her. They were both naked now. He kissed her, but without touching her body. She pulled back from the heat and desire and said, Cam, in a shaky little voice. Naked. He had a beauty such as she could never have imagined. One never looked at his body when he was dressed. His personality was too vivid, too explosive, too engaging. But without clothes, one saw the long line of thigh, the taut beauty of his arse, the leashed strength in his arms as he cupped the candles leading up the stairs. One by one the shadows grew, casting the stairs into darkness. He skipped the candle just before her and continued up the stairs. When he looked from the top of the stairs, there was a dim candle glow halfway up the stairs, and there, to the side of it, a beautiful creamy shape that he knew to be silky from top to bottom, a body that laughed with a breathless chuckle, kissed with a lustful glee, loved. Gina loved with a fair strength. He snuffed the last candle with no more ado than one steps on an ant. And then, finally, he did what he had wanted to do for the last hour. He sat down on a stair and held out his arms. But she couldn't see him. The high mullioned windows let in little light when the moon was full, and tonight there was no moon at all. Gina, he said, and his voice was full of husky promise. Come here. She sounded uncertain. Where are you? Across from you. Don't worry, I won't let you fall. And he reached out and found a slender ankle. Walked his fingers up that ankle, pulled gently on her leg. 
and then he had her sitting on his lap, those gorgeous long legs slung around his hips. He leaned back against cool marble and ran a delicate thumb over one nipple. The tiny strangled noise in the back of her throat was everything he wanted in life. She traced her fingers down his cheekbones. No jokes, she whispered. His fingers moved, and she cried against his mouth. My pulse is steady, he said. She put her lips to his neck and pressed forward into his hands. She could feel him stir under her. His pulse thundered under her lips. No, it isn't, she said. It's not the dark, it's you, he said. His voice was as quiet as velvet and not at all joke-filled. You are my wife, my prim duchess, my naked love. His hands moulded her body to his. I don't need to tell jokes. Holding you is joy enough. Oh, Cam! Her voice broke on a sob that turned to a gasp and then to a moan. He forgot it was dark. All that mattered was a silky touch and rounded curves, the fiery heat and gasps of his own, his very own Duchess. And Gina forgot that Duchess is as Duchess does. Her husband lifted her, held her poised over him, let her fall. Delicious weight, she cried out. There was nothing poised about her now, nothing neat, nothing proper. She rode him with a clear, fierce joy and an exuberant pleasure that disregarded convention. She laughed, rubbing her breasts against his chest, glorying in the sensation. He laughed when she tickled him until her fingers trailed lower. At some point Gina reached over and snatched her gown so that Cam could stuff it behind his back, since he swore the marble was crippling him for life. But she refused to leave the stairs, and he couldn't even think of standing without her. She needed him to anchor her to the ground, just as he needed her to light the darkness. Finally they stopped laughing, and her breath grew shorter, came only in gasps. He could feel every inch of her silky skin, her softness, her forgiveness. He held her tight, thrust up hard, harder. She cried out with every thrust, kissed him again and again, kisses and cries melting against his face. He thrust harder, just to hear her shuddering cry. I love you, he said fiercely. I think I've always loved you. He wasn't certain that she heard him. She was trying to go somewhere, but only he could take her. So he gripped her hips and pumped into her so hard that he actually rose off the steps. She screamed and clutched his shoulders and screamed again. They were together, in a tempest in the darkness, in the heat. And in the shuddering darkness that wasn't lonely, Cam picked up his wife and without sparing a thought for the clothing strewn over the stairs, walked to their room. Her head lay on his shoulder, as peaceful as a babe's. He put her on the ancestral bed, on his father's bed, his grandfather's bed, on the bed where his own child would be born, many of them, if he had his way. He lit candles, only so he could watch her. She opened her eyes a lazy smile in the hint of shyness that was his duchess. "'Come here, your grace,' she said sleepily. "'Thank you,' he said. "'I believe I shall.' And he did. Epilogue The Lawn, Girton House There was no denying the fact that the duchess was kissing the baby too much. Whenever he looked at that poor mite, all wrapped up in lace and fribbledy doos Cam felt a pang of sympathy. Even now, his wife and her friend Helene were hanging over the little bundle, balanced on the Duchess's knees. As he watched, a small waving fist managed to grab a few strands of red hair and pull vigorously. That's my son, Cam thought with satisfaction, as his wife squealed and kissed the babe in appreciation of his infant violence.
Helen rose as he strolled over. Maximilian is very beautiful, she said, smiling at him. He grinned back. He'd grown very fond of his wife's friends, with their sharp tongues and disastrous marriages. Not that Esme was married at the moment. Her reputation was indeed saved by Sebastian's announcement that he had attempted to trick Gina into his bed, using a false wedding certificate. But Esme retired into the country anyway, and these days she swore that she needed no one other than her little baby. Helen touched Gina's shoulder. I will return in a moment with Max's blanket. She walked toward the house, a willowy, lonely figure. He doesn't need a blanket, Cam said. Come here, you little scrap. Max gurgled with laughter and reached his arms toward him. Cam's heart bounded. Isn't he the most intelligent baby you ever saw? Gina said, hanging on his arm so she could see her son's face. He knows his daddy. Mam, 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 Max said intelligently. And he's speaking. He already knows my name. Nanny told me that he wouldn't speak until he was over a year. Here he is, talking at only four months. She just didn't know how wonderful you were, did she, Buttercup? She thought you were like other babies. Gina took the babe back into her arms and lavished kisses on his sweet, smooth skin and the wild black ringlets that covered his little head. Cam's vision blurred. He reached out and cupped his son's head in his hand. Gina leaned against him, and they watched as Max yawned, a wide, toothless yawn. He curled his finger round his father's large one, and turned his face inquiringly toward his mother. I think he'd like some milk, Cam observed, demonstrating that all the family intelligence was not in its offspring. My little buttercup, Max's mother cooed, demonstrating the possibility that family intelligence lay only on the male side. She seemed to be unable to stop kissing the poor scrap of a boy. Not that he was complaining, exactly. Do you remember telling me about my mother's diary? Cam asked. He was winding Max's ringlets around his fingers and letting them spring free. Of course, Gina said absent-mindedly. She'd sat down and was rearranging her nursing gown to give the baby a bit of luncheon. The part where she writes about my black curls? Mm-hmm she said. Just like our little Max. He knelt down before the child and tipped up his wife's chin. I was bald, sweetheart, he said. Bald for two years. I'm the hairless child depicted in the schoolroom. Who says that I'm the only one with imagination in this family? She bit her lip. He kissed her. It was only the ten thousandth kiss that you could given his duchess in the past two years. But he seemed to be unable to stop kissing her, even in the broad daylight, and with a mildly interested audience of one Maximilian Camden Serrard, future Duke of Girton. A note on the rarest of marital surprises, of recognition and annulment. In the late 1590s, the Earl of Essex returned to England after a trip to the continent that lasted many years. Entering a ballroom, he saw an extremely beautiful woman dancing. Turning to a bystander, he asked her name. It was his wife. Most husbands in 1810 did recognize their wives, and most did not seek annulment. Yet annulment did occur, especially among the aristocracy. For example, the Essexes later annulled their marriage. In 1785, the fifth Earl of Berkeley married and later annulled the marriage, remarrying the same lady in 1796. The nullification of Gina's marriage to Cam would have hinged on two facts, Gina's illegitimacy and the age of consent for girls. Gina married before age twelve. The law at this time provided that if a couple disagreed once they both reached the age of majority, they could marry again to others. Moreover, because she was an illegitimate child, the name on Gina's marriage certificate was assumed rather than accredited. The name Lady Cranbourne gave her adopted daughter was not legally valid, and marriages were invalidated for precisely this reason. 
I have taken a fictional liberty in giving Peter Fabergé, who immigrated to the Baltic province of Livonia in 1800, a brother, Franz, who remained in Paris. The Fabergés were a family of goldsmiths. In my reconstruction, the art of hinging beautiful objects was a family passion, and Franz created hinged alabaster statues, while his brother, Peter, dreamed of hinged alabaster eggs. Peter's grandson, Karl, would perfect that most precious of hinged objects, the Fabergé egg. This is Justine Eyre. We hope you have enjoyed the unabridged recording of Duchess in Love by Eloisa James. This program was produced by Tantor Media Incorporated. Executive Producer, Karen Jakonski. Text Copyright 2002 by Aloysia James. Production Copyright 2012 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening.